Hi. A very good morning uh, to all of you. I'm Sui Han, uh, Chairman of uh, Singapore Research Station and First Aid Council. Together with my Vice Chair, Ki Chong, uh, we would like to welcome all of you to this uh, third uh, SRFAC Town Hall session uh, guideline updates. This is the SRFAC Executive uh, Committee, uh, the decision making uh, of SRFAC. It uh, comprises of various uh, professional organizations and also national organizations uh, involved in the pre hospital care. And also, we also divided into uh, various subcommittee, which, is res which are responsible for writing of guidelines. So these are the various uh, subcommittee with SRFAC. Uh, there is an International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, which is a coordinating body of all the regional resuscitation council in the world. And RCA, Resuscitation Council of Asia, is a member of ILCOR since 2006. And NRC Singapore is a founding member of RCA. And uh, SRFAC has uh, succeeded uh, NRC. And this uh, organization chart of uh, ILCOR, uh, which very similar to, and, and there's a sort of general uh, assembly and all the regional research council are represented. And these are the various task force, which is equivalent to uh, our subcommittee our sub of uh, SRFAC. And, and actually, in fact, these are the most important because they are, resp they are responsible for the guideline setting, a consensus of, uh, they're responsible for consensus of, uh, and treatment recommendation and they are sort of independent. And, uh, and we are very honored to uh, let you know that uh, Professor Ng Ki Chong, you know, Vice Chair of SRFC Singapore has been elected uh, to chair the pediatric uh, subcommittee. Uh, this is the first time uh, in the history of UCOR that uh, someone in Asia chairing a task force. And, and what we do in UCOR, uh, I was, uh, member of a BLS, uh, sub, uh, BLS uh, task force. So all of us are given uh, this uh, PICO, PICO, this population intervention comparator outcome questions. You know, the one assigned to me is uh, public assess uh, program and AD program and uh, with, with uh, Dr. Chung from uh, Korean Association of CPR. So we have to compare adult, children out of hospital cardiac arrest and whether the implementation of a public assess AD program versus traditional EMS respond uh, improve uh, survival to hospital discharge. And these are various critical outcome as well as important outcome. So we were given an Excel list of more than 2000 articles, you know, uh, by this, uh, the, um, the research group, you know, which they will do the uh, um, literature search for us. And out of these 2000, we have to narrow down to the 33 uh, articles, and then we have to read them in depth. So, so as you can see, uh, all the study are different. There's only one randomized study. And some have retrospective analysis, some are before and after study. And so, some of them show that there's no significant difference in outcome. And some of them only include children. So we have to sieve all these things out. And the location of cardiac arrest also varies in different studies, yeah, like airport subway as well as sport facilities. So, and there's also study on uh, cost effectiveness. And they have uh, 
the way they do this uh, public AED is also different. And so at the end, we have to come up with recommendation. Uh, so, so we recommend this uh, implementation of uh, PAD program for patients with uh, our hospital cardiac arrest strongly recommended but low certainty of evidence because there's only one randomized study and you know uh, a lot of dissertation science it's not possible to do a randomized study and you may ask what is the relationship between the eu core consensus of science treatment recognition and the guidelines for the regional resuscitation council so for eu core they don't issue guidelines they only do the consensus of science and treatment recommendation okay in a focused topic for example for blrs uh, they will do one on uh, chest compression depth okay or chest compression rates okay and the various resuscitation council uh, they will then rely derive their own guideline based on the u core consensus of science and treatment recommendation that the blrs guideline the als guideline etc the pediatric blrs guideline the pediatric ARS guideline, neonatal guideline, resuscitation guideline, etc. So last year in uh, October 2020, the UCO consensus of science and treatment recommendation simultaneously published in the resuscitation journal, which is the journal for European Research Council, as well as circulation, which is the journal for uh, American Heart Association. And they are, diff they are same, okay? Same word by word, uh, they accept the first, first author, the, the rest are same word by word. However, the guideline from the various uh, resuscitation council are slightly different uh, depending on how they interpret the consensus of science and treatment recommendation. And as you can see, the uh, AHA published their guideline in October 2020. However, the uh, ERC only published their guideline until uh, in March this year. And they are may be slightly different. And, and based on this guideline, Singapore has started uh, uh, sort of uh, updating our resuscitation and first aid guideline. Okay, and and uh, and, and and these are the uh, topics, uh, the authors in charge of the different topics, and we're expected to publish in. Uh, Singapore Medical Journal in September 2021. But today we uh, have this uh, preview, you know, a town hall session uh, to, to announce the guideline first. And I want to thank uh, all my uh, subcommittee sub chair, as well as the uh, authors uh, for, for the good work. And I also want to mention these additional safe measures during the CPR training class during COVID-19 situations. Uh, so SRFAC has come up with a different come up with a COVID training guide, training uh, the safety measure guide during CPR training. Okay, and, and uh, for example, uh, safe entries, health declaration, you know, and then uh, and also sort of uh, wearing a mask at all times, temperature checking, and then also hand hygiene as well as uh, uh, disinfection of mannequin. And also, we also recommend that, uh, you know, a small group training, I uh, want instructor for uh, participants, and then uh, they must be uh, two meters apart, uh, different group, and, 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 and also different, between different classes, if there are no partition, they must be three meter apart and all the, Groups are not allowed to, to mingle together, so they have different entry time, different break time, and I, I know it's very difficult. Uh, but but uh, this is uh, is important uh, to prevent an outbreak. Okay, so I I want to thank all the training center for your uh, for your cooperation and following the guidelines strictly. I uh, just want to also want to announce that we are celebrating World Restart of Heart Day. 2021 in uh, 17 October, uh, 17 October. Okay, so there will be a short video with uh, cardiac arrest survivor and the uh, highlight of importance of bystander CPR and uh, public AED program. And there also be panel discussion by the various specialists about heart disease as well as importance of bystander CPR. So uh, please stay tuned. Uh, more information will be available closer today.
Uh, just a reminder, uh, the entire Town Hall session will be recorded and uploaded in the SRFAC YouTube channel. And uh, kindly, for, for the speaker, kindly mute your mic uh, to when you're not presenting. And you may post your questions in a Zoom chat function uh, and we will address them during the respective question and answer session. So, uh, I would like to thank the SRFAC uh, Executive Committee, as well as all the subcommittee chairmen and members uh, for your support uh, and uh, hard work, and, and also the uh, paper's author, you know, for come, for come up with this uh, new, this update of uh, Singapore Research Union Guideline 2021. Okay, and I also want to thank my support staff uh, for putting uh, this together for this town hall uh, session today. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Enjoy the session. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, the moderators for the first session. Uh, Professor Ng Ki Chong, Vice Chairman of SRFAC, and also a Senior Consultant, Pediatric uh, Emergency Physician, and Chairman Medical Board of uh, TK Hospital. And also uh, Lieutenant Colonel Janice O oh is a Chairman of a uh, First Aid Subcommittee, SRFAC, as well as a uh, Senior Assistant Director of uh, EMS Department, SCDF. So uh, Kichong and Janice, uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Suhan. Uh, Janice, you want to start? Uh, okay, good morning, um, everybody. I'm Janice. I'm from uh, SDBF, and uh, welcome to today's to today session. So I'm the co-chair with a um, Prof Ng uh, for this morning uh, topics. So the first um, speaker is um, Professor Marcus Ong. He's a senior consultant and clinician scientist um, from the Department of Emergency uh, Medicine, SGH. He's also uh, the SRFAC Exco member. Um, yeah, thanks, Janice. So good morning to everyone. And um, I've been asked to actually share a quick review of uh, how, you know, uh, cardiac arrest response and management has progressed in Singapore over the years. So I'm not going to go too much into uh, the history, uh, but I've chosen two pictures to uh, actually tell some stories, you know. So the picture on the left, for those of you who know, uh, is actually of our... Uh, ambulance officers, and uh, you can see uh, Siti Afzan here, who is one of our first nurse ambulance officers. And what she's carrying is actually uh, one of the very first automated external defibrillators that was deployed in SCDF. You know, and uh, this was again uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, at that time the, the National Resuscitation Council and the uh, Medical Advisory Committee working with the SCDF. Um, and so we trained the first few batches of our nurse ambulance officers on how to use these AEDs. And the story is that very soon after it was deployed, uh, City Afzan actually was able to use this defibrillator to save a golfer, you know, with a cardiac arrest on the golf course. And that was our very first save, you know, of uh, uh, an AED survivor in the field. The second picture on the right, you know, you can see is the early days of uh, the National Resuscitation Council. You can see a very young Professor Ananta Raman and uh, a very handsome looking Professor Lim Sui Han right here in the corner. Uh, of course, Dr. Tio Wisiong, uh, James Tan, Commissioner at the time of the uh, SCDF. Uh, and just to remind us, you know, how far we have come, you know, from the early days. And also is a reminder for me to uh, acknowledge the role and the contributions of all our pioneers and all those who have gone before us, you know, to uh, bring us to where we are today. And today we have uh, actually seen the fruit of uh, more than 20 years of effort in the field. So you can see in this graph um, year on year, uh, both our bystander CPR rates, uh, public kind of uh, AED rates, as well as the number of survivors have increased dramatically over the last 20 years. Uh, for many years, our bystander CPR rate was around 20%, uh, but you know, we have been able to increase it to more than 60% consistently in the last few years. And this is mostly through the efforts uh, of telephone-assisted CPR 
and our mass community kind of training, which I'll share about more later. The other thing you can see is that um, uh, we have actually been able to uh, increase our bystander AED use, and this was from less than 2% to now above 10%, uh, which is again, you know, a very uh, encouraging and heartening sign. Um, and most importantly, you can see the number of survivors uh, that we used to have, you know, when I first started collecting data in 2001, we had fewer than 20 cardiac arrest survivors uh, annually in Singapore. And today we have more than 200 survivors every year. And more important than that, you know, when we uh, measure this according to various benchmarks, and this is what we call the Woodstein survival rate, uh, which is basically comparing uh, the number of survivors over the witness uh, shockable rhythms. And we have actually been able to increase it from 2% 20 years ago to 11% to now at 26% in 2019. And by the way, you are actually getting a sneak preview of our 2019 uh, survival results, uh, which we will actually only communicate publicly in a few months' time. Uh, and even when we adjust for the aging population, you can see that uh, we have been actually doing well in increasing the number of survivors. The last piece of data I'll show you is actually uh, in terms of the quality of survivorship. So again, this is important, right? Not only do we want to increase the number of survivors, but we want to increase the number of survivors with good neurological function. And currently, this is at 78%, uh, which is good cerebral performance category one or two, meaning that you know, three, more than three quarters of our survivors actually go home, are functional, can go back to work, can walk, can talk, and can take care of themselves. You know? And uh, this is co contrary to uh, common perceptions even among our medical community, you know, that all the cardiac uh, survivors are actually brain dead or they have, uh, you know, neurological impairment, they are vegetables. You know, that is totally untrue today uh, with a lot of our good post resuscitation care. And you can see that, um, in fact, majority, more than three quarters of our survivors have good neurological function. Now, the question is, how have we been able to bring about this change over the last uh, 20 years? I think a lot of the efforts has been around this conceptual framework that we call today the frame of survival. So at the heart of it is the chain of survival that all of us are familiar with, which says that basically, you know, the system is the one that uh, you need to save a life and that every link of the chain is equally important. So whether that's the bystander, the dispatcher at 995, the first responders who are usually the, the witness or the lay responders, the paramedics in the EMS, and then the hospital part of care. But around that is what we call the inner frame of survival, which are the factors that are within our control that influence survival. And that includes the quality of our care, you know, the uh, ambulance protocols, uh, cooperation with, uh, for example, the public, you know, um, being able to have strong EMS leadership, for example. And then we have what is called the outer frame of survival, which are factors not directly under our control, but things that we have a stake in, that includes the political kind of environment, healthcare expenditure, you know, legislation, um, and uh, even things like urban traffic solutions, et cetera. And so what I'm gonna walk you through is what we call the 10 steps to improve survival. Uh, there is a framework that we have uh, developed together with the Global Resuscitation Academy and how this applies in Singapore. So step number one is actually to use data to drive improvement. And the advantage we have in Singapore is we have been collecting cardiac arrest data since 2001. And this has progressively built up initially as the care registry. Uh, and it's today become the Pan-Asian Resuscitation Outcome Study with more than 15 countries across Asia contributing data. Uh, we now have more than 200,000 cases enrolled in our cardiac arrest registry across Asia. And because of that, you can see you know, we've been able to actually track our system, track the uh, kind of inputs, including things like uh, the number of people having cardiac arrest, the bystander CPR rate, AED use, you know, ambulance response times, etc. And then also our survival outcomes, you know, and this is a sample from the Singapore annual report, you know, which again shows some of those encouraging trends that I have shown. Now, step number two, it talked about improving your telephone CPR program. 
And this, I think, has been a key part of why we've been able to increase our bystander CPR rates in Singapore. And you can see that, uh, you know, we started working on a telephone CPR program around about 2012. And this has been uh, slowly and gradually improved using a quality improvement kind of framework. And so today, um, more than uh, three quarters of the calls that come in that have a witness uh, will be actually having telephone instructions and uh, be guided how to do chest compressions over the phone. And also we can guide them on how to use an AED. And then I find here. Yes. Okay, yeah, you have your father now? Yes, Hello, ma'am. You have your father now. Is he breathing at the moment? No, no. Okay, no, anybody no, doing no. CPR? Ma'am, anybody doing CPR at the moment? No, no. Okay, I teach you CPR, okay? Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Can you put your speaker on lock phone now? Okay. Okay, speak your lock phone now? Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay, ma'am. You take your, is your shirt open, the father? What? Okay, your hand. Your hand, one hand. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, in between the chest. In, uh, in the middle of the chest, in between the nipples. Uh -huh. Okay, the other hand on top of the first hand. Okay. Okay, you press the hand now. You press the chest. I come, I come with you, okay? Okay, okay one, two, three, four, so five. This is an example of a real call. And you can see two things straight away, right? Number one, it's not an easy job to actually coach a panicky bystander to do telephone instructions. But it can be done. And the second is that Singaporeans like to say, okay, okay. Now, we've been able to uh, actually show and publish date, uh, our data, you know, and um, basically this has been uh, published in some of the top journals, uh, the effectiveness of telephone CPR in actually increasing uh, the bystander CPR rates. And more nurses from Sing Health are being seconded to the Singapore Civil Defence Force under a collaboration designed to help the public respond more effectively to health emergencies. There are now 13 nurses on board, up from four in 2011. And the move seems to be paying off, with more instances of bystanders performing CPR. Chan Wo Er reports. When you dial 995, your call goes to the SCDF Operations Centre. If it's a medical emergency, it's passed on to a nurse. Uh, Geraldine, I need help. Someone's not breathing. Most callers are anxious, so nurses will calm them down, get enough information to make an initial diagnosis and walk them through what needs to be done. For instance, someone having a cardiac arrest will need CPR. I need you to kneel beside your mom. Okay, I need you to put your right hand in the centre of his chest. Okay, the other hand on top of the first hand. Each call clocks in below 11 minutes, the time it typically takes for an ambulance to arrive. But every second counts. 30-year-old Jaredine Goh has coached callers through resuscitating patients and even the delivery of a child. Ms. Goh, who has been a nurse for a decade, has been working at the call centre for the last four years. My dad, uh, he passed away back in 98, so uh, he died of cardiac arrest in the car park. And at that time, at a point of time, there is no bystander CPR. So this job actually kind of motivated and inspired me to actually help other people. Over the years, more members of the public have been coming forward to help. Of the cardiac arrest victims given CPR in 2011, 22% were administered by bystanders. This went up to nearly 55% in 2015. As CDF says, this is in part due to having nurses at the call centre. Its collaboration with Sing Health began in 2011 and was formalised in an agreement last year. Okay, step number three. Uh, it's actually improving the quality of uh, CPR, and this is a framework that we call high-performance CPR. So high-performance CPR is a concept that, um, you know, every member of a team that is uh, performing a resuscitation uh, needs to work together, needs to be highly trained and highly coordinated in what we call the pit crew model. So the example I always use is, you know, if I have a flat tire and I need to change my tire, you know, how long would it take me? 20 minutes, 30 minutes? But for Formula One pit crew, you know, how long do they take to change a tire? They can do it within 10 seconds. And that's because they practice and each every single member of the team has an assigned role and knows their job. And they do it in a very coordinated manner. And so CPR should actually be in the same way. You know? And so something for all those who do CPR training here uh, to consider, you know, for a long time, we've been teaching CPR as a one-man show, Lone Ranger. 
one single rescuer trying to actually rescue a person. But the reality today is that uh, even in a public arrest, it is likely that there's going to be more than one person at the scene, including the bystander, including the mine responder who is activated, including the fire biker that comes in, and then later on the SEDF crew. And do we teach and communicate on them how to do teamwork and work together? So again, something to consider. Uh, this is something the SEDF has been working on. We now routinely dispatch a uh, four-man crew of firefighters that will actually come in and do high-performance CPR uh, and uh, be able to coordinate this uh, while uh, even the ambulance crew is on the way. So step number four, rapid dispatch, you know, being able to sort out your calls, give higher priority to those that might be a cardiac arrest. And we've actually diversified our response. For example, we now send out routinely fire bikers, which are a one-man crew on a motorcycle, and they can actually cut through traffic. And it's been shown that we can reduce the response time by half, you know, by sending these fire bikers. The other thing is that we've actually diversified uh, what we call a tiered response. So besides a motorcycle-based uh, firefighter EMT, we would send a four-man crew, usually on what we call a light fire uh, uh, vehicle, and we'll also dispatch an ambulance. So if you see today, uh, quite a few SEDF personnel around the uh, a cardiac arrest victim is because we are aiming to do high performance CPR. Step number five, measurement of professional resuscitation. So this is a key component of high performance CPR. You cannot have quality CPR if you're not measuring the quality of CPR. And so that is why we have uh, today upgraded all the devices that are carried on the public ambulances to have these uh, accelerometer based quality of uh, CPR measures. So in other words, it will give feedback on the rate, depth, release, pauses, and we routinely analyze this and feed this back to the teams that are performing CPR. And besides using the uh, kind of uh, code review, uh, we are actually looking at other things that uh, can help, you know, for example, audio recordings, body-worn cameras, you know, and increasingly all these will be part of our arsenal to be able to improve resuscitation performance. And this can be done also for public access defibrillation because many of these devices also have CPR quality capture now. And besides that, you know, we've also been upgrading over the years the capability of our ambulance crews to deliver some of these, even what was considered advanced cardiac life support in the past. These are now being done in the ambulance crew in the, in the out of hospital setting. An example is, uh, you know, we uh, completed a trial using the intraosseous uh, and to be able to actually deliver adrenaline through the uh, osseous route when the IV access is difficult. Okay, step number six, public uh, AED program. And a lot of us uh, can see this. This is a very visible part of uh, our five-year pre-hospital emergency care plan. Uh, you can see that we ha have now installed AEDs in all public uh, HDB estates one AED in every alternate uh, lift lobby. And we also have a national AED registry uh, that is linked to the my responder. So that allows people to find where the nearest AED is and bring them to the scene. And so the idea is that, you know, every single HDB block can be a community of care with an AED at the, uh, installed in the block. And then we go into the uh, block working with the grassroots organizations, the residence committees, to actually train the residents on the DARE program. Uh, in other words, how to cooperate with the dispatcher, how to do CPR under instructions, and how to use the AEDs that they have been equipped with. And so that is an uh, interesting kind of model, you know, together with uh, the use of the uh, My Responder app, you know, that, for example, this is the neighborhood watch that patrols our estates, and we can equip them with the My Responder app and they can actually be aware of where the AEDs are and bring them to the scene. 本地每天平均发生的五到六起心脏骤停个案当中，就有一起通过My Ruha 
派出了急救人员后，民防人员还会通过电话指示在场民众如何施予心肺复苏术，同时也会启动 My Responder 应用程序，让附近用户立即获知有人需要急救，并赶往现场协助。应用程序每个月平均会启动四百次，目前已有超过一万一千多名登记用户。More than 50,000 active、uh, volunteers on the system, but our ambition is to increase this to 500,000. You know, so we really need every single CPR training center, you know, to be promoting the My Responder app. You know, and we want every nurse, doctor, paramedic, people who will attend a CPR class to come on board the My Responder as well. And in the next five years, we're going to pair this with、uh, use of the CPR card. Uh, that will be、uh, basically a big trial enrolling 15,000 volunteers and equipping them with the CPR card,、uh, the next generation to be able to improve quality of CPR. This tool, roughly the size of a credit card, can help resuscitate victims during a cardiac or breathing emergency. Called the CPR card, it's placed on a person's chest during CPR and then monitors the quality of the rescuer's compressions. It'll also alert rescuers if they're doing it deep and fast enough to keep the patient's blood flowing. Now, the aim is to help the public be more confident when performing CPR. Some 4,000 cards have been given out so far, and it's an initiative by the health ministry. So do watch out for that. The other thing that、uh, we are trying to use is to harness the power of data. You know,、uh, we are going to launch the Omni system, which is basically equipping our ambulances with、uh, Samsung Galaxy tabs and having electronic health records that will link back end with uh, uh, basically cardiac arrest outcomes from the Ministry of Health and our hospitals, and that will、uh, enable us to actually、uh, do reporting, analytics,、uh, and even research more effectively. And ongoing、uh, work is being done to, for example, improve post resuscitation care. You hear more about this、uh, later on in this seminar today.、Uh, things like therapeutic temperature management and improve kind of ICU care back then. Okay, step number eight:、uh, mandatory training for CPR AD. So today, you know, we have actually、um, uh, been. We know the state of our population. You know, we know that about thirty percent of them has. Had some kind of training in CPR and first aid before,、uh, but maybe about only ten percent of them are current. And the idea is that you know, can we move these numbers、uh, over the years, you know, and increase the number of people in our community that are willing and、uh, equipped and trained to to respond in an emergency. And so this is、uh, sort of like the idea behind the dispatcher assisted、uh, responder program and various other programs、uh, that we have done as a community outreach. Of course, COVID has actually、uh, impacted some of this, but nevertheless, I think you know we in a post-pandemic world we need to、uh, pick this up again and、uh, try to promote this. And this is what I call the pyramid of first responders. You know, at the base, we would have everyone that is aware of what CPR is, of what an AED is through the media, through our social media, through our campaigns, and at least when the dispatcher starts giving them instruction over the phone, that they can actually、uh, understand and follow. And then we have a base. Those who are trained in the one-hour kind of program,、uh, they will have some kind of awareness, although no certification. And we hope to move this up to a certified program, and then eventually have more people who are instructors. And so this is behind our community outreach programs in churches, in workplaces,、uh, working with grassroots organizations. And you know, we also have uh, this uh, survival awards every year that we try to highlight this in the media. Step number nine. Accountability, and this requires cooperation of multiple agencies, multiple stakeholders to work together. And one example is our five-year kind of pre-hospital plan, you know, where, where our key partners have been working together to improve care. We are now into our second five-year plan. And finally, you know, I can not overemphasize this.、Uh, we hope to build a culture of excellence in Singapore. You know that in everything that we do,、uh, whether it is in training. In the field providers, you know whether you are in the, the SEDF or、uh, private sector, you know that we will see this as part of our efforts to actually save more lives, and that、uh, we will work together. And so, something to look forward to in the next five years is that、uh, we actually have a plan to actually improve the quality of survivorship, working through using data science, AI, you know, community smart interventions. 
um, some future ambulance trials, uh, as well as working together with the Global Resuscitation Alliance. And this includes the version two of the CPR card, which will allow two-way communication between the dispatcher and the first responder in the field. And the dispatcher will actually be able to see the quality of CPR being performed on the card. We are aiming to introduce uh, temperature management earlier for post uh, ROSC patients that regain a pulse in the field in the ambulance, even before they come to the hospital, uh, and be able to bring in things like heads up CPR, which is a new kind of novel treatment uh, that has a lot of promise. So this is my last slide, you know, let's save more lives together and uh, happy to take any questions and discussion later on. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Marcus. Uh, excellent talk. Um, so as everybody knows, Marcus is the medical director for the unit uh, for pre-hospital emergency care. And I think he's done tremendous work the last uh, few years. And I, I've, I've known Marcus for... How many years are Marcus? 25 years, you know, something like that. Huh? So, 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 excellent, excellent uh, work. Uh, so, we will keep the questions to the end. Maybe uh, before we, we start the. So, uh, so, Marcus actually gave us the keynote address just now. Um, and uh, we will ne next proceed to the rest of the track for the uh, rest of the topics for this track. And we will end with a QA afterwards. And uh, just some housekeeping rules. Uh, you know, uh, you can type in your QA questions uh, on the QA chat. Uh, Q and A box uh, so that we can uh, collate, and after that, uh, uh, Ma'am Janice and me will will, will uh, try to moderate the, the panel discussion. So uh, our next speaker is uh, the speaker before Marcus, but also he's going to share with us uh, Professor Lim Sui Han, senior consultant in SGH, and also uh, our, the chairman of uh, our Singapore Resuscitation and Physics Council. Uh, Sui Han will uh, share with us the Singapore Basic Cardiac Life Support and AED guidelines for 2021. Uh, so uh, please, Srihan. Srihan? Srihan, where are you? Oh, yes, okay. Okay, thanks, uh, Tichong, for, for the introduction. And, and you know, uh, it's very difficult to speak after Marcus, uh, but uh, I will try my best. <laughs> and uh, I also want to welcome uh, the participants uh, from uh, Korean uh, Association CPR, uh, Penang CPR Society, as well as uh, Malaysia National Committee on uh, Resuscitation Training, uh, MOH. Okay, uh, hi, uh, okay, uh, welcome. I cannot go down. You want to stop share and reshare again? Uh, stop share. You stop share and reshare again. It's like the control alternate thing. Usually works. Now. Sorry, it's like a technical issue. Technology. Ah, okay. Maybe you, you start, start share again. Sure. Is it okay? No. Okay. Can, uh? okay. 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 Good. And uh, cannot go down the slide. This one, Yeah. Okay, I, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, all my all the members uh, of the SRABC, BCRS, and AD subcommittee. Huh? This is uh, a close, uh, close uh, chest chest compression. Uh, was first described in 1960. Yeah, uh, so so uh, it's the first guideline. Uh, uh, first BRS guideline, and and so we are celebrating a 61 anniversary, eh? and in uh, United States, uh, published in JAMA. Okay, and then at, at first, uh, this uh, the investigator was doing a study on uh, defibrillation. So so at that time, uh, you know the defibrillator uh, weighs uh, 
25 uh, pounds. Okay, so and and, and when they put the defibrillate uh, the defibrillate the electrode uh, onto the sternum uh, and they can record uh, coronary uh, perfusion pressure. Okay, the, the aortic pressure on on the animals uh, on the dogs. And and so this is how uh, closed chest compression was uh, invented or discovered. And uh, and this is uh, Coven Hoven, uh, William Coven Hoven, uh, James Judd, and uh, Guy Nickerbocker. And 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 only uh, Guy Nickerbocker uh, is around. Uh, and and so so uh, he he has been invited. He had been invited to the UCOR and uh, meeting, you know, in 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 Dallas. So I have a very fortunate to take a picture with him. In fact, everybody wants to take a picture with him. Uh, so this time around, we have uh, five rings of uh, chain of survival, uh, you know, uh, and, and the BLS will cover early recognition and access, early CPR and early defibrillation. And, and then we introduce a new ring, very important, uh, uh, emergency medical services. I think uh, Professor Marco Song has pointed out, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the uh, our EMS system has uh, has uh, evolved so much, right? And and uh, now now it's uh, it's good, one of the top best in the world, and and so the advanced cardiac life support. So so BLS is very important uh, because the the uh, the chain uh, is as strong as its weakest link. And also in uh, the the last. Uh, Guideline updates, okay. Uh, in, in the uh, the I, I think in, in early 2010, okay. So this is a resuscitation outcome consortium group, uh, which comprises the uh, very famous centers, uh, research center in North America, okay. Uh, they did uh, cover a population of more than 20 million. Uh, in the, they're studying out of hospital cardiac arrest. And, and this time around uh, is different uh, because of technology. Uh, we can measure the quality of CPR, all right, uh, in real time, in real time, all right. So, so with this defibrillation pad, they can also measure the depth of chest compression, rate of co chest compression, is and any pause, and also ventilation as well. So, so it revolutionized the uh, study of uh, our, of CPR, you know, and and. And they came out many, many important paper, all right? And then one of them, for example, is this uh, uh, by Yen Steel, you know, on the chest compression depth, okay? What is the max minimum, uh, maximum, this is optimal chest compression depth in the improvement of cardiac arrest survival. In a, and and the, this study shows that, okay, in fact, the optimal chest compression depth, okay, for the improvement of the uh, survivor is around, 40 mm or 4 cm to 5.5 cm. 4 cm to 5.5 cm. All right. And, and this, this why uh, uh, SRFAC is the, one of the only uh, center, only resuscitation council in the world that recommend chest compression depth of 4 to 6 cm. And this is evidence based, okay, based on uh, Yen Steel study. And also, uh, this is another study in Japan. Uh, our Asians, the size of Asian uh, are smaller. You know? Smaller is, uh, is, is smaller than the Caucasian. Okay? So the female nurse in Japan, uh, the average body weight is only 53 uh, kg. So if you ask them to perform chest compression uh, more than 5 cm, uh, and, and you can see uh, after one and a half minutes, uh, they cannot achieve the chest compression rate. Uh. So, 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 and, and it's not necessary uh, because, because the, the study show that the optimal uh, compression depth, you know, to improve survival is four to four or 5.5 cm, okay? So uh, we, that's why I think different region uh, or, or, or even national need to have their own guideline, you know, because all of us are different, you know, we are, our community are different, our society are different. So in, in uh, so we publish, uh, the, in the previous update, we published this uh, first uh, RCA adult BLS 
uh, committee to uh, for 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 uh, lay rescuer, lay rescuer. Okay, so so in 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 this uh, in this uh, recommendation. Okay, so chest compression. Uh, we recommend chest compression depth of approximate five cm. Uh, approximate five cm, not more than six cm. And then based on this, we we have our uh, SRFBC uh, DLS guideline. Okay, and and this time now we focus more on uh, lay rescuer la, All right. So 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 there's not much changes. Uh, uh, we use uh, the uh, DR SABC as we have been using for many years. Okay, so so uh, D is danger, right? And uh, R is check for responsiveness. Okay, and then tap the shoulder. Hello, hello, are you, are you okay? If this if there's no response, uh, call nine nine five or call nine nine five. And then we also recommend uh, if you are alone, uh, do not leave the casualty uh, because the 995 dispatcher will tell you what to do. Okay, stay on the line. But if you have an extra person and, and you see a AD around, uh, you can ask the uh, second helper to go and get the AD. All right. So this is uh, SA. Uh, and B uh, is check for normal breathing. Okay, look, look for normal breathing. Uh, just look. All right. Uh, this is very important uh, uh, because uh, in the starting of cardiac arrest, uh, some of the patient uh, has abnormal breathing, gasping, uh, gasping, and some people mistaken it for regular breathing. All right, so so and 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 with whole CPR, so 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 it's important. Gasping is not breathing. Uh, it's not normal breathing. So, uh, this video is is uh, available uh, at the SRFBC web page. Uh, so I'm going to show you this, our gasping, animated gasping video. Agonal breathing or gasping is an abnormal pattern of breathing that most often occurs when a person is in cardiac arrest. Agonal breathing is irregular, lasting from a few seconds to minutes. Gasping may be present in up to 40% of victims in the first minutes after cardiac arrest. It is important to remember that agonal breathing is not sufficient in delivering oxygen to the body. Gasping is a sign of cardiac arrest and is not considered breathing. Call emergency ambulance 995 if I have not done so. Okay, so uh, first one is animated, second one is a real one. Uh, uh, we download from the Bondi Beach uh, YouTube. The machine reads Tucker's vital signs. Do not touch patients. Analyzing. Check pulse. There's no pulse. Give CPR. Please, please, please. Do not touch patient. Analyzing rhythm. Tucker's had two shocks. He's in spasm. Still staying here. Check here. Analyzing rhythm. Rhythm, yeah. So on my chart. Check pulse. There's no so for the Bondi Beach video, uh, the first two video clip is gasping, you know. So the last one is uh, normal, regular breathing after successfully defibrillated and, and chest compression. So it could be very difficult. Uh. So if you're not sure, uh, please charge, start chest compression. I, I uh, it's, it's, it's uh, sort of more important uh, to err on the safe side. So if you're not sure whether it's gasping or normal breathing, uh, start chest compression, okay? Right, and then uh, to, for, to start, and then of course the healthcare provider, you uh, can, you are trained in 
pulse check, you can check your keratic pulse. Uh. Again, if you're not sure whether the patient has a pulse or not, you should start chest compression. And, and for chest compression, uh, the landmark for chest compression is at the lower end of the sternum. Uh. This is the lower end of the sternum. Okay, so, so we, we will uh, teach the rescuer how to recognize the lower end of the sternum. I think that's, that's the best method so far in the evidence. And then uh, the compression depth is 4 to 6 cm and it's evidence-based. Uh, and the rate is 100 to 120 per minute. Okay, and it's important now uh, to allow complete chest recoil uh, before the next chest compression. Okay, and, and if you are a healthcare provider and uh, if you have a background mask with you, so after 30 chest compression, give two ventilation. Uh, uh, because ventilation is important, okay? And then one second per ventilation, tidal volume 400 to 600. And if you are, don't have a background mask ventilation and you, if you are trained, willing, or trained, able, and willing to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation, uh, suppose in, in the household, all right? So you can proceed with mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation. If not, uh, is completely fine to just do chest compression, continuous chest compression. And for those who do continuous chest compression, if they're tired, uh, you can rest uh, uh, up to 10 seconds, okay, every 100 chest compression, uh, because I think it's very difficult to continuously non-stop, all right? And if AED arrives, then you follow the, uh, Sorry, uh, if AED uh, uh, arrive, you follow the AED instructions. And then uh, how to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, ventilation. Uh, sorry, how to do back valve mouth ventilation. Now, this is the way uh, you do the uh, back valve mouth ventilation to be administered at the site of the casualty, okay, to minimize the instruction to chest compression during single rescue CPR. Of course, in hospital, you work as a team. Uh, so you have someone do chest compression and someone do ventilation. And of course, it's very tiring. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so you are tired, then you change, uh, change, uh, change compressor, all right? They say every two minutes, okay, if you have someone extra around. Okay, and then when the AAD arrives, then you use the AAD. Put on the AAD pad and follow the AAD instruction. And if the AAD say that there's no shock, no shock advice. Please do chest compression. Please continue to do chest compression. And then you do chest compression until paramedic uh, arrive or someone more expert than you take over the resuscitation. Or the casualty wake up or regains normal breathing, which is not common, uh, which is not common. Okay. So so uh, so please continue to just to do chest compression. And this is a table to show that uh, the different uh, uh, between adult, children, and infant. All right, the, the, uh, the, uh, BL, the big PCLS. And then just want to highlight uh, for the rescue breathing uh, after return of spontaneous circulation, uh, there are slight difference in the ventilation rate uh, for the adult as well as children as well as uh, infant. And we also add in a small section on CPR in special setting uh, because after we learn, uh, when we learn uh, CPR, uh, it's new on the floor, right? And new on the mat. Uh, how, however, in hospital, uh, the patient are on the bed. So the participant, the healthcare provider have the new on the bed to do chest compression. However, if the patient is trolley, uh, there's no space for for the healthcare provider to new on. So it's important that uh, they have to stand on a low stool, okay, to do chest compression. Uh. So, so, so all the emergency department or what uh, should have a low stool uh, so, that, so that the rescuer can do uh, adequate chest compression and uh, use the body weight uh, and not use the uh, bicep muscle. So, so again, uh, this is a very historical uh, photograph, uh, okay, and, and, and uh, the, uh, Young, even younger Prof Ananda, right? And, and uh, our immediate uh, past uh, chairman of uh, NRC. And, and also, if you have, you know, in a narrow uh, corridor, uh, no space, uh, this is the, you know, one of the study uh, in Saudi uh, uh, use this way to do uh, chest compression. Of, of course, we can't uh, describe the, the different difficult situation at the special setting. So it's important uh, for the uh, training center of healthcare providers, improvise what you have learned. Uh, 
uh, onto the on, onto the real practice. Like, I think that's important. Yeah, you must do uh, trust compression in the environment that you are working with. And then there's a, a updates uh, on foreign body airway obstruction, which is which is uh, not as important as chest compression. Uh. So and we try to make them simple. So for foreign body airway obstruction, okay, we do continuous abdominal thrust for adult uh, uh, or chest thrust in the pregnant or obese casualty until the foreign body is expelled or casualty become unconscious. And we also have a foreign body airway obstruction for uh, unconscious uh, victims, un un unconscious casualty uh, for the uh, lace rescuer without ventilation. So it's much simpler. So it's just like doing uh, one man CPR. La. However, every chest, 30 chest compression, you just look at the mouth and if it's foreign body, you just remove it. And then you check for breathing. Okay, if no breathing, no normal breathing, continue chest compression. And then we also make the uh, unconscious foreign body relief uh, for healthcare provider with ventilation. So, so, so to want to make it simpler. Uh, so, so again, it's very, very similar to the one man uh, CPR, right? And then uh, we, we no longer recommend placing of cardiac arrest casualty. Uh, we return of spontaneous circulation in the recovery position, okay? Because most of the time, okay, the, uh, there's very seldom uh, there is, uh, in, in, in the patient uh, when there's return of spontaneous circulation uh, in, in the out of hospital color area or any, any collapse, uh, they will tend to go into cardiac arrest very soon. You know? So we have, to many, we have to monitor them very closely, all right? So it's, very, it's difficult to monitor uh, casualty in a recovery position. So we no longer recommend uh, recovery position uh, for our hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, however, recovery position will be covered under first aid uh, because it's important uh, in patients who, who have spontaneous breathing, but uh, not, not in cardiac arrest. Uh, example, stroke, hypoglycemia, or fainting. Okay. So something less to learn uh, will be a, will be a uh, everybody will be very happy. Okay, so uh, summary of uh, the Singapore BLS and AED guideline, there's no major changes. Uh, there are no major changes. And, and uh, the current guideline continue to emphasize, okay, casualty with gasping should be treated as cardiac arrest. And uh, importance of calling 995 early, okay, the SDF dispatchers can guide caller in recognizing cardiac arrest as well as give instruction for chest compression and also will activate volunteer res rescuer in the vicinity to bring a nearby AED to the scene, okay, to help with uh, CPR and the importance of high quality CPR, okay, and then in our hospital cardiac arrest, the engagement of community is vital. So hence only CPR can improve the take up rate quality retention of chest compression skill among the ray rescuer. And there is uh, always knowledge gap. Uh. For example, uh, we know that the location to do chest compression is the lower half of sternum, but we don't know what is the best method to locate the lower half of sternum because it may not be easy uh, for a lay rescuer. All right, uh, so, so we know that it's here, uh, correct. So, so I think for those who want to live longer, maybe they should tattoo uh, uh, the uh, landmark for chest compression. Uh. And, and the very nice tattoo here, unfortunately, it didn't show the landmark of chest compression. So do not compress here at the fingertip because it doesn't correspond to the lower half sternum. Okay, so uh, thank you for your very kind attention and uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Okay, exercise. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks for the you, sharing. Moderator. Yes, yes. Uh, thanks for the sharing, uh, Prof Lim. Uh, very interesting uh, sharing, especially the last uh, last slide uh, on the tattooing of the of the landmark. Okay, there are definitely a lot of takeaways uh, for participants uh, and a couple of questions coming in. Uh, but I think we can take the questions uh, during the Q and A in the interest of time. So next up, uh, we will have uh, Dr. Faraz, uh, who is a consultant from the Department of Emergency Medicine and UH. Uh, he's also a member of the of our SRFAC uh, EXCO uh, and the writer of the first aid paper, which will be published in the Singapore Medical Journal this September. Okay, over to you, uh, Dr. Faraz.
Okay, hello. Can you hear me now? Yep, good. Okay, so let's just uh, share this and go to play. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Faraz Rizvi. I'm one of the uh, consultants in, in SGH Emergency Medicine. Um, I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so uh, talking about the uh, uh, the changes into um, uh, the, the first aid guidelines that are coming up. Uh, we're going to talk about it in a bit of a local context, some bit about the history of how we got here, and then we're going to go into some of the brief uh, highlights about uh, what changes are coming. There's lots of topics um, uh, that have changed uh, and updated, uh, so I'm not going to go into too much scientific depth about them, uh, but just give you a brief highlight as to what we're going to be doing. Um, first aid, actually, it's defined by ILCOR as uh, a behavior and initial care uh, to support acute illness and injury. So it's, it divides it into illness, injury, and it can be initiated by anyone. So um, anyone trained can become a first aider. And part of the remit of SRFAC is to increase that number of first aiders to as many as possible. Who provides it? Well, anyone can be trained to provide it. There's multiple training organizations organizations within Singapore. The local standards are set now by the SRFAC and international standards, uh, as, as you've already heard, they're set by ILCOR. They've started out since the early 90s um, and what they do is every five years they provide, um, they go into particular topics every five years or so and they go through the latest evidence and then they come up with practice guidelines. And uh, so what we're seeing this year is the, uh, uh, the results of the, the 2020 um, uh, guideline responses that they had. Well, who needs it? As we said, they divide it into acute illness, acute injury. Um, so there's a long list of things that can happen in acute illness, usually with cardiac arrest, patients feeling breathless, with chest pain, a whole host of other stuff, and acute injury, um, road traffic collisions and uh, uh, industrial accidents, workplace accidents. These are all uh, people who train for first aid to, to, to meet these needs. Uh, this is actually data from SCDF. This is available at the SCDF website. You can look at the numbers um, over the last 10 years. Um, and actually that's, that's a lot of people, okay, uh, that, uh, that end up needing uh, uh, ambulances called out. And if you consider these people as people that may benefit from uh, some sort of first aid intervention, uh, that's a reasonable amount. Now, interestingly, um, uh, our, uh, uh, road traffic um, accidents are fairly steady. Uh, that's that's a, uh, a a function of the, the safety of the roads in Singapore. Um, uh, trauma itself in other causes has actually increased a bit. If you look at the 2019, particularly 2020 data, there is a bit of a drop off uh, because of restrictions uh, due to COVID. Now, SCDF has an 80% 11 minute response, and I can't stress enough to you just how amazing a response that is. Um, internationally, this is, this is a target where a whole lot of other providers would be dreaming of doing this, okay? However, 10 minutes is still a long time during a medical emergency. And so, and the other issue is that actually recognizing the emergency to the time of call is also uh, an issue. So part of what we're achieving with first aiders is to the ability to recognize early people who need first aid, to be able to provide some care and be aware of limitations and speak, seeking additional help. Now, if you look at the SCDF data, there's also some talk about the number of inappropriate calls. And there's a question as to whether if you have trained first aiders, whether that number would decrease. And there is some evidence for that. So why do we update? Well, 
as with all of these things, there are regular assessments and evaluations of outcomes. And the whole purpose of this, why we do this, is to try and improve outcome. So we review the effectiveness of current treatments. We look at emerging technologies and therapies. And the technology is advancing quite rapidly. Um, and so we look at this based on an international consensus, but we also look at it at a local level. So we're just going to go through some of the uh, topics that that uh, were selected by the by the uh, ILCO uh, committee. I'm not going to give you all of it because it's a it's a reasonably sized paper, but it's it's just we're going to go through some of the basic highlights. I make no apologies. Safety first, okay? So physical, you look at the environment, the event, violence, and infection. Emotional safety. Um, now, this is something that uh, has uh, been highlighted uh, a lot of times. There is a whole lot of issue with uh, stress provided to uh, by people who are providing first aid, particularly at major incidents. Uh, there is a lot of uh, studies on that. And that's something, particularly as first aid providers, first aid trainers, uh, that you should recognize. So there has been some talk about uh, saying that first aid providers should be trained in the administration of bronchodilators in patients with asthma and COPD. That's reasonable. Now, you may be aware that there are lots of different types of metered dose inhalers and a whole variety of presentations of inhaled bronchodilators. We don't expect anyone to know all of them, but the standard metered dose inhaler that most people carry we think that this is a reasonable request that uh, first aid providers be uh, familiar with how to use them. Provision of oxygen, we do not consider a standard first aid skill. Um, it's uh, first of all, because of availability. Secondly, because there's a, there's a whole lot of complications with oxygen therapy that you need to consider. Similarly, with anaphylaxis, there's been uh, quite a lot of studies done that if first aid providers are familiar with uh, adrenaline auto injectors, particularly in patients with, with uh, known anaphylactic uh, conditions, uh, then there may be an improved outcome. Um, again, it's one of those things where there are slightly different uh, delivery systems, but again, uh, within Singapore, there's a there's a few um, uh, auto injectors available, uh, and uh, so it is again reasonable to expect um, uh, familiarity with the the more common ones. Uh, we've already touched on this uh, chest pain there that transfer to secondary care should be taken by emergency medical services. Um, as somebody that has delivered CPR in the back of a taxi cab um, in the A&E porch, um, I can tell you it's not really the best environment to do that. Um, and certainly in the back of an ambulance, uh, there would be, they would have quicker access to uh, electrocardiography, recognizing uh, whether there's any rhythm disturbance or whether there's any ischemic changes. Um, and so that's the recommendation that we have, that it should be done by EMS. So if you're, uh, you're seeing somebody complaining of severe chest pain, please call an ambulance. Don't just put them in the back of a private car. Again, where uh, reassured by the fact that um, in Singapore, we've got fairly amazing response times from SCDF. So it's not an issue. Um, uh, in the UK, where I come from, you occasionally get newspaper headlines about people waiting for up to four hours for an ambulance to arrive. Um, the, there's been also talk about uh, the administration of aspirin by first aid providers. 
again, given the time it takes to get to hospital in Singapore, it really doesn't become that much of an issue. But if available and if no contraindication, it is suggested that you should administer 300 milligrams of aspirin to somebody with chest pain. There is evidence, and this is evidence going back to the late 80s, that if there is chest pain, um, uh, the early, or if there is ischemic heart disease causing the chest pain, the early administration of aspirin does improve long-term outcome. Now, shock is a little bit of a varied uh, presentation. Uh, in this sort of scenario, um, there is talk about passive leg raise. Now, passive leg raise, um, if you've got somebody with a presyncopal episode, so they're standing in a queue, they go cold, clammy, and they're about to faint, yeah, lie them down, elevate their legs. But if they're bleeding out from something, if they if the shock is because of other things, hypovolemia, et cetera, then really it should be dealing with that rather than trying to do passive leg raise. There's a very limited response to that. Um, and again, there is scientific basis for that. Please do not do head down positioning. Um, the other thing that we sometimes find is somebody's in a queue, they're feeling a bit uh, clammy and presyncopal and people keep trying to keep them stood up. Please don't, just lie them down. Now, we've already touched about uh, the recovery position uh, and I make no apologies for stating the obvious. Uh, this is important. This is what saves lives. If you've got an unresponsive casualty, check breathing. If they're not breathing, please proceed to BLS. Um, uh, the response should not be, oh, they're unconscious, just put them in the uh, recovery position. Similarly, as already talked about, if there's ROSC, if you've done CPR, you've got a pulse back, uh, there is some evidence that putting them in the recovery position may hinder detection of subsequent loss of cardiac output. So they should be kept supine and monitored regularly. Okay, you do need somebody to regularly check on that pulse, regularly check their breathing. This is literally cut and pasted out of the SRFAC uh, and the uh, first aid manual. Um, just a quick reminder of how you do the recovery position. Uh, this is available online. I'm not gonna go through it, but it's just how to do it. Um, it is still acceptable for a whole host of procedures where patients um, uh, have certain conditions, as we said earlier, hypoglycemia, some patients with seizures that have recovered. Um, so that's, that's important as well. And I focus your attention to point six, tilt the head back, keep the airway open. Clearly, if you've got a trauma patient, you're not going to be putting them in the recovery position. This is for the medical emergencies only. There's also been uh, some studies looking at seizures. So part of what they've looked at is uh, managing uh, seizures. For the vast majority of people, seizures are usually self-limiting events. Uh, and these are patients with ongoing epilepsy. However, patients who have a cardiac arrest may initially develop what's called anoxic seizures. So they may shake a bit in the beginning. So if you've got somebody that's complained of chest pain and then starts seizing, I would be very worried about that patient. Also, unfortunately, some patients with epilepsy can also develop cardiac arrest during seizure. It is rare, but it is a known complication and Fatalities in epilepsy are known, so it does happen. So it is important that you are dealing with a patient who's had seizures. 
once the seizures have abated, please check the pulse. Please check the breathing. And if you feel that this patient is in cardiac arrest, as in they are still unconscious and there's abnormal breathing, you need to start CPR and consider getting an AED for the patient. Because actually, one of the common rhythms that causes seizure activity in cardiac arrest is ventricular fibrillation. And if you've got that sort of patient chest pain, then proceeds on to have a seizure, I think it is reasonable that you try and get an AED for that patient as soon as possible. One of the other topics they've looked at is poisoning. Now, there's a lot of uh, myths around how to manage a poisoned patient. And the important thing is that actually a lot of old fashioned techniques that people used to use, um, particularly in terms of first aid, may do more harm than good. Please do not try and induce vomiting in somebody that has had uh, uh, a poisoning episode. Uh, specifically, uh, and again, the evidence is there and the Ilkor uh, study group looked at this, that there is a risk of aspiration. So if you make them vomit, they end up regurgitating uh, and that can do more harm. Uh, there's a whole lot of uh, issues about giving people milk, um, water, activated charcoal. Once they come to hospital, they can be assessed and these things can be administered. But I think as first aid, uh, there is some debate as to whether this is uh, uh, helpful. So that's, again, something else to consider. Now, in this... Um, uh, in this session of the ILCO uh, advice and, and guide guidelines, they looked at heat disorders. Um, and specifically, uh, over the last decade or so, there have been uh, quite a few heat wave episodes in North America, in Europe. Uh, you may recall back in 2013, there was a serious heat wave in Southern Europe, um, places like France and Spain. And there was something like over 10,000 fatalities in France and Spain associated with that heat wave event. Um, so yes, in Singapore, we're pretty much prepared for, uh, for heat, but um, this is an, uh, uh, an important international um, consideration. So uh, we are going to go through that. Uh, so it's essentially a spectrum of disease, starting from heat cramps to heat exhaustion, and finally to heat stroke, which is a medical emergency. So essentially heat cramps, well, they're just involuntary muscle spasms. So we've, um, if anybody does jogging out here or running in, in Singapore in the, in the heat here, uh, you probably will have had this. Um, I've certainly had it um, cycling around. Uh, and heat exhaustion, um, again, uh, yeah, cramps, dizziness. Um, the management is still the same. Rehydration, rest, uh, get the casualty out of the sunlight um, and into a cooler environment. These are things that actually can be treated by first aiders um, and they might not necessarily need to come to hospital with these issues. Heat stroke, however, is an entirely different beast. This is a medical emergency. This is something that has actually quite, got quite a high fatality rate. It's around 50%. There's often neurological involvement, the confusion, seizures, they may have syncope, the temperature is really high. They feel hot, they feel dry. Two groups, exertional and classical heat stroke. Uh, for those of you that have uh, provided health cover for uh, a lot of sporting events, marathons in Singapore, bike rides in Singapore, this is one of the things that we worry about. For those of you involved with the uh, Singapore military, um, again, 
exertional heat stroke is one of the things that um, does happen. And in fact, our preparation for it is pretty good. Uh, we have mobile body cooling units. Um, and uh, as the SCDF guys will tell you, uh, we're pretty good on this. Um, but uh, it still does happen. There's still a lot of people that go uh, running out uh, in the sun. Um, uh, the old Noel Coward song about mad dogs and Englishmen going out in the midday sun. Um, uh, unfortunately, I am guilty of that. I do sometimes go out cycling and in, uh, in some very high heat. And yeah, I've had to catch myself out. Classical heat stroke. It's going to be rarely seen in Singapore because we have access to air conditioning pretty much everywhere, but it still does happen. It's usually passive exposure. It's usually seen in the elderly or children. Um, certainly in the uh, French and Spanish uh, episodes in 2013, it was mostly elderly patients uh, living in homes that didn't have any air conditioning uh, because nobody expects to have air conditioning in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, but certainly that was one of the issues. And certainly recently um, uh, in North America, in Canada and Western United States, um, with the heat wave there, there have been episodes there. So the most important action is immediate cooling. And uh, the Yelkor committee looked at a whole lot of different ways of cooling. And in fact, scientifically looking at it, the best way of cooling, they said, is uh, immersion. Now, um, clearly immersion is going to be uh, a bit tricky. Um, please do not throw people in the harbour if you think they've got um, uh, heat stroke. Don't just throw them in a pool uh, because usually if they've got heat stroke, they have altered mentation and you'll end up drowning them as well. Um, so we go with the next best thing. Clearly, if there is immersion available, then uh, there's going to be um, uh, that needs to be used. There are some immersion uh, pans available, but they're rare. Mostly, uh, it's going to be with uh, the next best, which is uh, cooling by uh, fanning, by uh, providing cold packs, uh, particularly in the axilla. Uh, and again, if it's heat stroke, patients must be transferred to hospital as soon as possible. Uh, it has also been observed that patients with heat stroke, um, uh, because they can't swallow safely, uh, they shouldn't really be forced to drink. Um, so that's, uh, that's the further bit of advice from Ilko. The other thing they looked at in depth was looking at bleeding and hemorrhage control in trauma. A third of trauma mortality is due to hemorrhage. And of those, up to half of them happen in a pre-hospital period. Again, this is mostly from international data. Now, the other good thing about Singapore is we don't have much guns here. Um, so that's, that's an additional uh, safety for us. Um, in, uh, in about nine years of working here in an emergency department, I have seen one case of gunshot injury, and I've seen the number of stabbings I've seen have been in single digits. Um, uh, in a hospital in the UK, you would see a major stabbing incident probably about once a week. Um, and certainly our colleagues in the US see uh, gunshot injuries on a regular basis. So the pattern of trauma here is slightly different, but the basic principles still stand. So if you've got bleeding from extremities, uh, we feel that a tourniquet uh, is better than manual pressure or dressing alone. This is talking about major hemorrhage. So this is usually arterial bleeds. Um, and although improvised tourniquets will still be taught, we encourage first aid providers and organizations 
to feel, think about using commercial tourniquets. There are quite a few that are available. Um, and uh, again, when we talk about the first aid kit, uh, the importance is familiarity with them. Um, uh, but we will continue to teach the improvised tourniquet as a foundational skill. That's not going to go away. But our advice is actually the evidence shows that uh, the commercial tourniquets are actually uh, slightly better. Now, bleeding from the trunk and the head, uh, you're going to struggle to get a tourniquet. Um, so for that, it is direct pressure. Okay. Um, if not possible, so if it's a single first aider and they need to do something else as well, then uh, pressure uh, with elastic brandage. Um, there is some evidence and there was some talk about hemostatic dressings uh, in the ILCO uh, guidance, but actually hemostatic dressings are still not commercially available. Um, uh, a lot of the data from hemostatic uh, dressings uh, comes either from hospital practice or from uh, military practice. It is available to military providers, but uh, um, not yet to civilian providers. But that may change. That, again, is part of the new technologies and new uh, procedures that will filter down to general use over the years. So uh, be aware that this exists and that at some point um, it will filter down to uh, general civilian use. Carlos, uh, can you uh, try to uh, wrap it up? Because I need of course. to leave some time for QA. Thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely, of course. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Uh, so, head injuries, yep, uh, we've got, whoa, okay. Uh, we've uh, also got the uh, be to be aware of the mechanisms uh, of injury, and uh, we've got to uh, consider. Uh, the uh, risk of spinal injuries, that's, that's the other thing that they mention. And uh, spine uh, as well. So um, uh, there's talk about the uh, spinal immobilization uh, and the uh, changes in that uh, to suspect uh, spinal injury, particularly after certain types of trauma. Uh, there is also some uh, uh, talk about dental um, uh, trauma, uh, that they looked at the various methods of protecting teeth, essentially um, uh, wrap the tooth up. If you re-implant the tooth immediately, then there's the greatest chance of tooth survival. Otherwise, wrap it up, send the patient in, uh, and that can be reinstated. We've also looked at bites and stings, uh, so please irrigate them with water. Uh, this is actually more there was some talk of this in the ILCOR data, but we, this is more from local uh, uh, studies that we've done and we've tried to attempt to provide some uh, data on. Uh, so we looked at snake bites, uh, that please do not put a tourniquet on a snake bitten limb, uh, immobilize, uh, and uh, there has been issues with uh, um, the uh, uh, jellyfish found locally. Uh, so uh, we've provided some data about marine envenomations uh, and how to treat that. Uh, and also within some of the education changes that have gone on uh, to provide um, updates, essentially. So essentially, uh, the ideals of delivering first aid remain the same. And uh, although the scientific basis is evolving, uh, the, uh, there will be further cycles of updated practice, and we feel that the uh, community of first aid providers, we will be continuing to strive for improving outcomes. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Paros. Um, for a very interesting update and important and also contextualized to the local setting. So maybe now invite uh, the panel the panels, a panel to assemble. I think the panels are here, the panel members are all here. Uh, that's uh, Professor Lucy Han, Marcus, Dr. Okay. Faros, as well as uh, Ben and uh, Hong Chi. Um, so I think everybody knows uh, these very esteemed uh, panel members. So, um, 
So I think uh, maybe I will start first and then Ma'am Janice, uh, you, you just chip in. I think there's been a very robust uh, inputs from the Q&A and thank Marcus, Ben and all the rest for answering some of these questions. Um, so uh, just to jump in, uh, okay, I think one of the things was talking about AED, recovery position, places of worship. So maybe I asked Marcus about what is the strategy Singapore-wise about AEDs uh, moving forward, uh, what is the master plan? Uh, you know, uh, is the vision for every AED on every floor or every five meters away? Or, or what's the plan? <laughs> this is a worship and all that, you know? So, so maybe... Uh, match yeah. Next week, see what... yeah. yeah, so um, first of all, disclaimer, I don't have any shares in AED. Uh, no, 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 of course not, of course not. Okay. So, but um, I think one of the... Encouraging things is uh, we have actually seen a dramatic increase in the number of AEDs, publicly available AEDs in Singapore uh, over the last, uh, especially last five years, uh, as you can uh, notice. Uh, right? So um, currently we estimate there are something between 4,000 to 5,000 AEDs uh, around Singapore. Um, but I think it's not just the number of AEDs, but also whether people are aware of uh, what is an AED, how to use an AED, where to find an AED, and being accessible to public use. You know, so for some examples, you know, um, there are, for example, many AEDs in army camps, for example, and uh, for a long time, it's not available to the public, even though the army guard house may be just uh, 10 meters away from a cardiac arrest victim. So I think it is uh, awareness, uh, making the AEDs available. Uh, and I think a key part of this is the technology. Right, so uh, we highly encourage anyone who buys an AED or owns an AED to register this with our National AED Registry. So that is the ready re registry of AEDs, and this is uh, maintained by a Singapore Heart Foundation on behalf of SCDF and our partners. Now, if you register the AED with uh, a ready, basically number one, it will be available on my responder, which means that people can see it, and if they're activated for a cardiac arrest case, they will know how to go and find it and get it. Uh, second, as uh, Singapore Heart Foundation has a scheme where if you register the AED with them, uh, they can actually provide subsidies, uh, for example, for changing the, the pads or the batteries that is actually used. So all these are, again, some incentives that I think we can put in place. Now, as for recommendations, you know, where should we place AEDs and all that? Uh, we've actually done a lot of research on this. And uh, it's quite interesting. At the moment, the coverage in HDB estates is pretty good, right? So as you know, every alternate HDB block has got an AED. Uh, so normally you should be able to get the AED within three to four minutes and bring it to the victim's site if you know where to find it. The gap is that uh, there are many, for example, private housing estates uh, that don't have AEDs, condominiums. Uh, some people point out in the chat, you know, uh, places of worship, you know, community kind of uh, settings, you know, offices and all that. And the problem is all these are private uh, kind of property, right? So in other words, government has no mandate to go into invade your private property and install an AED there, right? So uh, this is something that we have to work with uh, civic society, work with the uh, kind of grassroots and, and common understanding. So for example, I work with my uh, condo, kind of a committee to actually get the AD in stock, right? And in the grand scheme of things for a condo, uh, actually buying an AD or leasing an AD is a small cost compared to your garbage collection or my swimming pool maintenance and all that. Yeah. So it's just a matter of advocating in your uh, community where you stay, right? And uh, getting people to realize that's important. Same thing in my church, I actually donated the AD and got it installed on the wall, right? Because if not, nobody else is going to do it, right? So I think at the individual level, there's a lot of things that we can do uh, to make our community safe and to contribute to our public safety, right? Uh, having said that, I think SEDF, um, the Public Affairs Department has been reaching out to uh, a lot of these uh, kind of areas that have gaps. You know, for example, we are in discussions to actually put AEDs in the gardens, you know, the, the small parks that are part of the private estates. Uh, so that one, we may have a mandate to be able to put the AED there, right? And then if the residents know that uh, in their estate, there's actually an AED in the park, right? They can go and get it, right? But to put one in a private house, a single story terrace house and all that may be quite challenging. So I think we need some creative ways 
to be able to address some of these uh, uh, remaining gaps and to be able to provide AED coverage. One last small note is uh, we are also working on a pilot with SEDF to use drones to deliver AEDs. So in uh, places like uh, you know downtown Marina Bay, East Coast Park, uh, it might make sense to fly a drone with an AED to the victim because the ambulance will take a long time to get into the, the, the park, you know, and uh, to bring the AED to the victim. Thanks. Thanks, Marcus. Anybody else, uh, the panelists, uh, Ben, Srihan, Hongchi, Dr. Faros, uh, comment, commenting about the AED and all that. I think on, on the Q&A, there's uh, quite a lot of other questions about it, but uh, yeah. Uh, this is Ben. I'll just yeah, ben, in this, one this, uh, very this tiny yeah. thing in addition to the long list that Marcus has mentioned. Yes. Uh, we also have some AEDs in some taxis as well. Uh, yes. And they will be activated uh, via the uh, uh, my responder system as well. Okay. What, what about training for AEDs? I mean, there were uh, some uh, there's some questions about uh, competency to use AED, all that. Uh, although I know AED is fairly what does it idiot proof? Like fairly easy to use, like, right? Because there's instructions for that. Any uh, any thoughts on about training for AED? Of course, training is the best. Like, right? Yeah, so if I can uh, speak to that. So of course, we highly encourage everyone to get trained on how to use an AED. And I think it does make a difference when you are in an emergency situation, right? You may panic and not, not know what to do. So definitely training is very, very useful and important. Uh, but having said that, you do not need to be certified or trained to use an AED, right? Just like you don't need to be certified to use a fire extinguisher, right? Anyone can, you know, uh, in an emergency, actually grab the fire extinguisher and use it, follow the instructions, right? And the other thing that uh, I think you can help to disseminate in your training centers and in your communication to the public is that don't worry if you don't know how to use the AED. When you call 995, the dispatcher is actually, they do have a protocol to guide the user on uh, using the AED. Plus, of course, every AED will have uh, instructions on the box or on the device itself, right? So that there, there is a lot of help on how to use the AED. It's not difficult. Uh, and that there is help available to guide you through it. Thanks, Marcus. So one more last thing about AED was somebody asked about using AED on the infant, six-month-old hour. Can only be used for one year and above. So I know Gene is here, but never mind. Marcus or Ben, you want to answer? Uh, no, actually, the Pete's guys will be the best to answer this one. Uh, no, I'm just a chat. I'm, I'm just sharing it. I'm not supposed to answer. Sorry, that's So Kichong to answer. La. No, no, Ben. I mean, okay, so so in the so if I mean there's no evidence below one, but I think if in the in the interest of the patient and all that, I think uh, you know, off-label use, all that, I think we need to uh, consider that. So it's not that you can't use it per se, but I think it's the risk-benefit kind of thing. Uh. And for saving a life, I think, yeah, right, Marcus. Yeah, so if I can add, I'm no pediatrician, yeah. uh, by the way, yeah. uh, but um, I do understand that uh, different device manufacturers actually have different pediatric kind of attachments. So yeah. for example, some of the common brands actually have specific pediatric pads that have some attenuation of the uh, yeah. uh, energy delivered, right? Yeah. So if you have a pediatric uh, pads and you know pediatric uh, suitable machine to use, that is the best. And I believe, for example... Yeah. At the children's emergency department, they have specialized kind of pediatric, uh, you know, defibrillation kind of equipment and pets and all that, right? Mm. But if you're in the public and there's no, you know, special pediatric pets available, uh, basically any defibrillation is still better than no defibrillation, yes, right? Exactly. So, yeah. yeah, just put it on, analyze if there's no shockable rhythm. And most of the time, I think in children anyway, it's enough. usually not a shockable yeah. rhythm, yeah. right? So ventilation, all these are actually compression, actually more important. Which actually uh, flows into the next. Uh, I think there was one or two questions asked about if we were to do CPR or first aid and anything unto what happens to the victim or the casualty, how are uh, how are the rescuers uh, protected, uh, You know, under the Samaritan kind of thing. But uh, so you know, any comments, uh, Srihan, Ben. About yes, this? Uh, Srihan, just want to mention. I I think. Although Singapore, there's no good Samaritan law, but mm. as, as long as the rescuer, they act mm. uh, on good intention, mm. okay, you know, it's very unlikely to get sued. Uh. And, yeah. and then uh, Singapore Heart Foundation, uh, they also provide free uh, legal advice uh, for, mm. for those who, who, uh, who get sued because of performing CPR and first aid. Uh. So can, 
I think can approach uh, yeah. heart foundation. Yeah. And I, I just want to supplement uh, about training. Uh, mm. AD training. I, I think the training should be a whole package, you know, uh, uh, hence only CPR and AED together. Uh, I think it shouldn't be fragmented. Uh, so, mm. so they can learn the whole, you know, Agreed. assess unresponsive call for help and all these things, uh, which include, uh, because th- those are related. Uh. Mm. Okay, over to you, yeah. John. So, so I agree. So, so I think the intent is very important. So long as the intent is, uh, you know, from good all that, I think uh, as, as a community, definitely we will support the act. Uh, and I, I remember, I, I think recently in KK, we talked about this and I looked at it actually, uh, Minister Shamugaratnam, I think, uh, did mention in Parliament that, you know, uh, I think so long as the intent is what, uh, you know, I think the government all that, you know, will, you know, support the, the, the community la, in the best interest of the uh, res- uh, rescue order, right? Okay, so, so uh, Ma'am Janice, you, you want to, anything you want to, yeah. yeah. All right, yeah, thanks, thanks, Prof. I think there's some yeah. questions on yeah. uh, performing of ventilation, uh, CPR, mm-hmm. and all, especially in this pandemic, la, whether mm-hmm. or not is it recommended yes. on use of disposable uh, face shield and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and probably you can have some of the panelists to, you know, probably chime in and uh, add on to, to you know, um, to address this question. Yeah. Yeah, I think this, this is a very difficult question to answer. Uh, the uh, yeah you can you can consider uh you can consider the face shield uh, if you are doing if you are doing uh mouth to mouth ventilation uh. but if you are if you are not willing to do uh especially on stranger like uh, I think now in COVID nineteen uh, it's so infectious that uh, you go to fish market go to hawker center also can can. Can get it, <laughs> can, can get quarantined and all that. So I we should concentrate more on uh, hands only CPR. Uh, however, I think it's important in children uh, uh multiple ventil- multiple ventilation. So 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 if you if you are if you are trained, uh, able and willing to perform multiple ventilation, yeah, to your own children, for example, please please go ahead. Okay, we are not we are not. Sort of ban uh, mouth mouth ventilation, la. and and the the, the disposable um, face shield uh, is uh, in, in theory la, it, it prevent uh, some infection la, But it, you know how how the, the there's no one do a clinical trial la, so I think it's very difficult to do, and and if you have you use it la. but unfortunately most people don't carry this uh, face shield in their pockets. Mm-hmm. That's, what, that's my comment. All right, Ken. Thanks, thanks, Prof. Um, any other comments from other panelists? Uh, for for this question, you know, uh, from our participants. Uh, I just I'll just chip in here. Uh, I think let's not be too hung up on the uh, ventilation part. Uh, whilst of course for children, uh, a lot of the time the cardiac arrest uh, is due to a respiratory cause. In in that group, uh, and if you can, you are willing to, they are your own child. Uh, please do not hesitate to get the ventilation. But by and large, for most bystanders, CPR, uh, where it's a, a stranger outside there and it's an adult, uh, the causes of those arrests is uh, typically cardiac in origin. Uh, do not be too hung up about uh, whether I should or should not provide the uh, ventilation. Focus on good quality chest compressions until help arrives. I think that will be the best thing that you could do at the very least. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Dr. Ben. All right. Um, Prof, uh, Prof Ng, do you have any other um, questions for our um, panelists? So, so I think there's a very robust uh, thing. I think we can go on until the rest of the morning. Uh, I think there's been more than 40 questions. I think uh, some of it has been answered. Uh, so I, w- I was also telling Daniel that we will try to collate all these questions uh, to sort of uh, uh, what and uh, of course uh, share. Lah. Okay, uh, I apologize if we don't uh, manage to specifically answer some of these questions, but I think it's very good that we're having a discussion. And in fact, uh, that's one of the advantages of COVID like, in a way, like, right? Uh, in a usual forum, you know, uh, some people don't have time to ask questions, right? but in this case now, you just type, 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 and then all the questions are in. So at least we understand what the ground is uh, concerned about. And mm-hmm. as a council, we, we, we should address it. Like. Uh, I think there was, maybe I just, yeah, just asked uh, Dr. Faros about Tony case, I think there were some uh, questions about use of Tony case, you know, what's indications and all that. So maybe Dr. Faros, you want to summarize it for us? Of course, yes. Uh, Tony case, so the actual scientific evidence of this is based on a lot of studies performed by military investigators. Uh, 
Um, uh, so, yes, in terms of severe injury to a limb, so if there's an extremity injury with arterial bleeding, the evidence is that putting a commercial tourniquet um, is better than an improvised one. It's not completely, um, uh, you know, it, the evidence is there, but it's not that strong. Um, but the advice from ILCO is that if available, a commercial tourniquet is better on uh, uh, an extremity injury where there's arterial bleeding. So yes, we advise if somebody's a first aid provider or uh, part of a first aid organization, then yes, it is reasonable that uh, they should be familiar with uh, uh, a sort of commercially available tourniquets. Um, uh, SCDF has some, uh, quite a lot of the first aid provider organizations um, have access to these uh, commercially available tourniquet. There's quite a few versions of them, usually some sort of windlass um, uh, uh, device uh, that goes on. However, we appreciate that not everyone is going to be carrying a commercial tourniquet in, the, in their back pocket. So the, it will still be taught how to improvise a tourniquet if necessary. Now that said, the majority of wounds that happen, certainly in the context of civilian injuries, are not going to be arterial bleeders. Um, as I said before, these are usually the function of either um, a, a ballistic um, uh, injuries uh, or uh, sort of injuries with, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're usually violent um, uh, injuries. Occasionally you'll get to see this in industrial accidents. Um, uh, so yeah, but it's, it's going to be a rare event that a tourniquet is required um, in the context of local practice. But I, it's, um, if available, I think it is reasonable that a uh, commercial tourniquet is used, but we will not stop teaching how to use an improvised tourniquet. Thank you very much. Uh, very Chi, yeah, Hong Chi, anything else to add or uh, anything else to share? I, mean... uh, I have nothing to add, but I thought the question on mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation mm -hmm. on top of cardiac arrest has been raised many occasions. I think I totally agree with Dr. Ben Leong and the rest of the panelists. Uh, it's to really focus on good, good CPR. Thank you. Yeah, over to you, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. So, so I think time is catching up. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, so, so we're going to have, uh, so we're going to uh, end this session. So thanks everybody for a very, very exciting and uh, 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 discussion and uh, topic. Uh, so we will start again at 11.05 instead of 10.55 as previously advertised. So everybody gets a 10 minute break. Uh, but before we end this session, maybe uh, I have some last words from all the panelists one by one. Maybe uh, we start with Ms. Wee first, Hong Chi. Uh, oh, thank Any? you. Thank, thanks. Yeah, thanks, yeah. For, thanks for joining us. <laughs> okay, Dr. Faros. Uh, thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity. Um, so, yes, uh, first aid. Uh, it's important. Um, uh, it's important that we train more people um, uh, and uh, have better outcomes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, ben? Uh, I've always been saying this. Uh, as an emergency mm. physician, we deal with emergencies and cardiac arrest is the emergency of all emergencies. They can't wait till they make it to the hospital. Mm. Life saving has to, begun, to begin uh, outside in the community. And I thank all the participants for joining us here. Do spread the word, train everybody, uh, save more <laughs> lives out there. Thank you. Save lives, yes, very good. Uh, Professor Marcus. Yeah, thanks, Kichong. I do want to address the elephant in the room, which is COVID, uh, basically. Um, and uh, we, we again, we have done a lot of research on this. We have found that basically our bystander CPR rates have dropped about 10% uh, because of COVID. We have actually had to suspend, for example, my responders for certain periods where mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, community spread. Um, and uh, I believe, you know, training centers and all that also have challenges, right, because of all the restrictions and all that. Uh, nevertheless, I do want to encourage everyone here 
that uh, Singapore overall, you know, we are managing COVID fairly well. You know, vaccination rates, we are going to hit 80% soon. Um, and there is light at the end of the tunnel. So we can look forward to a post-pandemic kind of uh, world, you know, a situation uh, where basically we, we can live with COVID and we can, you know, uh, go back to important things that, you know, are neglected during the pandemic period. And I believe, you know, uh, first aid, CPR, cardiac arrest, these are some of the important things that we should not neglect. You know, so just encouragement to everyone that, uh, you know, keep up your efforts, keep up your your training, you know, keep up your communication with the public advocacy and all that. Uh, because very soon, again, you know, we will find ways to adapt, you know, how to, whether it's going to be, you know, more emphasis on hands only or, you know, a bit more education to the public about, um, you know, keeping themselves safe, you know, what, if washing their hands and, you know, watching their, their personal protective equipment, things like that, you know. Um, but, you know, we can still save lives and we can still um, make a difference, uh, right? So let's keep yes. at it. Agree, agree. We're in an endemic phase. I wanted to say endemic resuscitation, but endemic COVID resuscitation, sorry. Uh, Professor Lim, Chairman. I, I wish uh, uh, ah. the hands only CPR and AD uh, can be taught in in everybody. Uh. So, so I think in Singapore, I think the most effective way is go to school. Uh, school. Uh, you know, uh, most of us went to school, you know, you can start training them in secondary, uh, primary school, high school, and then sort of research uh, in the secondary school. And uh, SAF has uh, done an excellent job uh, because all the, mm. all the recruits uh, the, uh, are, are taught how to learn CPR. Uh, so, so, so uh, you know, almost all the, all the male citizens have to go through national service. Uh, hopefully they also extend it to the reservists uh, because you know the retention skill is quite quite low uh, but but you know but if not at least the C, uh, CPR uh, the the SDF dispatcher will guide them <laughs> so so I, I think I think I think that's excellent and and I I think uh, I also want to thank uh, everybody uh, for your support to the mm. SRFC. Uh, Kichong, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Janice. Ma'am Janice, you wrap up first. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Prof uh, Kichong, you know, for a, a nice partnership this morning. And thanks to all the panelists, you know, for your you know, um, sharing. Yeah, I think myself, I've learned a lot as well. Yeah. Okay, so we will uh, uh, end this session. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we will continue to collate your questions and we'll uh, try to address them. As we progress, uh, we take a sort of a 12 minute break or 11 minute break and come back uh, for the next session, chat by Ben and uh, Feng Chi um, uh, at 11.05. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Okay, uh, it is uh, 11.05 a.m. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody, to the uh, second session uh, for this morning's uh, SRFAC uh, Town Hall. So we had a very exciting uh, first session uh, just now, uh, and uh, we thank the uh, panelists uh, from the morning session. So now we are moving on. Uh, this second session uh, will be about the uh, advanced cardiac life support, post-cardiac arrest uh, management, uh, extracorporeal life support, uh, and uh, life support costs for uh, nurses. So my name is uh, Benjamin Leong. I'm a senior consultant at the National University Hospital Emergency Medicine Department. I'm also a member of the ACLS subcommittee. Uh, together with me, I have uh, Sister Wee Fong Chi. So I'd like to uh, let her introduce herself and say hi. Sister Wee? I think I'm muted. Yes. Okay. Hi, hi, morning. Sorry, I was I was muted. I'm the uh, Deputy Nursing Director, Nursing, Santo uh, Hospital, also the Chair for LNCN uh, Subcom. Yeah, thanks, uh, Feng Chi. So, uh, as I was saying, this session will be covering uh, advanced uh, cardiac life support, uh, post cardiac arrest care, uh, extra corporal life support, as well as the LNCN life support costs uh, for uh, nurses. Oh, uh, can you hear me better? Uh, uh, yes, yeah. yes. 
okay, then I'll have to do this then. <laughs> uh, all right. So I, I say again, so this particular session, we'll be having the, uh, uh, we'll be covering ACLS, uh, post-cardiac arrest care, uh, extracorporeal life support, as well as uh, life support costs uh, for nurses. Uh, and together, we have four uh, wonderful pan uh, panelists, and we'll have a fifth as well later during the Q&A, and we'll introduce them uh, before each of uh, uh, their respective uh, uh, talks. Now, just some housekeeping. Uh, there is a Q&A button uh, at the top of the uh, screen, uh, which I think many of you have started to use just now. Uh, do feel free to post your questions uh, into that uh, Q&A uh, chat. Uh, along the way, um, uh, and then we'll try and answer them along the way if we can, or uh, we might collate them till later. Uh, please do refrain from using the general chat function uh, because that can be a little bit distracting, you know, seeing all the chats uh, appear at the bottom of the screen. Okay, with the uh, housekeeping um, of the way, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our uh, first speaker. Uh, he's the uh, ACLS uh, Subcommittee Chair, uh, Clinical A Prof uh, Ching Chi Kyung. Uh, he's going to be speaking on the Singapore Advanced Cardiac Life Support Guidelines uh, 2021. Uh, Prof Ching is a senior consultant cardiologist uh, at the Department of Cardiology, uh, National Heart Center Singapore, and he also happens to be my classmate. So I'm going to hand the time over to Ching. Hi, thanks, man. Thank you for that kind introduction. So let me share my screen. I just want to, do you see the slide? Singapore ACLS Guidelines 2021. Uh, thank you once again for the kind introduction. My task is to provide uh, the update on ACLS Guidelines 2021. I am uh, honored and privileged to be the chair for the ACLS subcommittee in SRFAC. And with my fellow committee members, we hope to print this in SMJ in the months to come. I think the chain of survival is never under, uh, we should not underemphasize this chain of survival. As you can see in the five rings that we have crafted for Singapore, the ACLS component of it is really towards the end when we receive a patient who have received good quality CPR, early defibrillation, early evacuation to medical uh, emergency services, and when they are then um, you know, achieve ROSC, we move on to provide the foundation and the uh, facilities to optimize their recovery. The last guidelines was published in 2016, and we will strive to publish the new guidelines uh, in the next few months. These are some updates of the ACLS 2021 update. We have combined the algorithm into a universal algorithm. Uh, it is a focus modification so as to provide better visual aids as we resuscitate someone in cardiac arrest. This algorithm will be further discussed in the lecture in three sections. Um, first, recognizing who is critically ill, early recognition, and early or call for help. We move on to the next part. Upon recognition of a patient or a victim in cardiac arrest, we focus on providing good continuous chest compression, early defibrillation. We then move on to the next component, which is secondary survey, advanced airway, providing ventilation, secure IV access, drugs, and further defibrillation. And what are some of the elements of post-resuscitation care that would help optimize full or good neurological recovery for that patient or victim. We will also provide some recommendations for defibrillation based on the signs that's available. We will be a, there will be a mention of ACLS in special population. And of course, we can't go away without uh, a focused discussion on the approaches to common tachy and Brady arrhythmias. This is the first component. It emphasizes on recognizing a patient who is critically ill early, number two, and we call for help. Essentially, 
the earlier speakers have talked and emphasized on checking the responsiveness of the patient. And if they have normal breathing, in the absence of normal breathing, unresponsive, you, know, you make a, death, a preliminary diagnosis of cardiac arrest. Whereupon, you know, uh, activate the system if you are outside the hospital, whereas in the hospital, you call for a code blue response and bring a resuscitate or a defibrillator early uh, into the scene of resuscitation. After which, if the, uh, you have make a diagnosis of cardiac arrest for that victim or patient, we want to emphasize start continuous chest compression. The quality and the depth and the quality measures has been uh, shared by the previous speaker. And it is important that some form of feedback and rotation of the person providing continuous chest compression every two minutes or so is important because physical fatigue does impact the quality of chest compression. At this, at this stage, we ask that a defibrillator be made available as soon as possible and the pads be attached to the patient. And if a shockable rhythm is identified, whether with AED or by manual analysis, chest compression should be continued during charging of the defibrillator just before the shock is delivered. Um, although we ensure that the scene is clear, it might be useful to have a practice chant such as shocking on three, two, one, so that careful coordination between the operator delivering the chest compression and the rescuer delivering the defibrillation. So with that, we minimize interruption to continuous chest compression. At this stage, regardless of the rhythm, continuous chest compression continues to be the essential component of treatment in patients with cardiac arrest. Let me move on to some of the specifics of defibrillation. A biphasic waveform is preferred. You may start at 120 joules if you do not know what is the setting or the capability of that defibrillator, it is reasonable to move on to maximum. Uh, if it is a monophasic waveform, we recommend and suggest that you start at the highest energy available. A biphasic waveform is favored as it results in a lower peak electrical current delivery to the chest and therefore reduce stunning to the myocardium while achieving similar or greater efficacy. We recommend a single shock strategy uh, as uh, opposed to uh, stack shocks, so as to offer minimum interruption to CPR. And it's been shown to improve survival to hospital admission and discharge. Second and subsequent shock may be escalated to the maximum energy so as to allow maximum results in restoring a perfusing rhythm. There is a popular method or a uh, method where they perform double sequential defibrillation. It is a practice of applying two uh, defibrillators uh, and uh, deliver a shock almost simultaneously. Some case reports have uh, shown good outcomes, but a systemic review does not suggest routine use of double sequential defibrillation and hence we do not recommend this as routine uh, application during defibrillation. If they do not have a shockable rhythm, then it is essential to continue with good chest compression. Now, what about patients with a CIED or cardiac an implantable electronic device, such as a pacemaker or a defibrillator. This is a patient with an internal cardioverter defibrillator or ICD with a lead ankle at the apex of the right ventricle. You could see two coils, two thick you know, metal or radio opaque structures along the lead. Those are coils that deliver electrical energy or shocks. The coils are akin to the pads that you apply on a person's chest for defibrillation. There is no contraindications to delivering defibrillation in patients with pacemakers 
OICD. We ask that you place their defibrillation pad about one palm length away from the device, about 15 centimeters as illustrated on this X-ray or diagram. Uh, the pacemaker or ICD may be reset when the electrical current passes through the chest cavity, especially if the pads are placed too near the device, but that is okay. Um, that can be reset or reprogrammed to its default settings or pre-programmed settings after resuscitation. It is also safe to perform chest compression in patients with a ICD. Some, there are some fears that what if the ICD delivers a shock while doing chest compression? Electrical energy travels through the path of this resistance and the presence of fluids in the chest cavity uh, provides the path of least resistance. If you are doing chest compression with gloves or on top of a cloth, a green tower, or even uh, uh, um, that provides suitable insulating material. At most, you may have a tingling sensation in your palms as electrical current passes through you. It is highly unlikely that the rescuer will get a catastrophic or a nasty electrical shock. We move on to secondary survey. Um, we look at airway, we look at breathing and circulation. Now, as mentioned, CCC, continuous chest compression is key with interruption of less than 10 seconds. And I'm certain as a team, rehearse, goes through the drill, they will achieve F1 formula drivers mechanics efficiency in doing secondary survey or the other intervention less than less than 10 seconds. The endotracheal tube ETT is the definitive airway. It provides a conduit uh, for oxygenation and ventilation while minimizing the risk of aspiration. But I must say, we have to confirm and monitor ETT placement. Uh, we, we shared and talked about the five-point escalation, but if you do have CO2 capnometry, which is a uh, little device, uh, it turns from purple, you know, uh, to a yellow color during expiration, indicating the presence of CO2. Between the breath, the, the color may change from purple to yellow. You know, if, if you have persistent purple uh, coloration on the device, suggests that, hey, that might be in a, inappropriate or incorrect ETT placement or inadequate perfusion. So use a CO2 capnometer if you have, and I think we should have it in more all places. Alternatively, quantitative waveform capnography is the most reliable method for confirmation of ETT placement. It also has the added advantage of monitoring for dislodgement and also reflects the changes in perfusion and response to CPR efforts. Uh, in the absence of these devices, it is essential and that we learn to do a, a good five-point escalation. IV access uh, should then be obtained. IV access over big veins, such as uh, uh, veins over the endocubital external jugular is preferred. Unless IV access is unsuccessful, difficult, or not feasible, usually in an out of the hospital setting, Intraosseous access is an alternative. Uh, we strive to get good IV access as much as possible. Then we move on to, uh, um, to as we perform the CPR, uh, the chest compression, every two minutes you have a stop CCC window where we assess for shockable rhythms. In the absence of shockable rhythms, what are the additional measures to institute, or was there a return of spontaneous of uh, spontaneous circulation where we could then transit the patient to post recess care? Some of the drugs that we use would be uh, IV adrenaline. IV adrenaline is a drug that we are all familiar with. is to be given one milligram. Uh, we dilute it in ten mils to be given every three to five minutes. And it should be given as soon as possible. Uh, there are two randomized 
trials of adrenaline, which enrolled more than 8,500 patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, showing that early administration of adrenaline increased survival. Uh, uh, there are also 16 observational styles, uh, studies uh, in the recent systemic analysis by Yocor, and they found that there is an association between early adrenaline usage and return of spontaneous circulation for patients with non-shockable rhythms, although it was not universally seen in all observational studies. Now, in those uh, with a shockable rhythm, the data and scientific uh, data suggests that we prioritize defibrillation and CPR initially, and we will put uh, we would uh, progress to, pro to, to, uh, to give adrenaline if initial efforts at CPR and defibrillation are not successful. So it is a upgraded recommendation that adrenaline be given as soon as possible. In patients with uh, refractory VT, VF, amiodarone would be given at 300 milligrams bolus and the repeat bolus at 150 milligrams, usually at the next stop CCC window. Of note, during resuscitation, there is prolonged circulation time, and each drug should be flushed with a 20 mil bolus of normal saline, ensuring good quality CPR thereafter, so that the drugs may be delivered for its intended effect. And the effects of the drug may not be evident till the next CPR cycle. Lignocaine is an alternative and it is of, of note, ignocaine is a, uh, perhaps a good option in patients with myocardial ischemia, given as a initial bolus of 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kg and a repeat dose of 0.5 to 0.75 milligrams per kg. Then uh, the team looks hard for the causes for this cardiac arrest. And hence, we teach about 5 Ts and 5 H whether there's hypoxia, there's hypervolumia, there's acidosis, there's a hyper or hypokalemia. A hypothermia is un very unlikely in our climate. And the toxins, there's tamponade related to cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax, thrombosis of the coronary arteries leading to an MI or myocardial infarction or fulminant uh, catastrophic pulmonary embolism and of course trauma. And after that, uh, in the absence of a shockable rhythm, uh, continue with good quality CPR, chest compression, with the drugs of adrenaline in every three to five minutes, assess for return of pulse. If there is a return of a pulse, measurable, palpable pulse, measurable blood pressure, uh, there is a return of spontaneous circulation. We then transit the patient to post-resuscitation care. These are some of the measures that the hospital will engage to enhance good recovery. I won't go through too much of it. It, it involves hypothermia or targeted temperature management. The various ICUs or CCUs in the hospitals would have the facilities and protocols to uh, provide this treatment. In patients, who had a cardiac arrest related to a uh, myocardial infarction, they may, and may, uh, they may, it might be suitable or that they undergo emergent percutaneous coronary intervention where the coronary arteries are imaged and any critical stenosis uh, in the coronary arteries are stented to provide good coronary perfusion to the myocardium. And hopefully we perfuse the heart we good, provide good end organ perfusion and we optimize good uh, neurological recovery. It is important to maintain uh, good blood pressure. We want to avoid hypoxemia and maintain normal carbon dioxide level. Uh, of note, it is recommended that we look out, detect and treat uh, any active seizures and treat them and we move on to, to neural prognostication. This is important as you identify patients who may have severe hypoxic encephalopathy, and that determines 
subsequent actions, be it um, withdrawal of care, be it organ donation and such. And now let's move on to some of the uh, special circumstances about uh, the, there is a mention on ACLS in special circumstances. First, ACLS in drowning. Uh, it is reported that the survival rates uh, of cardiac arrest associated with drowning is 13%. Drowning patients die of hypoxemia and the duration and severity of hypoxia is the most important determinant of mortality. Hence, rescue breathing should be prioritized. Uh, the earlier uh, speakers and panelists talk about this uh, continuum, or rather this, this question that is brought up, but this is a special case where in drowning, where rescue breathing would be uh, beneficial uh, for this victim. Chest compression and BCLS should be administered as per protocol and all victims uh, to be evacuated to hospital for tertiary care. Um, unless there is a suspicion of spinal injury, um, routine cervical spine stabilization of drowning victims may delay resuscitation and is not routinely recommended. Next would be uh, ACLS in patients with pulmonary embolism. Fulminant pulmonary embolism results in severe hemodynamic instability and in rare cases, arrest. It is a treatable cause of cardiac arrest. They present usually with pulses electric activity. Um, if you have this suspicion and uh, focus a, a point of care uh, ultrasound looking at severe RV dilatation, some ECG changes, perhaps a new onset right ventricular heart strained, tall RAs in V1, which was not seen previously, though the most common uh, ECG features of pulmonary embolism is sinus tachycardia, uh, systemic thrombolysis or surgical or percutaneous mechanical embolectomy would be the treatment of choice. The choice of this treatment um, is dependent on the expertise and the availability of such facilities in your center. But if cardiac arrest where fulminant PE is suspected, the evidence suggests that if or rather if the evidence suggests that uh, major bleeding risk is not any higher, uh, empirical thrombolysis may be considered. What about ACLS in pregnancy? It is known that the outcome for both mother and fetus is best if they undergo successful maternal resuscitation. And the common causes of cardiac arrest in pregnancy includes severe hemorrhage, eclampsia, amniotic fluid embolism, heart failure, sepsis, aspiration pneumonia, and pulmonary embolism. They should undergo standard BCLS and ACLS. With some caveats, and let me share with you some of the special considerations in patients who are pregnant. An advanced airway is usually required uh, because they have reduced uh, maternal functional respiratory reserves and the fetus is more susceptible to hypoxia. So advanced airway and ETT is usually uh, required and there might be some anatomical changes making it a challenging or difficult process. When the fundal height reaches the height of when the, when the uterus reaches the height of the level of uh, umbilicus, a, a continuous left lateral uterine displacement during resuscitation to avoid decreased venous return from the aortocable compression would be useful. They, um, ECMO or targeted temperature management may be given or instituted as indicated. We do not recommend um, routine fetal monitoring because it impedes the delivery of adequate and efficient or efficacious CPR in resuscitation. And perimortem CCRM delivery may be considered in the second half of pregnancy. It was reported that some has returned of spontaneous circulation. And for those 
who have uh, who are far down in the survival chain, it may improve neonatal survival. And the updates of ACLS is never complete without a short mention on the approaches to com common arrhythmias that we see in patients. Um, narrow complex tachycardia. 20 year old lady, normal heart comes in with a narrow complex tachycardia. The BP is about 95 over 62. It is narrow complex, heart rate is more than 100 beats per minute. QRS is narrow. Uh, we mentioned we look hard for the RP interval. In this case, it's more than 80 milliseconds. We look hard for the P waves and the arrow shows that are invert or positive P waves in the inferior leads. You know, you draw a line uh, to lead one looking for corresponding P waves elsewhere and there are negative P waves in lead one. Now, this is a SVT involving a left-sided S3 pathway. And the diagnosis of narrow complex tachycardia can be bin according to whether it's regular or irregular. In this case, it's an SVT. It could be AVNRT, AVRT, or atrial tachycardia, or as such. If it's irregular, it could be the other bin, or atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter with variable block or multifocal atrial tachycardia. And the key to approaching this patient is not different from the universal algorithm. In patients with hemodynamically stable tachycardia, uh, we move on to do an ECG. We move on to give IV adenosine or alternative AV nodal blockade agents such as dutazem and verapamil and um, unstable move on to synchronize cardioversion. You may try vaga maneuvers, uh, whether that would terminate the tachycardia. This is a patient who underwent IV adenosine administration. And you can see that the SVT terminates uh, to sinus rhythm and it shows slurred QRS onset, highlighting the diagnosis of WPW in patients uh, with SVT. White complex tachycardia, likewise, there are no, uh, there's no different approach them as with the universal algorithm. If they are unstable, move on to synchronized cardioversion. If you're stable, you may consider pharmacological cardioversion. Now, even if they're stable, um, there is a low threshold to sedate and provide synchronized cardioversion. What about bradycardia? Uh, same, in the same manner, uh, the first few parts of the universal algorithm host. If they're stable, we will then move on to uh, pharmacological intervention. In this case, you can see that there's complete heart block, more P's than QRS. Ventral rate is 40 beats per minute. A narrow QRS escape mechanism, complete heart block, and um, the astute ECG readers will, show, will realize that the P2P intervals are a little different. And this is a case of ventricular phasic uh, RI uh, variation in a young patient with complete heart block. And this is the algorithm uh, for patients with bradycardia. As mentioned, there's no difference in the first few steps in accordance with the universal algorithm. Atropin may be considered every three to five minutes up to a maximum of 2.4 milligram. So, feeling that uh, you may give IV dopamine or adrenaline infusion. Um, we may consider transcutaneous pacing with analgesia and sedation. Um, of course, a uh, referral to the cardiologist would be important where intravenous or a percutaneous temporary pacing may be considered. If there are no reversible causes, this patient would likely benefit from a pacemaker implantation. <clears throat> so ladies and gentlemen, we cannot uh, we must emphasize this change of survival. Every one of us plays a role and ACRLS uh, plays a role when we receive a victim who has undergone good quality or received good quality CPR, early defibrillation, uh, rapid evacuation to a medical emergency. With that, I want to acknowledge all my members uh, of the uh, ACLS subcommittee these are the uh, esteemed members who made this update possible. And thank you for your attention.
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Ching, for the updates. It's very insightful, and I'm sure you'll find it very useful for the clinicians. So uh, now, without further ado, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Chia Yu Woon, uh, my colleagues uh, from Tan Tok Seng Hospital. Dr. Chia is a senior consultant cardiologist intensivist, and he's also the director of cardiac ICU in Tan Tok Seng, and also the uh, chair of National Therapeutic Temperature Management Workgroup. So this morning, he's going to speak on beyond return of spontaneous circulations, update on post-cardiac arrest management in the ICU. Dr. Chia, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Sister Wee, for the kind introduction. So we have seen this chain of survival a few times this morning because of the good work done by the bystander, the paramedics, and the emergency physicians. We have an increase in number of survivors to hospital admission. So now I'll touch on post cardiac arrest care in the ICU after an hour of hospital cardiac arrest. So indeed, when we do CPR in a community and we do a PCR on thumper, getting return of spontaneous circulation is not the end point. The overarching aim that we want to have is for patients to return home to the company of their loved ones and to be as functionally independent as possible. To achieve that, we need to have an understanding of post cardiac arrest syndrome, what it entails, so the appropriate treatment can be targeted at the deranged pathophysiologist. So post cardiac arrest syndrome or PCAS encompasses four areas, brain injury, myocardial dysfunction, systemic ischemic reperfusion syndrome, and persistence of precipitating pathology like AMI. So this is an uh, illustration of how a PCAS patient is like in a usual day in a CICU. We can see that there's multi-system monitoring and multi-organ support. And it sounds a bit complicated. So building on the first national TTM workgroup recommendations in 2017 and referencing the 2020 alcohol and AHA guidelines and this year's ERC and ESIC recommendations, we came up with some updated recommendations in terms of the care of post cardiac arrest patient. And where there's no dedicated uh, studies on post cardiac arrest population, we reference the best practices and evidence that's applicable to all critically ill patients in the ICU. So for A or airway, we suggest using ETT with subglottic secretion drainage because it's high incidence of ventilator associated pneumonia after cardiac arrest. So essentially, there's an additional drainage tube above the cuff. They allow us to drain off the secretions that pull above the cuff, which might be contaminated. And when the cuff momentarily deflates the micro channels, which can result in VAP. So ETT, a subglottic secretion drainage, has been shown to reduce the risk of a ventilator associated pneumonia. For B, we are concerned with oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal. Hypoxemia should be avoided at all costs because it risks further cardiac arrest and secondary brain injury. On the other hand, hypoxemia should also be avoided because it results in oxidative stress and worsens neurological outcomes. So our recommendation is for a target saturation of 94 to 98%. We also suggest not to use too high a PIP because high intrathoracic pressure potentially could reduce cerebral venous return increasing cerebral blood volume and risk intracranial pressure. In terms of carbon dioxide, we suggest to avoid hypocapnia at all costs, whilst hypocapnia results in cerebral vasoconstriction, reduction in cerebral blood flow, and causes cerebral ischemia. On the other hand, there are some uh, data that shows that amount hypocapnia may increase cerebral blood flow for cerebral vasodilation, but it's always a risk of increasing intracranial pressure as well. So the same cardiac arrest trial that studying targeted therapeutic mild hypercapnia is currently ongoing. So our current suggestion is in for normal capnia for all patients, but for patients who have evidence of cerebral ischemia and there's no contraindication such as raised intracranial pressure, we could potentially consider mild hypercapnia as one of the treatment strategy. We also suggest having continuous anti-tidal CO2 monitoring, which is currently standard of care in most ICU, First, it allows us to detect any dyscarbia before our six-hourly arterial blood gas analysis results are out. In terms of ventilation strategies, we suggest to use the lung protective strategies as per all good ICU practices 
to reduce volume trauma and barrel trauma. There's also limited evidence to suggest that a continuous infusion of newer muscular blocking agents might reduce mortality. So that could also be considered as part of our treatment for patients after an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. In terms of treatment of the precipitating pathology, quite a significant proportion of patients without an obvious non-cardiac cause do have a significant lesion on coronary angiogram. So we suggest that any patient after ROS with ST elevation on ECG should go to the cath lab. And this is also in accordance to the ACC and AHA recommendations of both hypothermia treatment and early coronary angiogram. Similarly, ESC guidelines also suggest early cath and PCI and targeted temperature management for patients after an out-hospital cardiac arrest. In fact, ESC guidelines also suggest that a patient without ST elevation should also be considered for early coronary angiogram. So there are data that early care is useful for patients with no ST elevation, although the COET trial shown that delayed coronary angiography is not inferior to immediate coronary angiography. But do note that the COET trial have excluded patients in cardiogenic shock or electrical instability like recurrent VF. And therefore, we suggest that if there's no ST elevation on ECG, to consider CAF, especially if there's hemodynamic instability or electrical instability, unless there's a lot of uh, pro-pronostic factors, for example, very elderly patient, unwitnessed at rest, prolonged no flow time, first rhythm being asystole, or has got advanced end organ uh, injury, then such patients, uh, we may want to go to ICU first, before going to angiogram later on based on neurological recovery. In terms of hemodynamic monitoring, we mentioned earlier on that there's post-cardiac arrest, myocardial dysfunction. Perfusion of organs are important. We often focus on pressure targeted resuscitation using mean arterial pressure in the ICU. But because the heart did stop and we could expect a low cardiac output and low flow states, it's equally important to have flow monitoring. So we suggest that all patients after cardiac arrest and ICU should have an arterial line for continuous pressure monitoring and also continuous flow monitoring. In terms of hemodynamic support, patient's blood pressure could be low and because of the systemic ischemic reperfusion syndrome that naming a sepsis-like type of phenotype, there could be vasodilation and because of the myocardial dysfunction, it's expected to have a low cardiac output. So patients likely have a mixed muscle dilatory and cardiogenic shock. So we suggest to use norepinephrine as a first line to achieve your MAP target and also because it's less erythromogenic. However, if up titration of norepinephrine result in a drop in cardiac output, we could consider adding on a low dose of an inotrope such as dobutamine or murinone. In terms of MAP target, we suggest that optimal MAP target should be individualized. So consider baseline blood pressure. If patient is chronically hypertensive on three agents, then likely patient will require higher mean arterial pressure for organ perfusion. Consider any evidence of risk intracranial pressure. If ICP is elevated, then likely will require higher mean arterial pressure to preserve our cerebral perfusion pressure or any evidence of ongoing end organ hyperperfusion like AKI, which will again warrant higher mean arterial pressure targets. So it's important to recall in post-cardiac arrest syndrome, cerebral autoregulation is impaired and cerebral blood flow will vary directly with cerebral perfusion pressure, which depends on MAP and ICP. So for example, usually when there's a drop in pressure, the cerebral blood flow could still be well-maintained, but in patients in PCAS, it's going to be uh, not so much, when there's a drop in pressure, there'll be a drop in cerebral blood flow almost linearly. So it's very important for us to maintain our mean arterial pressure. So how do we estimate ICP in patients? We call it a CT brain if it's performed, or we suggest the use of ultrasound of thickness shift diameter, which can be done easily at the bedside in ICU and repeated as our treatment changes. So for example, an ultrasound of thickness shift diameter of more than 5 mm does suggest an intracranial pressure more than 20, and they will warrant a higher mean arterial pressure of 80 to 85 millimeters mercury. In terms of sedation, we suggest that all patients after cardiac arrest should be sedated as it reduces cerebral oxygen consumption and also reduces shivering during induced hypothermia. But to note that metabolism of sedatives and neuromuscular blocking agents are reduced with hypothermia treatment 
and therefore we suggest using short acting drugs which allow uh, earlier and more reliable neurological assessment for example using remifentanil and propofol rather than using benzodiazepines next the most common reason for mortality after initial resuscitated cardiac arrest is actually because of active withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy by the physicians because of perceived poor neurological recovery. And therefore, it made a lot of sense to have a closer neural monitoring in the post-cardiac arrest population. So we suggest a consideration of using cerebral oximetry monitoring. It's non-invasive, it's based on a validated uh, technique of near-infrared spectroscopy. So for example, for this patient, we can clearly see that there's a drop in the cerebral oxygenation, which could be attributed to either a reduction in cerebral blood flow or increase in terms of cerebral metabolism from hyperparaxia or from ongoing seizures. Similarly, we suggest that all patients should have continuous EEG monitoring because of high incidence of seizures after return of spontaneous circulation. And EEG should always be considered when patients are put on newer muscular blocking agents. So for example, the patient on the left, we can see clearly that there's epilepsy form discharges and the patient on the right is isoelectric EEG suggesting poor neural prognosis. And seizures increases CMRO2 and therefore should be aggressively corrected and treated. And we suggest to use Larry Deracetan or sodium valproate because they are less cardiotoxic. Temperature control is one of the important strategy in terms of improving not just neurological outcomes, but overall outcomes of patients after cardiac arrest. There's a lot of biological basis on how it works and also in animal studies. Also in human adults, there's also evidence to show that hypothermia treatment improves the number of survivors with good neurological outcomes compared to normal thermia. This is the initial studies in 2002. After these two studies were published in 2002, there were more and more centers using TTM as part of the bundle of care after cardiac arrest. And TTM also made itself into international guidelines of aim for hypothermia treatment. However, we are familiar with this TTM paper in 2013 that basically compared TTM at hypothermia and TTM at normal thermia. As shown that TTM at normal thermia appears not inferior to hypothermia. However, I think it's important to draw a bit more whether, whether we actually it's suitable for local population. You can see that the bystander CPR rate in TTM trials was 73%, and CPR was initiated within one minute of cardiac arrest. And furthermore, about 25 minutes of downtime in total, so patients don't have a prolonged downtime. And furthermore, it takes quite a number of hours for them from randomization to reaching target temperature. So all these could have well attenuated any beneficial effects of hypothermia treatment. Nonetheless, there were some centers which decided to change their targets from 33 degrees Celsius to 36 degrees Celsius for the thinking that's easier to maintain patient normal thermia. This before and after study in the Alfred Hospital in Australia clearly illustrated that when the target temperature was 33 degrees Celsius initially, it was possible to maintain patient at 33 degrees Celsius about 90% of the time. But when the tidal temperature was changed to 36 degrees Celsius or normal thermia, they only achieved and maintained normal thermia 50% of the time. So it's not necessarily easier to maintain patient in normal thermia despite what people believe. In fact, in a recent published TTM2 trial, we can see from the supplementary materials that Patients randomized to the TTM abnormal thermia arm in the TTM2 trial had twice the incidence of fever compared to patients randomized to the TTM at the hypothermia arm in the TTM2 trial. And in fact, up to 46% of patients in the normal thermia arm in the TTM2 trial require intravascular or surface cooling just to reach normal thermia and maintain normal thermia range. Therefore, normal thermia is not something that is very easy to maintain, and we also need to use some device to reach our target and maintain at the target temperature. So this uh, recent TTM2 trial published again, it shows that normal thermia might not be inferior to hypothermia. However, again, looking into the numbers, 80% of patients in the TTM2 trial have bystander CPR. And there's also concern that it took about two hours plus from cardiac arrest to randomization in the TTM2 trial. Even after randomization, it took another six hours to reach target temperature. 
So all this potentially could attenuate any beneficial effects of hypothermia in post-cardiac arrest patients. Because we know from animal studies that brain injury occurs minutes after return of spontaneous circulation. And if we are only going to reach our target temperature of hypothermia after six hours, then potentially we are not going to achieve the full effect of hypothermia treatment in our patients. So our suggestion is choose a temperature target between 33 to 36, achieve that ASAP and maintain consistently and aim 33 if possible. There's also data for using a hypothermia treatment in patients with non sugar rhythm in a hyperbrain trial. It's shown that it increases the number of survivors with a good neurological recovery. And that's not unexpected, but the brain doesn't care how the heart stops. HIE occurs regardless, is it going to VF, VT, PEA, or asystole? We also made some recommendations with regards to the cooling devices. We can see there's a water circling uh, blankets. There's also a gel adhesive uh, blankets and also intravascular cooling device. We can see from data that endovascular cooling allow us to achieve target temperature faster with minimal fluctuations because of better precision. And data comparing intravascular cooling catheters with a water circulating blankets showing that using an intravascular cooling device could potentially increase the number of survival with good neurological outcomes. How long to cool has also been an area of controversy. In terms of the TTM48 trial, it's shown that cooling patients for 48 hours might have a numerical advantage over 24 hours, although it did not reach the statistical significance. However, if you look clearly at the demographics of patients, again, more than 80% of patients in a TTM48 trial have bystander CPR, started within one minute of cardiac arrest, and they are down times only 20 minutes which means that a patient who has got more prolonged low flow and low flow time may actually benefit from a more prolonged cooling. So we suggest to cool for at least 24 hours, but for patients with longer no flow or low flow time or raise intracranial pressure, to consider longer duration of cooling. We suggest to rewind patient very gradually because any form of rebound hyperparaxia will worsen mortality outcomes. In terms of electrolytes and fluids in E and F, we suggest avoid hyponitremia, which may worsen cerebral edema, and to tolerate hypokalemia because of a fear of rebound hyperkalemia during rewarming. And eject electrolytes at least as hourly while on hypothermia therapy. Avoid hypotonic solutions for the same reason as avoiding hyponitremia and consider balanced crystal locks like spasma A or ringless lactate solution. For G, gastrointestinal and glucose. Early and during feeding should be started as per all good ICU practices, but maybe starting at a trophic rate first because there's going to be gastroparesis and prolonged instantaneous transit timing over here. And if we do use some form of prokinetic agent for the high GRV, just be careful that if we are starting erythromycin and patient is on hypothermia arm, we need to look at the QT uh, interval prolongation because of indirection. G also for good close. Glucose is very important in post-cardiac arrest patients, because both high and low blood glucose worsens neurological outcomes, and high glucose variability also causes more harm and poor neurological recovery. So we suggest a target blood glucose level 6 to 10 minimums per liter, and we suggest to consider using IV insulin rather than subcut insulin. But subcut absorption is directed in patients who are on hypothermia treatment. In fact, in most critically ill patients in shock, subcutaneous absorption will be unpredictable. So IV insulin is a preferred choice. H for hematology, we suggest that hypothermia causes mild coagulopathy, but no clinically significant bleeding. And that's true. In all the randomized controlled trial comparing hypothermia versus normal thermia, there's no evidence to suggest that hypothermia causes any major bleeding compared to normal thermia. However, because of the mild coagulopathy, we're suggesting using pneumatic cuff compressors rather than inoxiparin for DBT prophylaxis. I for infectious diseases. Immune paralysis does occur in hypothermia treatment and therefore higher incidence of respiratory infection. And that's why we suggested using uh, ETT or subclotic secretion drainage. There's, however, is no current recommendations for routine prophylactic antibiotics. But patients will not mount a fewer response while they're having ongoing active TTM. We suggest to use procalcitonin and other markers of infection and all the good ICU bundles of care to reduce catheter-related bloodstream infections. 
Lastly, for neural prognostication, we suggest using delayed multi-model strategy. Don't just rely on one technique alone to decide on withdrawal or life-sustaining therapy. And remembering clearance of sedative drugs and neural muscular blocking agents are delayed by cooling. And therefore, neural prognostication should be delayed up to 72 hours after rewarming has been completed. So this is a summary of our uh, uh, new recommendations for the A to I format for easy uh, way to remember. And if I may, uh, let's just say that uh, care for PCAS patients requires a multi-organ approach to improve neurological index survival. Quality of post-resuscitation care influences final outcomes and need to be systematic in the management of the post-cardiac arrest syndrome. And lastly, if a cardiac arrest patient is fortunate enough to be successfully resuscitated, he or she deserves the best chance for a good long-term recovery. And thank you very much for attention. Uh, thanks, Yu Wen. Uh, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, post cardiac arrest care, uh, when I was a junior doctor, used to be so under recognized, under emphasized, uh, and then it has become very, very specialized. But you have made it as easy as ABC. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker. Um, or before that, we want to uh, invite again all participants to keep your uh, questions coming in the Q&A chat group. Uh, although we may have answered some of them, but we can revisit them during the Q&A session later on. Okay, with that, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Lim Chia Hao. Uh, he is a consultant emergency physician uh, from the Department of Emergency Medicine of uh, Singapore General Hospital. He is a co-director of the critical of critical care at his department, uh, and he also has an interest in uh, medical education. So he'll be sharing with us on uh, extracorporeal life support in out of in adult out of hospital cardiac arrest. Okay, over to you, Dr. Lim. Can you all hear me? Uh, yes, very good. Yes. Oh, okay, good. All right. Hi. All right. Uh, so uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so my name is Yao Hao. I'm from the Department of Emergency Medicine at SGH. Um, first, I'll begin by saying ECLS and adult OHCA, adult out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, is actually outside of the um, purview of our local guidelines that we're presenting today. Um, but I think a lot of us working in the pre-hospital scene in emergency medicine uh, in critical care are cognizant of the enthusiasm surrounding this particular topic due to how ECLS has seen increasing use in certain overseas healthcare systems and how, um, how there is a signal. I, I think the best thing for me to say is there's a signal that it might uh, result in better neurological or long-term outcomes. And this will be a good time and platform to talk about it. So I'm very uh, grateful. Hao, yep. uh, you might want to turn on to the uh, slideshow view instead. Slideshow view instead. Uh, you are in presenter view. All right. Okay. Give me a second. Um, hold on. Huh? Give me a second. This view? There we go. Okay. Oh, but my notes. Oh dear. <laughs> okay. Anyways. Give me a second. All right. So, um, so today our background really, I'm going to begin with that talking about the background of ECMO. Um, uh, touch a little bit on VA ECMO itself. Uh, then we'll start talking, exploring some selected uh, articles of ECMO CPR in adult out hospital cardiac arrest. Um, I'll talk about patient selection um, and some complications and challenges as well as the final conclusion. All right, so give me a second. All right, so our hospital cardiac arrest is traditionally associated with poor survival rates around the world. Are we talking about, I think locally in Singapore, we first began around when we started looking at the data, um, we were talking about very low survival rates, like 2.5% survival. But uh, uh, thanks to the efforts of UPAC, um, the pre-hospital groups uh, with public education, with uh, um, increase in number of uh, AEDs in the community, um, with dispatch assisted CPR, I think we've all seen increasing um, uh, survival rates. I'm so sorry, give me a second, can I just, so that means if I go to presenter view, you guys will just will be able to see my notes, is it? Because I'm dependent on the time to, Keep me on track. Uh, yeah, we can see your notes this way. Oh, okay. Anyways, okay. 
then I'll just go back to to the main to the main slides then. Sorry. Okay. So so standard treatment options for uh, refractory cardiac arrest will be things like high quality CPR, early defibrillation, standard uh, dosing of adrenaline, as well as um, antiarrhythmics to facilitate the cardioversion rates of uh, shockable rhythms. Um, however, there's a small subset of our hospital cardiac arrest patients who unfortunately um, do not respond to standard treatment options. And there's been increasing interest in looking at extracorporeal uh, support to bridge these patients to, to definitive therapies that might improve survival. So refractory cardiac arrest, uh, in patients with refractory cardiac arrest, these patients are associated with poor outcomes mainly because there's a prolonged hypoxic time, they're associated with severe metabolic acidosis and electrolyte disturbances. Um, uh, Chia Hao, your slides are gone yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh no, uh, give me a second. But it's great listening to you. La. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you see it? Okay. Very good. Uh, yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, technical issues. Okay. Anyways, so what is ECMO? ECMO is a extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, right? There, I, there are two configurations, or rather, I think I should be more specific. There are two configurations for peripheral ECMO. There's central ECMO, but that's outside the purview of the discussion today. So there's veno venous ECMO and there's veno arterial ECMO. When we talk about ECMO CPR or ECLs in adults uh, for out hospital cardiac arrest, we are really just talking about VA ECMO. So ECMO is the procedure where we insert, right, where we insert uh, cannulas into the patient's central vascular systems, and then blood is drawn out from these ECMO cannulas from the venous system. Typically, uh, the ECMO cannula is set into the femoral vein, um, drawn out into uh, the extracorporeal circuit via the centrifugal pump. And all this deoxygenated blood is pumped into the oxygenator, the membrane oxygenator, where this deoxygenated blood is reoxygenated and CO2 is removed. And this reoxygenated blood is pumped back into the body. If it's pumped back into the body into a venous system, this is veno venous ECMO. Um, and if it's pumped back into uh, the arterial system, right, into the proximal aorta, really, uh, via the femoral vein then this is venal arterial ECMO. And of course, when we're doing it, when we're doing a venal arterial ECMO configuration, we are, we are pumping back using higher flows. And this is to basically achieve uh, organ perfusion. So venal venous ECMO is really just to bypass the lungs and provide patients with just oxygenation and CO2 removal in patients with pulmonary failure. And in patients with uh, cardiogenic failure, really, um, venal arterial will be the modality of choice, right? Um, it, is a, it acts simply as a bridge to therapy or myocardial recovery or transplant, right? So that's a very simplified diagram. This is just some images of how messy you can get. You can see this. Uh, are you able to see my arrow? Um, give me a second. Let me see whether I can show pointer options. Right. Um, you can see the darker deoxygenated blood running into the membrane oxygenator and coming out as the brighter blood. And that's the, that is the tubing that's connected to the arterial cannulas that provides the, the forward perfusion to the patient. Right? So the main aim of VA ECMO is to provide uh, end organ perfusion in patients where they have refractory shock, um, where you can provide perfusion to the coronaries, you can provide perfusions to the vital organs. Um, yeah, so these are just broad indications for ECMO. So really, again, I'm talking about VA ECMO where generally we see it's used in decompensated cardiomyopathies, cardiogenic shock, myocarditis, massive pulmonary embolism, uh, post-cardiac surgery, heart transplants, or bridge to transplant, uh, cardio, severe cardiotoxic, uh, cardiotoxic drug overdoses, and pertaining to today's talk, cardiac arrest, right, eCPR. Uh, and VV ECMO will have these, control indica uh, these, these indications. E Ec VB ECMO, ECMO itself started, uh, was first described, uh, uh, saw, saw large scale use in the neonate and pediatric population in 1972. And uh, it was from there where its use, uh, where I think the understanding and the technology developed and gradually saw its use translated into adults. Right, so what is ECMO CPR? Number one, uh, this is just an image of uh, ECMO CPR done in the field, in a pre-hospital team. I'm sure some, a lot of you who have attended uh, um, 
overseas conferences pertaining to ECMO, uh, where, where ECLS and ECMO CPRs talked about has seen the very famous picture of ECMO being performed in the Louvre, uh, the museum in Paris. Um, uh, here's another picture of a Parisian team doing pre-hospital ECMO in the field. As you can see, a lot of stuff is involved. Um, it's a complex intervention and it basically involves a uh, rescuer team, right? So typically uh, in our local setting, we are talking about emergency physicians. So we are talking about, um, about of course, in overseas, you can, the re rescuer teams can be EMS as well. Uh, or in the in-hospital setting, you have ICU teams or operating theater teams, right? Doing standard resuscitation while at the same time, ECMO implantation teams uh, uh, are cannulating the patient in the hopes of uh, getting this patient on a, uh, ECMO, ECMO circuit, where if they turn it on and start running flows back into the proximal aorta, you will achieve some form of perfusion. Obviously, this is not curative. Your whole point is you can achieve some form of perfusion to bridge the patient to something else, whatever you're hoping to, uh, to treat, whatever you're hoping to address. So typically, we're talking about myocardial infarction here, but you can bridge these patients to uh, the cath lab. You can bridge these patients to therapeutic hypothermia. Um, and other advanced interventions can bridge these patients with interventional radiology to get an you know, to me for the massive pulmonary embolus and so on and so forth. Right. However, of course, uh, I think you know, I'll start to appreciate uh, it is very reliant on the quality of teamwork, it's time sensitive, uh, the resources uh, required to drive any kind of an ECMO program is tremendous, right? And training is important because I think your success of ECMO program, some, it boils down to the end, uh, to the expertise of the cannulation because if you're unsuccessful cannulations time and time again, obviously the outcomes are not gonna be very good. General contraindications to ECMO would be DNR orders, traumatic cardiac arrest, uncontrolled bleeding, terminal conditions, severe brain injury, chronic and organ dysfunction, uh, dissections, or take valve incompetencies. In terms of age, um, uh, Based, uh, there can be differing local guidelines on the age cutoff. Uh, generally, it can range from as uh, low as 65, uh, 65 years to 80 years. So ECMO has seen increasing use around the world. So ELSO is basically the unifying world body that, um, that uh, uh, sets guidelines and maintains, and more importantly, really maintains a registry of ECMO patients uh, from the reported by major ECMO centers around the world. You can see since uh, for the past decade, you've seen a very tremendous, significant rise in the number of ECMO centers and ECMO runs around the world. I mean, part, 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 part of this is probably driven by the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, which saw the uh, increasing use of VB ECMO for the treatment of ARDS, thanks to the CESAR trial, as well as the Australian New Zealand H1N1 trial. Um, but from there, as with increasing uh, familiarity and expertise with ECMO use around in ICUs around the world, as a consequence of that, we've seen uh, increasing interest in uh, extracorporeal support as a means to address um, uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest, or rather, to address cardiac arrest. Um, and from there, the question whether there's any use in out of hospital cardi cardiac arrest arose. Um, so, uh, ECPR. Um, so base, this, this is based on the 27th, April 2021, uh, latest uh, annual reports from the ELSO, um, uh, where I think they're reporting up to 29% survival to discharge or transfer uh, for patients who receive ECPR. I will have to point out though, the majority of these patients is, uh, this data is heavily skewed by the positive outcomes of in-hospital cardiac arrest. In-hospital cardiac arrest obviously will have better outcomes because there's, uh, there's a shorter time to receiving CPR or recognition of cardiac arrest. Presumably the CPR that's delivered by in-hospital teams are better quality than untrained providers out there in the field. And of course the proximity of uh, cardiac arrest victims to in-hospital uh, in hospital therapies such as cath labs or interventional radiology and so on, um, and ICUs is a lot closer, right? Um, so what we are interested in is basically whether this has any role in out hospital cardiac arrest. Now, um, I should mention that a lot of this in interest in out hospital cardiac arrest has also been driven by uh, a large number of. Um, case reports, case series, which all boast very, very positive survival rates. Um, 
as high as anything ranging from upwards of 20 to 40 something percent survival in patients who receive eCPR for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. However, I should point out that a lot of these studies are very small studies. The number of study participants are very small. There's probably some degree of reporting biases in these sort of um, case series studies. So therefore, I think what we're all interested in is basically whether there's any good quality, high quality data out there in the world they can guide healthcare systems to determine whether ECLS should be incorporated into their local guidelines, whether ECLS is useful as an additional link of survival to perhaps bridge these patients to um, uh, post cardiac arrest care. Um, so, uh, so I'm just going just presenting a few select articles. Um, uh, this is uh, Sakamoto from the Save J study group of, um, from Japan, published in 2014, was possibly still to date the cleaner set of prospective observational data. Um, the, it's been challenging getting randomized controlled data for, um, for ECLS in our hospital cardiac arrest. Um, and it's only been in the past year where we've started seeing RCTs coming out. Right, so this uh, Sakamoto probably published the cleaner set uh, where 26 hospitals, 46, a total of 46 hospitals were involved in a study from various regions around Japan where 26 CPR capable hospitals, eCPR capable hospitals were tasked to provide eCPR in selected patients um, that fit the study criteria and the patient and the hospitals that do not have eCPR, the non-ECMO centers will just do standard care and they followed these uh, patients prospectively, right? So I think a total of 454 patients were enrolled. Um, as you can see, the inclusion criteria for this study was basically shockable rhythms, cardiac arrest and arrival with a, without a pre-hospital RSC within 45 minutes from reception of emergency call. Um, so the primary endpoints being favorable neurological outcomes at six months. And basically the SafeJ study group uh, found that um, the favorable uh, favorable outcomes were in 11.2% um, in this eCPR group versus 2.6%. Interestingly as well, um, and I think I'm using this as an example to show why ECMO might be useful as a bridge to post cardiac arrest care, is that more than 90% of the patients who receive eCPR receive therapeutic hypothermia, as well as other interventions such as IBP, they have higher uh, PCI rates, um, as compared to the standard CPR group, where I think only like 50% receive therapeutic hypothermia and 60% receive like IABP interventions. Um, this is not so much because of a departure from study protocol. It's probably just due to the fact that uh, ECMO probably allows for a, a hemodynamic support that allows patients to tolerate such interventions. Whereas in standard CPR groups uh, where patients who are in refractory shock, they're not responding to vasopressors, obviously they'll be considered too unstable to commence things like therapeutic hypothermia or transfer or deemed too unstable to transfer to the interventional labs to receive subsequent care. So, um, however, I mean, that's, so to date, I think that's still probably one of the larger observational studies. I'll, pre I'll present another one later on, but um, uh, however, I think what we're more interested in is really what the guidelines are, what the recommendations are from ILCOR. So ILCOR, uh, so Holmberg et al, uh, did a systematic review for um, on behalf of ILCO. And basically the recommendations are eCPR may be considered as rescue therapy for selected patients with cardiac arrest. I will point out that they're not staying out of hospital cardiac arrest, just selected patients with cardiac arrest where conventional CPR is failing in settings in which it can be, where, in which it can be implemented. And it's considered a weak recommendation. And, uh, and uh, this is uh, just a selection. I'm just going to um, flash uh, the, select, the studies that they selected for the purpose of this systematic review. We can see it's a mix of both out-hospital cardiac arrest as well as in-hospital cardiac arrest patients with varying age groups that range from the adult range of 18 to 75 to the pediatric groups as well. All right, um, just flashing through. I'm pointing all this out is because um, the problem is all of these studies are still observational studies or small case series, and there's a it's and basically the risk of bias was deemed critical for all studies, confounding being the primary source. Um, there was significant heterogeneity between the studies. None of these said um, most systematic reviews that looked at ECMO CPR all deemed studies too heterogeneous to perform meta analyses in. Uh, several studies reported unadjusted results, and of the 15 studies that reported out of hospital cardiac arrest patients. 
um, 12 of them reported positive outcomes in terms of survival to discharge, but only six reported positive outcomes in terms of long-term survival or favorable neurological outcomes. Right, so, so, so from, this, from this systematic review, I think the ILCOR um, pertaining to our hospital cardiac arrest it has to be a little bit more conservative in uh, saying that it can only be considered in specific settings because that's for out of hospital cardiac arrest. For the in-hospital cardiac arrest groups or the pediatric groups, ECMO CPR does um, show some benefit to favorable neurological outcomes in keeping with the ELSO registry reports. Um, and then this one is also uh, now, and as of 2020, this is probably the largest uh, um, data registry that reports on prospective uh, uh, data, uh, prospective observational uh, study that talks about extracorporeal pulmonary resuscitation in uh, our hospital cardiac arrest from Paris. So in Paris, this Parisian group by Wokwan et al. Uh, unfortunately reports that uh, there's no significance in terms of uh, survival in patients who receive extracorporeal CPR versus conventional CPR, 8.4% versus 8.6%. Now, of course, this was a little bit of a bummer for a lot of the enthusiasts uh, uh, expounding the, 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 the value of ECLS. Um, however, I mean, I, I, should, I should point out that uh, um, Unfortunately, it's in my notes, but I think th there are limitations to this study. I think there's a lot of physician-led, there's, 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 there's no clear protocol. This is, um, this, the, this, uh, the, the majority of ECMO patients, are, the ECMO here in Paris is delivered by pre-hospital. It's either pre-hospital ECMO or done in the emergency department. Um, uh, it's, there's a lot of physician-led decision-making here. Um, not guided necessarily by protocols. And as you can see, when that happens, you can probably see why it's probably not resulting in the outcomes that we're hoping to see with ECMO CPR. Um, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but suffice it to say for the ECMO CPR group, the only group that probably shows significantly better outcomes, subgroup analyses, in terms of subgroup analyses, are only those patients who receive ECMO CPR with shockable rhythms and transient or no, uh, no RSC during the cardiac arrest. In all other subgroups, um, eCPR is associated with poorer outcomes. So I'm just using this slide as the means to show number one, although the, the real world data from Paris shows there's no significant benefit, it also highlights the need that patient selection uh, is very important for making sure that your ECMO intervention arrive, is delivered to the correct subset of patients uh, that will see this, that will achieve this benefit. Because otherwise, if you do it in the wrong group of patients, patients who achieve ROSC anyway, so it's arguable that perhaps this group of patients did not re require ECMO, were placed on ECMO anyway, and, and was subject to the complications um, of ECMO, which might have negatively affected their positive outcomes. Okay, uh, Jiao, I yep. need to ask you to speed up a little bit. Uh, okay. Because we're a little bit behind on time. All right. Okay. No problem. So um, this is my last study, and I'm just I'll just blaze through the rest, right? So so to answer a lot of the the questions at hand, I think the arrest study was the latest study just came out um, from Minnesota. Suffice it to say, I'm just going to run briefly. Thirty patients in all. Uh, 15 in the ECMO CPR group versus 15 in a non-CPR group, one withdrew consensual, 14 versus 15, of which there were six survivors at six months and zero survivors in CCPR um, in a conventional CPR group. And the study was discontinued due to ethical concerns about the overwhelming efficacy demonstrated in the eCPR group. Um, so this is a, obviously a very um, heartening sort of a study demonstrating the effects of uh, the potentiality of uh, ECMO in providing uh, in demonstrating improved neurological outcomes as shown in this slide as well, where I think most of the patients, most of the survivors go on to have excellent CPC scores by six months. Um, however, of course, the question is whether these results are very generalizable because this is a very highly, uh, this particular study was conducted in a system that was highly adapted for ECMO, where you have mobile ECMO teams, the central dispatch is a physician-led dispatch uh, where, uh, ECMO criteria, where ec the decision to place these patients up for ECMO was made in a pre-hospital setting. A lot of these patients are, set, are randomized to ECMO CPR 
typically just bypass the emergency department altogether and go to the cath labs to receive their ECMO. So the expertise of vascular, uh, sorry, expertise of uh, interventional cardiologists in being able to uh, achieve vascular access in the sickest of patients probably also contributed to um, some degree of success uh, to the ECMO CPR results in this particular study, right? So there are more ex randomized control studies coming out. So I, I will remain, to, I think it's still, uh, there's a, so there's a little bit of exciting time for us to see how, um, how ECMO CPR, um, whether we can answer this question about ECMO CPR and uh, outcomes in terms of neurological uh, and, its, and its impact on neurological outcomes. In terms of patient selection, there's no clear consensus, but I'll just go down to the fact that I'll just point out the important bit where I think the interim guidelines, uh, interim consensus-based guidelines from ELSO recommends that ideally ECMO implantation should occur within 60 minutes. Um, so time is of the essence. Uh, and, and so therefore, knowing how different healthcare systems have different infrastructures, different pre-hospital systems, uh, the ability for people to activate uh, the, the sequence, uh, the ability of, uh, of, of healthcare systems to ECMO, ECMO teams, uh, to activate ECMO teams or to implant ECMOs will be very different. Right, so, com so these are some of the common inclusion criteria for eCPR and uh, all hospital cardiac arrest studies. Right, so complications of ECMO. Are, so I, I, I can't, I think it'll be irresponsible if I make ECMO sound so great. I think it's, it should be understood that ECMO is a very highly resource intensive uh, modal, uh, treatment modality. Uh, a lot of the ECMO runs take a uh, take up quite a fair bit of time in the ICU. And of course, in a setting of a current pandemic, there are ethical concerns about whether it's appropriate um, in uh, utility, utilization of ICU resources. Bleeding is the commonest complication. You can see the rest of the complications here in this chart. Failure of cannulation, sepsis, but also ECMO is associated with high incidences of neurological complications that's uh, independent of the neurological complications associated with the primary cause of cardiac arrest in the first place. So on top of the usual poor neurological outcomes associated with cardiac arrest due to you know, cerebral hypoperfusion and the subsequent cerebral reperfusion, hyperemia as well as cerebral edema. ECMO itself can also be associated with uh, uh, neurological complications due to the fact that you can have um, um, thrombotic, thromboembolism complications in the circuit you, um, due to the fact that the patient's blood is exposed to an extracorporeal circuit. So there's this pro-inflammatory state that can basically result in uh, endothelial injury uh, and disruption to the microcirculation of the brain. The fact that uh, ECMO flow is non-pulsatile, there's loss of cerebral autoregulation, and, and therefore these patients are particularly susceptible to any kind of systemic hypoperfusion. Um, the brain death rate in ECMO patients is actually higher compared to patients uh, under CCPR. So... Uh Oh, very yeah. good. Last slide. Yeah, last slide. So, suffice it to say, uh, for ECLS and our hospital cardiac arrest, the data is not definitive, but it is compelling with a positive signal seen. Um, there is a strong and sound physiological basis for ECPR, and the current evidence base supports its ongoing development. Right, there's a certain aspirational component here where you just want to do better by your, by your patients. And um, healthcare systems might need to look into that to see what they can do to develop this and from, from there develop more studies and, uh, 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 and collaborations. Patient, however, again, patient selection is crucial to outcome determination. This uh, ECMO is not a one-size-fits-all therapy. It is very important that you need to do it for a very select patient. And we're talking about basically refractory shockable rhythms, which forms a very, very, very small subset of our out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients. ECMO CPR on its own is not enough. The quality of post-cardiac arrest care. So eCPR on, on its own, a lot of studies talk about eCPR, but I think we are, the tendency is people ignore the fact that these patients are bridged to post-cardiac arrest care. So what's important is really the quality of post-cardiac arrest care uh, built into the existing healthcare system. And from there, it's good quality, consistent and universal post-cardiac arrest care is delivered, perhaps we can explore then, perhaps that'll be more timely, um, that the more timely time to con uh, consider eCPR might be then, but we want to hope to deliver more patients to arrive at post-cardiac arrest care interventions. So ECMO bridges patients to care. It facilitates good decision-making, um, but will not, uh, it resuscitates the moribund, but it will not reanimate the dead. All right, um, so thank you very much for listening. That's it. I apologize for the technical difficulties at the beginning. I was uh, 
very dependent on notes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jia Hao, for your interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I, I only know about ECMO in the acute hospital setting. And only this morning, I learned so much from you that there's actually ECMO in the outpatient for cardiac arrest. So we'll look forward for more study to see how we can facilitate ECMO to bridge patient care in future. Uh, so our, our, our fourth and last speaker for this segment uh, is uh, Uma, our senior nurse educator from Tangkok Singh Hospital. Uh, Uma actually oversee and develop training competency for, for the nurses. And this morning, she's going to speak something that is very dear to her heart, beyond competency training for life support course for nurses. So Uma, over to you. Sure. Thank you, sister. Um, yeah, I'll share screen now. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, Uma, yes, you can. Okay. Yeah, go to slideshow. All right. Okay, um, thank you, Sister Lee. A very good afternoon to everybody. Um, it's lunchtime, so I've given 10 minutes to do my presentation. And um, yes, I'll start. My name is Uma, uh, Senior Nurse Educator from Tan Tok Seng Hospital, and also this um, co-author for this manuscript, Life Support Course for Nurses Beyond Competency and Training. Um, today's focus of the presentation will, um, is much on deep learning and reflective learning as a key learning methodology in LSCN. So instructors who um, have in-depth understanding of learners' learning styles and approaches to learning can improve learners' interest and maintain it and accommodate to various learning approaches. So in deep learning approach can achieve desirable learning outcomes with the aid of reflection as a strategy. Reflection capacities is required to promote informed, knowledgeable and safe practice. Reflection has been influenced by developing awareness of instructors to encourage their learners to become thoughtful individuals, being critical and innovative thinkers. So looking at the definition of learner's approach, it is defined as integrating both their processes and intention. So there are two um, type of approach, surface or deep learning approach. Surface learning approach occurs when learners foc focus on facts and particular details they believe were important. They remember isolated facts and do not explore their actual meaning. Such learners who adopt a surface learning approach are usually aware of fewer aspects of their learning situations. On the other hand, deep learning approach occurs when learners discover main facts and investigate how the fact relate to each other. The motivation associated with deep learning is to understand ideas and seek meaning. It is integrative, self-reflective, experiential, and self-assessing. It also develops a mastery of learning goal which emphasizes the importance of growth and learning as a process. It is also related to effort and persistence with challenging tasks. The difference between the learning success between deep and surface learning is that content learned through deep learning will last longer as compared to surface learning approach. Deep learning approach also reaches deep level of understanding whereas surface approach leads to surface level of understanding. So during the LSCN courses, our instructors should discourage surface learning and encourage deep learning where learners seek meaning via scientific rationales and clinical reasoning and be able to relate what they are learning in one area to another and to avoid root learning, which is not aimed at understanding. Reflection is a very key, uh, important approach to enhance deep learning. So reflection is a complex and deliberate process of thinking about the interpreting experience in order to learn from it. There are two types. One, reflection in action and reflection on action. Reflection in action process whereby the practitioner recognizes a new situation and thinks it out while still acting. 
it is believed that it's possible to improve an individual's ability to reflect in action. On the other hand, reflection on action is a retrospective contemplation of practice taken to uncover the sites used in a particular situation. The reflective pr practitioner may speculate how the situation might have been handled differently and what other knowledge, skills, and attitudes would have been helpful. Altogether, four steps in reflection. It's a guide. So uh, step number one, um, learners have to identify an event and ask what had happened. Then they should analyze and interpret. At this juncture, questions should be asked by them. Why did things happen this way? Why did I act the way I did? How did the content affect the experience? And how did past experiences affect the way I reacted? When they do such reflection, they will then move on to the third stage to ask what they have learned from the incident, how they can improve, which is very important, how it might change their future thinking. Finally, they have to consider the implication for their actions by querying what are the take home messages and is a likelihood of productive interaction and learning. It's very important because critical incident te uh, technique has been influential in promoting reflective practice. Behavior deemed to have either particular benefit or particular unbeneficial in sit uh, each situation. Learners are encouraged to learn uh, to record their description of events and their responses to these events. Recording down that has occurred if they might have acted differently to the situation and or theory and research that might support that situation. Journaling can be uh, the learner, uh, can offer the learner an opportunity to become participant observers of their own learning. Reflection through journaling is only superficial, but it is very important for them to become reflective. Going into our LSEN program, it is a two days program. Prior to this two days program, the nurse will be uh, required to complete a pre-reading material, uh, which consists of 12 support topics. These readings um, are provided via either hard copy or via electronic learning platform, depending on institution. Pre-recorded practicum videos depicts case studies and practical skill steps, and also include for the learner to conduct self-directed learning prior to attending the session. SFRAC algorithms are also included um, to the participant. On the first day of the program, the course test will be conducted prior to the start to allow learners to sense their personal preparation and pre-learned knowledge. This pre Core sensing will allow these learners to self-identify area of weaknesses and work towards improving their knowledge and skills in these areas over the next two days, instructor-led lectures or self-directed electronic learning with uh, instructor-led case-based discussion depending on the training institution again. This learning will be coupled with stations-based practical learning in three stations, namely defibrillation, airway management, and mega code. On the second day, program begins with a final theory test before further group practice in the three main practical station. At the end of day two, all learners will have to undergo assessment of all three practical stations and deem competent if they fulfill both the theory and practical requirement, assessment requirements. So in here, the role of our LSCN uh, instructor, the implication is that um, it is essential for them um, to, sorry, this is blocking, uh, to develop the deep learning and reflective skills of their learners. As facilitators of learning, they should adopt a non-authoritarian approach. Instructors should only ask questions to generate discussion and challenge the learner to think in different ways. Input from the educator should be in the form of constructive feedback. Reflection is frequently a new experience for learners to know that thoughts and feelings when sharing with the instructor 
can have some degree of discomfort. Therefore, the instructor should bring about a sense of mutual trust and allow the learners to feel safe sharing their feelings and thoughts. In reflection, learners are often in a valuable position when they agonize with, sorry, vulnerable position. When they agonize, they will alienate their instructor by expressing their fears, questions, and thoughts. Therefore, as instructor, they ought to respond and treat learners reflection with respect, sensitivity, and consideration. Educators advocate the need to integrate theory and practice and develop a reflective approach to education to promote deep learning. Mm, sorry. Uh, so in conclusion, there is a need to seek new ways and method of actively involving learners to promote deep learning. Reflection has a potential to engage learners in a dialogue between the theory presented in the classroom environment and the reality of everyday practice. Reflective sessions also offer a means of facilitating learners to develop problem solving, critical thinking skills and self-awareness. And finally, LSEN instructor can move beyond the teaching of the theory and use reflection to enable learners to develop critical reasoning to amplify their impact on the practice and patient care. That's the end of my presentation. And these are my reference and thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Sister Uma. Yeah. So, uh, this uh, has been such a great emphasis on how to learn. Uh, and I have learned how to learn uh, from your presentation a whole lot. Uh, so once again, we want to thank uh, all our four uh, presenters uh, just now. Uh, we have come to the Q&A session and I know we're supposed to end at about 12.55. So we still have about 15 minutes. Um, and uh, to join us uh, for the uh, Q&A session, uh, I have one more panelist to introduce to everybody. Uh, that is a uh, clinical assistant, Prof. Uh, Sewa Dua. Uh, Dr. Sewa, he's a uh, senior consultant in uh, respiratory and critical care medicine at SGH. He's also one of the co-authors of the ACLS guidelines. Uh, and it happens that ECMO is one of his uh, sub-specialties. Uh, so it's really wonderful to have him join us as well. So at this time, uh, we'll be opening the floor to uh, more questions. I think there was a lot of uh, very interesting uh, questions in the chat. Uh, and I thought I'll pick up uh, one or two of the uh, questions that have uh, not yet been answered uh, because we are reserving them <laughs> for our speakers. Uh, could we uh, start with uh, uh, Prof Sewa? Sewa uh, could you help to comment on the question about ICU CPR? Uh, do you recommend to disconnect the ventilator and ambu bag? or keep it connected to increase uh, the FIL2 to 1.0? Uh, uh, Siwa? Hi, uh, thanks, Amanda, for the introduction and uh, for the questions. I think um, whether the, we want to disconnect uh, the patient uh, and put it on the ample back versus a continue on the mechanical ventilator, I think there's very little to literature to guide us. I think uh, practically, the, uh, when they do a survey on how the, the practice has been done, I think it's quite a mixed bag. But I think the key thing is that uh, in terms of uh, ventilation, if you do intend uh, to keep the patient on the ventilator, uh, the I think the uh, some of the guidelines do recommend that uh, you consider putting them on uh, intermittent or positive uh, pressure. Uh, you do want to reduce the uh, tidal volume to about uh, 6 to 8 mils for ideal body weight and drop the uh, respiratory rate uh, to about uh, 10. I think that should be sufficient uh, for delivering a uh, uh, ventilation uh, standpoint. Um, and uh, we do know that uh, when you put this patient on the ventilator, it do free up uh, one the manpower for your other the uh, copula resuscitation. So I think that the potential some uh, benefit. Uh, but the, obviously, the, if you put them on ventilator, the concern is always about the increasing uh, too high of a positive uh, pressure together to, with your um, chest compression. But I think there are studies which shows that uh, when you put them on a limited uh, volume control and uh, dropping the tidal volume, it do not significantly increase their risk of a uh, barrel trauma. So I think uh, it is a reasonable approach, uh, especially the, if during the COVID situation, you have a very little manpower 
to actually the to sacrifice uh, to do manual the banking. Yeah, I think that's all I have to comment. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Eva. Uh, do any of the other uh, uh, panelists want to comment uh, as well? Uh, well, if not, we quickly move on. There was a question about aminophilin uh, in uh, the treatment of Brady dysarrhythmias. And it seems there are different dosages uh, suggested between AHA and ERC. I think the best person to answer this question is Jing. <laughs> Can I refer this question to you? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, um, the, uh, the use of aminophilin for severe bradycardia was fairly reported in patients with spinal cord injuries. Um, and in those case reports, it seems to suggest that you may be able to overcome refractory bradycardia. Uh, it also re limited reports of uh, aminophilin, which is an adenosine antagonist, you know, um, in tegragular induced bradycardia and dyspnea. Um, but in our experiences, we do not find this a sustained and robust way to reverse bradycardia. And the council and committee members have sought to rely on established therapies such as atropine, dopamine, adrenaline infusion, percutaneous pacing or transdermal pacing as reliable means to provide a perfusing rhythm. So we do not uh, make that a routine recommendation in our guidelines. Ben, do you have any, uh, perhaps you have more experiences at the ED setting on using aminophilin for bradycardia? Any thoughts uh, and experiences? No, the last time I used aminophilin was for asthma patients many years ago. <laughs> um, that's my experience too. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, moving along, uh, I thought we'd also uh, switch track over to the ICUs. Um, thanks, Ewan, for your uh, very nice presentation just now. Uh, could we ask you uh, to also comment about a bit more about neuroprognostication? Uh, you know, we keep worrying about this self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, we say it's going to have a bad outcome. Of course, uh, the outcome will be turned bad because, you know, you're just going to withdraw all the care. How can we avoid that? Uh, thanks, Benjamin, uh, for the question. I, I guess the working principle is that once we lay our hands on a patient to do CPR, in a way, we are committed to do something for this patient. There's no point in doing CPR for 40 minutes and then intubate patient come to your ICU. And the first thing you'll tell yourself that this patient is unlikely to be a good outcome. So fever, never mind. Blood pressure low is okay. Who close very high, don't care. Then obviously on day two and day three, patient doesn't do well and patient die. And you tell yourself that you see I'm right on day one, patient won't survive. I, I guess it's what you have a pre-perceived uh, perception of patient's uh, outcome. And that actually cloud your clinical judgment and uh, make you do certain things of avoidance of aggressive management, and therefore you fulfill your own prophecy. So I guess that if a patient come to your ICU, then it's worthwhile to give an initial aggressive course of action. Once you're rating a patient shouldn't come to ICU, then don't come to ICU. When you come to ICU, then I think that we should give patient the benefit of the doubt and try to do our best. Because in reality, um, getting return of spontaneous circulation uh, is not the end point. Of, of course, we get excited after CPR for 40 minutes and there's a sustained circulation, but that's not the end point. The end point really is to give patient the best chance of complete recovery and go home. So I, I think that's important that what we just presented is a complete bundle of care and uh, not just on TTM alone, but looking at multi-organ uh, care of a critically ill patient. Yeah, and that will help to avoid this uh, self fulfilling prophecy. So delay neural prognostication taking care of all organ systems, I, I think it's a way forward. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks, Yuvan. Sounds like you're describing that it's all or nothing. You go all the way or you don't go at all. And the whole, whole package should be there. Yeah, I think so. I think a lot of times uh, in ICU care, it's all about package of care and bundle of care. I think that no one single intervention alone uh, will potentially make much of a difference. It's about small, small things together, looking at the airway, the respiratory system, the circulatory, the neurology, electrolytes, the blood glucose. Everything comes together and play a small part and together they will have a big impact on patients' eventual outcomes. 
I, I think that's just what it is. There's no magic bullet in critical care medicine. It's all about taking care of all organ system, optimize everything that can optimize, and therefore there'll be good outcomes. So I think that's why we have intentionally, um, in a way, not mentioned too much on TTM, although there are quite a number of slides on TTM, because I feel that if uh, ICU just do TTM alone, and we, we don't care about the rest of the respiratory, circulatory, electrolytes, then outcome may not necessarily be good just because you cool patient with 33 degrees Celsius. And therefore, it's very important for us to have a complete bundle of care when we look after patient after resuscitated cardiac arrest. That's the only way to get good outcomes. Yeah, thanks, uh, Yuwen. Uh, that is a nice uh, segue to uh, the next question. I thought I'll ask Jia Hao. Uh, yes. So, if we throw in the whole bundle, uh, ECMO also throw in. Uh, uh, so, is there a fear of uh, you know ECMO making the death more expensive? Uh, I use a very oh, yeah. <laughs> provocative question. Uh. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, well, as <laughs> Dr. Zay was here. Um, but, anyways, no, I, I think. Cost. Cost is a white elephant uh, pertaining to any kind of ECMO CPR discussion around the world. Um, it is an expensive intervention. Um, there are studies that looked at cost effectiveness or eCPR. Um, however, I think all these studies are not necessarily very applicable for one healthcare system to another due to the fact that healthcare systems are heterogeneous in terms of how they calculate healthcare costs, the fact that you know, um, different, all these studies are done in different points in time and therefore healthcare costs can change over time. Um, suffice it to say, I think locally for us, I, I don't think if a patient meets the, if it meets the criteria, if a patient meets a certain kind of criteria or the clear indications for ECMO, I don't think it's stopped any of our physicians from enacting uh, appropriate care for the patient. Um, but certainly, it is a real consideration that impacts how how um, how uh, um, uh, healthcare systems uh, um, take up take up this uh, treatment modality. Um, there are, of course, discussions. There are also, of course, uh, more. Co and of course, I mean, the other thing I didn't really touch on is the fact that uh, uh, there's very little. Um, studies talking about the long-term prognosis for ECMO CPR survivors. Most of these studies stop at six months. Um, so, of course, there's a less quantifiable uh, uh, offset of having an economically productive uh, survivor helping to offset the potential cost of this ECMO. Uh, there's also the whole complex and uh, discussion around um, uh, organ donation, right, where um, where Patients who are on ECMO uh, might, uh, there's enough for patients who are on ECMO, there might be time uh, for the physicians, for the physicians to conduct that very painful, tragic, but yet uh, 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 sensitive discussion that needs to take place with the family as to see whether ECMO itself can help bridge the patient to fulfilling the patient's wishes if he or her, or if him or her, hope to be a donor in the first place. I will point out ECMO is supposed to be a resuscitative thing. It's not meant to be a means to get more organs, but I did point out that ECMO did show higher rates of brain death in that population. I think the, the study that I quoted earlier about from, from Paris, Bokwan, I think uh, the do organ donation rate was four times higher than, uh, in the ECMO CPR group compared to the, compared to the CCPR group. And I think it's more, more because uh, time uh, there was time enough for the ICU teams to enact that difficult conversation. Which, yeah. Well, yeah, thanks, Jiahao. Maybe I would like to invite Sewa also to offer his comments. Sewa, you're muted. Sewa, you're muted. Yeah, so, uh, so sorry about that. I totally agree with what uh, Jiao has mentioned. I also just want to add that uh, ECMO is a bridge to something more definitive, uh, be it the recovery or be it uh, to transplant or some of the VA ECMO patient, but also a bridge uh, to decision. Because uh, when we initiate the ECPR, it's usually often in a very time uh, uh, sensitive uh, fashion to where the uh, outcome to outlook of the patient is not very clear. So the, I think the important part from the, uh, the team perspective in managing the patients uh, with, uh, on VAMO is that always uh, think about uh, 
uh, after the, we have successfully to bring the patient back uh, from uh, the cardiac arrest, uh, is the clinical the trajectory the compatible with the meaningful the recovery and have a sensible the time frame of, to consider the talking to the family about the changing the philosophy of care rather than the, to put the patient uh, uh, indefinitely on VA and O uh, when the outlook uh, is has shown itself uh, to be the uh, poor. Right, so have a set a sensible time frame when to discuss uh, uh, different uh, goals of care. I think would be very important uh, for any uh, institution or at most center uh, caring uh, for this group of patients uh, as well. Yeah, I think this is uh, all I have to comment. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Sewa. Um, so I pass it the time to Feng Chi. Uh, are you muted? Thanks, Ben. Uh, there is actually two questions for, for Uma. So one question is, how does a person working experience actually affect any deep learning? Over to you, Uma. Okay, I actually uh, replied the answer <laughs> via text, but I will share here. Yes, yes. So um, uh, uh, experienced nurse will have a lot of experiential um, um, experiences in them that they um, are able to share. However, this particular person, if they are highly reflective, the more they reflect on their practice, uh, the higher the deep learning happens. So when deep learning happens, the retention of what they have learned um, sustain better and they are able to utilize even um, without um, having problem when they memorize things and it, it goes off faster. So that will be the answer. Yes, thanks, Omar. Now that you know that during this COVID uh, uh, period, uh, so we, a lot of us take this opportunity to convert our new way of learning. So yeah. a lot of institutions who has been doing conventional classroom learning, they actually converted into a lot of e-learn or pre-recorded video so that they can cut down the contact time. Yeah. So would we like to share what is the feedback from the learners in this new norm of learning, whereby you have less classroom contact mm -hmm. and you yeah. do more self-directed learning. Yeah, yeah, so that all institutions, colleagues can learn from each other. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sister. Um, so basically, yeah, you're right, sister. During COVID, uh, as an education department, we have con uh, we have converted, and many institutions also converted their face-to-face -face learning to um, online learning and web-based learning and or e-learning. So uh, initially, it was a challenge to get uh, to shift the mindset of our nurses who are so used to face-to-face -face learning. However, during this um, uh, season, taking the opportunity uh, of uh, COVID. Uh, we do have sustenance uh, of uh, participant um, liking to uh, towards this because most of our uh, generation, these people are IT savvy and uh, they don't have to like confine themselves face to face and not learn compared to learning in their own pace at their own time and own comfort. But I must also share till now um, when the classes go on, essential class go on, there will be one or two participants who will not do their e-learning. So this is to keep it very real. Um, yep. So, but majority of them, I would say they like and they do complete their pre-learning. Yep. That will be the feedback. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Uma. So let's see whether we've got any other further question that we can address. Uh, Actually, no, there was, uh, yeah, uh, yes, yes, Ben, you, no, ben, ben, you go ahead, Ben, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, well, there was a question I just answered on the text, but I, I thought I'd like to ask the panel to comment as well, which is an excellent question, <laughs> which is about the uh, uh, rings uh, in the chain of survival. And, and this question asked by Selvi was the sixth ring, recovery. Uh, perhaps I'd like to invite all the previous panelists as well. Anybody, please comment on this, the uh, uh the last link that we didn't have here, uh, recovery. Uh, any uh, members of the uh, panel uh, do chip in? Hi, Sewa here. So I think uh, from the ICU the perspective, uh, we actually uh, are starting to work very closely with our rehab uh, colleagues. So I think uh, that now the rehab is actually moving the early on the, into ICU care as well. So actually, the, if we can start the rehab process early on, potentially the, we can actually advance the recovery the process much better. And our rehab colleagues are actually very, very interested uh, into starting 
uh, ICO rehab. So I think this is an area that's very interesting and can develop further the, in the different institution. Hi, Chikel here. Yeah. Yeah. I do uh, echo what you are saying, that the sixth ring is very important. Uh, in the CCU setting, we see patients with cardiac arrest, and some of them may have normal coronary arteries, you know, what, what, we, what we call the perhaps inherited cardiac diseases, arrhythmias, or cardiomyopathy. There are the six ring is most important for various aspects. Number one, for the patient or the victim himself to optimize recovery. And if recovery is this small, poor neurological recovery, we can move on to rehab and comfort measures for the patient. Number two, for the family, because they have lots of questions and we really have to do more to help them uh, cope, help them adjust and help them move forward uh, with that life-changing uh, situation that they just encountered. Over to you, Ben. Uh, thanks, Jing. Okay, I think we have come to 12.58. Um, so before we close this session, uh, we want to thank uh, all our speakers again. So can we quickly go around? Uh, we'll begin back with uh, Uma. Uh, any final comments? Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I really learned a lot from other speakers and um, the updates on DCLS and ACLS um, standards. Thank you so much. That's about it. Thanks, Uma. Uh, Sewa? I think uh, uh, ACRS is a, it's an important ring, but it's the whole the chain of the survival. I think uh, there's very, very a lot that the, the intensivists uh, can actually, uh, as well as the primary sustainers, can contribute to the uh, recovery of the patient. So I think uh, um, the different uh, um, uh, disciplines uh, in the hospital, hospital chain have a important uh, role to play in the patient's uh, meaningful recovery. Thank you. Thanks, Sewa. Uh, Jia Hao? Um, yeah, no, so I just, uh, th I just want to thank everybody to give me the opportunity to talk. But again, I just want to stress eCPR is about patient selection. Um, and uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And to be critical and scrutinize the data, it's, um, there's a lot of data that tends to skew uh, eCPR a little bit too favorably. Um, just be a little bit critical about it, that's all. Yes, thank you. Uh, you Yuvun? Uh, thanks, Ben. I think just emphasize again that every ring in the chain of survival is important and our pre-hospital care and ED care has improved tremendously and therefore there are more survivors the hospital admission. So now we need to really work on a post cardiac arrest ICU care to ensure that we don't become the weakest link in the chain of survival. And really, if a patient is uh, fortunate enough to be successfully resuscitated, we need to have optimal post cardiac arrest care in ICU to ensure that they not only survive, but go home with the best uh, chance of complete recovery. And again, to emphasize that the TTM1 trial and TTM2 trial are not comparing TTM versus no TTM. That's been a very common misconception. They are comparing TTM and hypothermia versus TTM and normal thermia. And again, TTM and normal thermia is not necessarily easier to manage. And it's shown that a lot of patients do require active temperature control to maintain normal thermia and white fever. And that's a very important message to remember. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yu uh, Lastly, Ching, uh, do you have any final comments? Yes, with respect to ACLS, I ask all providers to be familiar with the universal algorithm. Number two, go through drills with your teams be familiar with the different roles that you may play at different research situations. And I'm certain you will achieve the efficiency of an F1 pit box change team. Right. It will give you a sense of order in that situation of chaos. Over to Thank you, you Ben. Uh, okay, uh, Feng Chi, any final comments? Is she muted? Yeah, uh, Fongshi, you're muted. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, this morning, this, 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 uh, this morning and afternoon, uh, I actually learned so much from the ACLS panelists as well as the BCLS. Probably it's, it's time to go and reflect uh, our own practice in, in our institution and see how we can use this update to improve our patient outcome. You know, thank you to everybody. Uh, <laughs> thanks. It, it brings me great pleasure to announce the next thing is lunch. <laughs> And I think the next session, let me quickly check. Um, let's see.
is supposed to commence at 1.15. Uh, can we ask to start a bit later? Um, can we start at 1.20? Okay, so we'll resume at 1.20. Uh, don't choke on your food, okay? But if you do, we know what to do now. <laughs> See you later. Bye. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to uh, the town hall. I hope everyone's had some time to grab lunch. Uh, we're going into our third session uh, for the day and last session for the day. Uh, and today's uh, session three will focus on pediatric and neonatal resuscitation guidelines and will hopefully address some of the questions I think that were raised in the Q&A uh, earlier on today. My name is Ihui. Uh, I'm a senior consultant and uh, pediatric intensivist at KK Hospital and chair chairing the session with me today is Dr. Kwek Lin Hui, who is also a senior consultant, neonatologist and head of the NICU at KK Hospital. Today, joining us for panelists, uh, our three distinguished uh, speakers, uh, ass Assistant Prof. Jean Ong, Dr. Biswas, as well as Assistant Prof. Uh, Yeo Chow Lian from SGH as well. Um, I will, I think we will, we will individually introduce our speakers as and when they come up, just some housekeeping uh, as well. And I'm sure everyone's quite familiar with this already. Please continue to uh, put up your questions in the Q&A chat box and we'll try and answer them either live or via uh, the chat box itself. Uh, so without much further ado, we will, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Jean. Uh, I'd like to dis, uh, add a disclaimer, Jean is my classmate. Uh, he's <laughs> And uh, I know him as an extraordinarily passionate advocate for good quality CPR in children. Uh, he's also a senior consultant, pediatric uh, emergency physician at KK Hospital's Children's uh, Emergency Department and the chair for the Pediatric Subcommittee of the SRFAC. Uh, Today, he'll be speaking on the Singapore Pediatric Resuscitation Guidelines 2021. Uh, Jean, over to you. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks, Yihui. Um, can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, so we will start. Um, I will try to make this, um, the, the rest of the details, I think, I believe that you can read it, read it in, the, in, the, in, the, in the actual resuscitation guidelines, but I just want to highlight major things that might be of interest uh, to everyone. Um, one thing to note that uh, Singapore is quite blessed in terms of um, our child and infant mortality. It's extremely low. Um, in fact, under five uh, mortality rate is 2.5 per thousand life birth in 2019. But I do believe that we can do better. And um, I just want to expound on what previous speakers have mentioned about the chain. Uh, and I would like to emphasize that there's a lot of good work done by the pre-hospital people because that's where it really counts. And not just a pre-hospital injury prevention, um, those advocates for child safety, um, um, submersion injuries and all my colleagues uh, who are actually involved in this uh, uh, either co uh, as a team or individually uh, as part of their efforts to improve uh, pediatric resuscitation and cardiac arrest outcomes. So um, just to quickly note, pediatric resuscitation guidelines, the, there are some changes in terms of age definition by both ERC and AHA. Um, there has also been divergence of international guidelines on pediatric life support, uh, for example, post-intubation. Previously, uh, we used to say that uh, post-intubation or ME insertion, everybody goes for a single rate of 10 breaths per, of 10 ventilations per minute. ERC has um, 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 diverged from this and gave a age-specific uh, guideline, and uh, AHA has given a, a range of 20 to 30 for pediatric age group. So what Singapore has done is to just uh, simplify in a sense that we will do the same rates as we would for rescue breathing 30, 20, 10, according to the three main age groups. And I'll go expound on this uh, later on as well. So in terms of emphasis, as I mentioned before, the, the great work done by uh, Prof. Marcus Ong, as well as uh, Associate Prof. Tam Lai Ping on uh, the EMS aspects of cardiac arrest, uh, we need to activate fast. And I do believe that we do see insurance emergency as well where cardiac arrest, they are brought in by their own transport or critically ill children being brought in by their own transport. So there's a link that we perhaps can improve in terms of public education as well. The use of dispatch uh, assistance by uh, Ben and the group uh, is extremely important, increasing uh, bystander, uh, the use of uh, dispatch assisted CPR. And the activation of volunteers nearby will be more than useful because 
uh, even though in pediatrics, majority of them are not cardiac in nature, the use of ADs have been associated with improved outcomes even for pediatrics. So, so um, I would think uh, this is extremely important in pediatrics as well. This is the old chain of uh, pediatric chain of survival uh, most people have mentioned, um, but I have modified this slightly. And um, just to note that there's de decreasing evidence for effectiveness. If you can prevent it, the rest of it just makes it so much easier. So prevention is actually the key, I would think. And early CPR and EMS, uh, uh, what we do in ED would be the, the advanced uh, life support. And, what, uh, and then together with uh, the ICU people, uh, the integrated post-arrest care as well. So I've modified it a little bit for the local context into the emphasis on neurological intact survival rather than just uh, survival per se. And hence, I've actually kept hypoglycemia uh, as part of the, not so much as reversible causes, but contributory causes of lack of neurologically intact survival. You may survive, but after one hour downtime with um, low glucose, you're not going to end up well. Um, so although it doesn't really, for the pediatric population, contribute to, to, to survival, but it definitely does contribute to neurologically intact survival. So that's important as well. Uh, our outcomes are not just RSC or return of spontaneous circulation, not just survival to hospital discharge. It is actually um, um, neurological outcomes as, as we see uh, and what we hope to achieve. So the chain has to be tailored such that uh, right from injury prevention, which has the most evidence for effectiveness to uh, recognition of clearly ill children in the pre-hospital and hospital context, and then uh, this is where if systems fail, uh, we end up doing uh, life support, which is what we are hoping not to do. Uh, and if we should do it, we should do it well. And this is what the focus is about. And again, the outcome is not survival, it's neurological intact survival. Um, and this has mentioned it's multidimensional. So uh, pediatricians should be advocates for child health, just in terms of immunization, education, and training as well. Uh, to focus on the preventive aspect. Uh, again, all these things can be prevented. No amount of good CPR can prevent uh, a collapse that was preventable. Uh, and even injury uh, prevention is extremely important. And I think my colleagues in the emergency department has uh, are advocates for this as well. Uh, in terms of, uh, as part of prevention of becoming true cardiac arrest, uh, we have noted that uh, um, the foreign body is a potential cause and it's a reversible cause and therefore we should intervene appropriately. Um, so what we advocate is that for pediatrics, especially given the importance of ventilation, uh, we would still encourage that if the patient uh, collapses or becomes unconscious uh, with a witness at a foreign body airway obstruction, that you would uh, try to provide uh, CPR with ventilation um, and not just chest compressions because um, there is significant hypoxia by the time they turn unconscious as well. Uh, in pre-arrest in the hospital, and so uh, UFA has also worked uh, quite hard on uh, using systems to identify at-risk patients. Um, so the, the systems such as PUs or similar systems, cues or otherwise modified in the, in the context of your setting, uh, to identify clearly ill children before the patient collapse. I think that's important. And with that collapse, there must be a activation system to, to timely uh, intervene uh, such that uh, the patient is, uh, 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 does not go into a rest or, uh, or the, the cause of uh, the child deterioration is actually stopped. And, and all this uh, needs to be trained as well, both in the, in the early systems, pre-arrest systems, as well as during arrest and post-arrest as well. So as I emphasize again, once pediatric cardiac arrest have, has occurred, uh, um, there's a failure of prevention. So the next priority is return of spontaneous circulation so that uh, there is a neurologically intact survival and all this goes hand in hand as part of the chain. So I, I again emphasize on pretty much uh, everything. You do not try to return the heart as so much as return the brain and the heart uh, together as a system. Uh, this has been uh, repeated uh, in the previous talks and I want to emphasize this. As, as the thing. So your, your, it's not restart the heart, I would say. Uh, just, just get everything, the heart, to, to perfuse the brain uh, as the end organs. 
Um, again, the evidence from observation studies, uh, we can't do uh, interventional studies uh, in a pre-hospital context. Uh, again, it shows quite clearly that uh, bystander accompanied uh, CPR is good always. And, but however, in pediatrics, they tend to be lower than adults and the outcomes are very poor for infants and, uh, and ventilations which has compression do improve outcomes. So that's, that's our focus as well. This is for both uh, community as well as hospital settings. So what we need to do is to ensure that we increase community CPR rates and this has shown to improve outcomes uh, in observational studies as well. Um, so what we have shown is uh, outcomes are better if CPR includes ventilation for pediatric cardiac arrest. There's scientific evidence against power checks uh, and uh, so we have actually moved away from that since the last uh, guidelines. And it also includes the use of AEDs in the Japanese registries it has shown to improve outcomes as well. Uh, hence, um, don't forget the AEDs and don't worry about uh, if there are no child pads, if it's a shockable rhythm, uh, the patient should be shocked as well. Uh, the emphasis is a uh, common initial algorithm. So um, just do as you would, but include ventilation as part of your uh, CPR if it's a pediatric patient. Um, the emphasis is, is part, as, as I mentioned again, um, why this is so, because for pediatrics, Unlike in, in adults where most of the cardiac arrests are due to ischemic heart disease, uh, they suddenly collapse at workplace while walking in the streets or during their jogs. Uh, period arrest tends to be less commonly due to cardiac causes and, and therefore um, they tend to occur in places where people are known to them, if not the family members. Uh, and therefore the willingness to provide ventilations are probably better in uh, associated prof terms, uh, people with markers as well, on uh, the power studies for pediatrics, 70% uh, of those uh, CPR are uh, rendered by their family members. So I would think that um, they would uh, be comfortable providing ventilations uh, if they know how uh, to, to pediatric cardiac arrest patients as well. Um, so, and then if you're unsure about uh, a child being unwell, uh, call EMS, uh, do not call your doctor friends, do not call your your anesthetist uh, relatives, um, just, just um, you know, call EMS, activate the system and be part of that chain to improve uh, uh, neurological intact survival. Okay, so this is um, the grand scheme of things. Uh, what we are trying to do in terms of pediatric basic life support is to re-emphasize the chain of pediatric survival, not neurological intact survival, the details of which don't worry so much about it, but the idea that ventilation is better in pediatrics and in future publications, I think um, it will be shown that uh, for infants, this is critically important as well. Uh, for BCRS uh, compression depth, uh, this has always been uh, somewhat uh, a bit of a controversy because let's say in PELS, there are separate recommendations. So uh, as with our adult guidelines, our absolute depth compression is different from international recommendations. And so we have kept to it. Um, but just to note that um, it is good only if you can measure it. Uh, most observational studies have shown that uh, we don't press hard enough. So if you can measure it, then I think uh, you should target it towards uh, what our recommendations say. But if there are no feedback devices, then I would say that push hard, push fast, because most observational studies, at least for pediatrics, show that we under compress uh, be it healthcare workers or uh, be it uh, community, in, uh, community bystanders. Uh, and we have done a local study which shows that uh, uh, if we follow the international guidelines, uh, it may be a bit deep, uh, as mentioned, as what was, suspe uh, what was suspected by uh, Prof Lim Sui Han. Um, and, uh, but having said that, uh, just do note, uh, most of the times we under compress. So that's the take home message. So I would say push up, push up uh, fast unless you can measure the depth accurately. Uh, this will be provided as well. So don't worry so much about it. Uh, it's a comparison of pediatrics. Pediatrics is a bit different because it ranges from um, once a, 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 a baby has been discharged from nursery into the community well uh, to all the way up to 18 or 16 years old be uh, and, and so it's slightly different. Uh, so we have actually um, shifted up the range for adult life support to 12 years, to above 12, that would mean secondary school. So it makes it a bit easier. 
uh, to remember. If you're in secondary school, just do a doubt, whereas the eight, it may be a bit difficult in, in, uh, for children uh, nine years old who may be small size and uh, the, the doubt recommendations may, may underventilate as well as uh, uh, the compressions may be a bit deeper than expected in the healthcare setting. Uh, for non trachopapidia cardiac arrest, it's pretty much the same as the adults. Uh, in fact, Ihui was involved in a systematic review on this but with Ilkor as well. Uh, in non trachopapidia rhythms, and most of them are in pediatrics, uh, do give adrenaline as soon as you can. Look for reversible causes. And um, what we have changed is that ventilation rates, uh, post intubation or advanced airway is the same as rescue breathing which means that for less than one or infants, it's 30. And then uh, if you are not uh, prepubescent, it's 20 and then uh, 10 to 12. Uh, the reason for 10 to 12 is because in adults, they use 10 uh, and we say the same as rescue breathing. So anytime between 10 to 12 is actually reasonable as long as uh, you don't overventilate. Uh, and that's one of the main things. So we have actually kept to uh, low normal ventilation rates rather than uh, hyperventilate. Uh, we are concerned that 20 to 30 in in the older age group might be hyperventilating and therefore that's why we're not recommending uh, what AHA is doing. Uh, just some minor points as, as mentioned, uh, this is uh, particular to uh, the ICU setting. Uh, the first drop is two to four, but again, that depends on the patient context. Uh, so, but uh, those units that are trained to start using four joules per kg in shockable rhythms, please do go ahead. It is not wrong. It's just that uh, there may be a rule for two joules, which is uh, patient specific, especially post cardiac surgery on very, very small and thin and malnourished uh, children where the chest impedance is actually uh, not as high as those uh, out of hospital or those who are a bit different. Uh, so we would recommend two to four we allow uh, first shock for shockable rhythm in cardiac arrest. Otherwise, uh, pretty much the same. And the emphasis again is to look for contributory causes of cardiac arrest in children. Uh, for pediatric uh, bradycardia, there are no major changes. The focus is on stability. So instead of asking what drugs, I would say look for causes, again, the reversible causes, uh, look for the stability and then uh, focus on the patient rather than just the cardiac rhythm itself. If the patient is, has poor perfusion and bradycardic in children, they are not able to sustain maybe a pre-arrest rhythm. Uh, so we would suggest starting uh, CPR if they are hemodynamically unstable with bradycardia. Uh, for stable uh, tachycardia, again, it has not changed much from the last uh, uh, guidelines issued. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is to cardiovert uh, chemically if the patient is stable uh, by electrical cardioversion if they are unstable. So that's the take-home message for pediatric tachycardia. Uh, Post-arrest care, um, I'm going for the Goldilocks principles, basically. Uh, again, we have actually talked about all this, uh, you know, normal glycemia, normal oxia, normal capnia, normal tension to make sure that the patient is stable and they get uh, cerebral perfusion adequately and not to over perfuse uh, because that might uh, increase risk of post arrest syndrome. Do not hyperventilate and do not uh, result in hypoxia, which uh, result in oxygen radicals. And again, the brain will suffer because of post ischemic stresses. Uh, again, I want to emphasize uh, this, and I'm glad the, uh, the adult colleagues have actually mentioned this. Uh, targeting normal thermia is an active process and not a passive process. Uh, so it's part of targeted uh, temperature uh, management and not a passive group. So if the, the normal thermic group in any um, part of management is, is, is due to lack of intervention, then that's not, that's not what was meant in terms of uh, normal thermic uh, considerations. Uh, just to emphasize, um, and uh, those who, I'm not too sure if anyone remembers the song, uh, don't take the breath away uh, in children. Ventilation is important in pediatric cardiac, especially for infants. Uh, and there was a talk on use of BVM in the, in the healthcare setting. It is uh, excellent because uh, uh, in terms of infection control and everything, but in community, if you think about it, the BVM comes in various sizes. A uh, uh, poorly fitted BVM is, is just as bad, if not worse, because you assume that effective ventilation is given. And the technique of BVM is actually not that simple. And uh, even amongst healthcare workers, they need to be trained as well. So uh, it's a little bit different in pediatrics. Again, the, the idea of ventilation is if you're willing, you're trained and you're able, 
uh, provide ventilation as part of Comte CPR, and that's important. Uh, if you're not, at least provide chest compression, that's better than nothing. Uh, but especially for infants, do try, and I would assume that infants do not, uh, it's very rare to have infants uh, not in the care of a, 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 a bystander who is known to the, to the infant and who are probably willing uh, and guided by dispatch assistant if they're not trained to provide ventilations. Uh, again, I would like to thank everybody who have contributed in the community for those first aiders who are teaching and for first aiders who are providing uh, and everyone in the healthcare setting preventing resuscitation uh, and improving resuscitation outcomes for critical cardiac arrest. Um, questions to be discussed in the Q&A, uh, my contact, um, and that's it for my presentation. Uh, thank you, Jean, uh, for your illuminating talk. I think there are quite a few questions um, that we'll ask during the Q&A session later. Um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Biswas Agnihotri. He's a senior consultant neonatologist at the National University Hospital. He's also a member of the neonatal subgroup under the PEAT committee of SRFAC and a co-trainer of the Singapore Neonatal Resuscitation Course. And he's one of the main authors of our soon to be published uh, Newborn Resuscitation Guidelines. Um, so he's here to talk to us about something that's actually completely different on uh, neonatal resuscitation. Um, also, I'd like to encourage uh, everyone to ask your questions under the Q&A and so that we can address them later. Thank you, uh, Dr. Biswas. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Quick. Are you able to hear me? Yes, you can. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes. Thank you. So uh, I'm glad to present the neonatal resuscitation guidelines for 2021 on behalf of the neonatology subgroup of uh, SUFAC. So um, this updates our 2016 guidelines and it heavily draws from um, updates which has sequentially happened over the last five years uh, by ILCOR, American Heart Association, European Resuscitation Council. Um, of course, it has been calibrated for local practice and the healthcare delivery, but I don't think the changes are big from what is uh, accepted internationally. So uh, this was uh, a big teamwork drafted by neonatologists from three public hospitals and uh, as well as the private sector, guided by the subgroup members of uh, SUFAC. So it's important to realize that this applies to newborns who are transitioning to extrauterine life, meaning mainly geared for babies uh, after birth. It also applies to newborns who have uh, transitioned but remained in, in the hospital after birth that is yet to be discharged following the uh, birth. And uh, this will benefit uh, majority of the preterm babies less than 34 weeks and up to about 10% of term newborns who may require some resuscitation or stabilization after birth. So um, one thing that we are happy about is that there are no major um, changes since the 2016 guidelines, but of course new evidence has come up and uh, majority of those evidence goes on to reaffirm what was already known and was being practiced. The, the way the resuscitation, uh, neonatal resuscitation has been packaged under blocks of um, anticipation, thermoregulation, airway circulation, post-resuscitation care, they remain about the same. Even the algorithm generally remains about the same. Um, we have made it a little bit uh, more intuitive in the sense that um, we want to emphasize the temperature control is very important and has to be are maintained throughout the resuscitation and beyond. The saturation for the baby, the amount of oxygen that we deliver to the baby needs to be titrated very closely. And that also comes up quite prominently. 
In terms of steps of, of the algorithm, they are generally about the same since the last, and it will be published in the uh, SNJ in near future. So for the next few slides, what I'm going to do is basically go through some of the important aspects of neonatal resuscitation, highlighting things which have not changed and are yet important, as well as to just draw attention to some new evidence and how it, how it might change in the future. Uh, it's very important to anticipate and prepare for uh, deliveries uh, of a high risk nature, because such babies usually would require uh, more uh, skillful handling of the resuscitation. Uh, generally, for every baby born in Singapore, there must be somebody who is able to deliver the basic neonatal life support, and the advanced skill providers can be summoned if things happen unexpectedly, or they can be present when we know things are going to uh, require more help. The designated resuscitation area should be warm, well-lit, drought-free, um, of course, all the equipments for monitoring as well as for delivering the care should be well maintained and ready for use. Umbilical cord management, this has been an area of debate for a very long time, especially in the last two to three decades. Um, we generally agree that the physiologies um, of the transition tells us that once the baby's lungs are aerated, that's a good time to clamp the cord. Studies have been done and for term babies, I think the, uh, there's not much of doubt that um, there's a modest improvement in uh, non-critical uh, areas like a reduction of iron deficiency or a little better hematocrit, but uh, delayed cord clamping doesn't do much benefit in terms of survival or neurodevelopment. Whether as a population health or public health point of view, does it make a big difference to the population? That part has not been studied and uh, we will probably have to wait for uh, such studies to commence. I think the focus is mainly over here on preterm babies and increasingly we believe that more premature the baby, um, probably higher the benefit in terms of the uh, delayed cord clamping. This is a notion, it's not been proven by studies and we are yet waiting for studies which looks at specifically very young babies, very premature babies and what delayed cord clamping does to them. What is known already, especially the recent um, large reviews by Fogarty and uh, Rabi, are that there is definitely survival advantage of uh, delayed cord clamping. The effect of those may be a little small, but definitely it is there. So it may be a good idea to do practice delayed cord clamping in uh, premature babies. It probably helps in terms of uh, reduction of intraventricular hemorrhage. However, um, the evidence is unclear whether it could reduce chronic lung disease or periventricular leukomalacia or other uh, morbidities in a preterm baby. Cord milking is in uh, vogue more in the European countries. Um, studies are now quite clear that it does not give any advantage over delayed cord clamping. And uh, one thing of note is that for very preterm newborns, less than 28 weeks, probably it's harmful because one large RCT was stopped because of high amount of IVH and mortality in the arm which had intact cord milking. So our recommendation is that uh, the date cord clamping is probably good and up to about 60 seconds should be permitted in newborns who do not require resuscitation. If the newborn requires resuscitation and if you're able to do the resuscitation with the intact cord, that can be allowed. But if that's not possible, I think resuscitation takes precedence. It is contraindicated in settings when placental circulation is compromised and we cannot uh, allow cord milking, especially in very preterm babies in our clinical settings. As far as research goes, yes, it can be uh, considered uh, based on the type of research. Now, Singapore is a very warm country and uh, yet babies can easily get uh, hypothermic. I mean, that's the reason why I keep a, a jacket in my office. But unfortunately for babies, just warm clothing does not cut it, especially for preterm babies. Uh, it's been shown that they need multiple modalities of thermoregulation to be able to maintain normothermia. So um, our recommendations in that is that um, 
the ambient temperature of delivery room OT or the place of delivery has to be tightly controlled, especially for extremely preterm birds, it has to be 25 degrees centigrade or higher. We need to maintain normothermia in babies at all points from birth all the way from transfer to the ICU. Um, as a universal international quality control, I think what everybody looks at is the temperature at admission. So this must be recorded and uh, for in, in each institution. For babies who are more than or equal to 33 weeks and who are generally well, we can allow for skin to skin and um, uh, with the mother and kangaroo care, cover with blanket. For babies who are more than equal to 33 weeks but who need resuscitation, they need to be brought to the radiant warmer and dried. For babies who are less than 33 weeks, um, they are wrapped up in a polyethylene without drying and placed under the warmer and continued to be observed for need for resuscitation. What's important is that the warm chain during transfer has to be maintained. We cannot afford to get the babies become hypothermic because the entire resuscitation will have a worse outcome in hypothermic babies. The first minute often termed as a golden minute is a very important time point for the baby. And a lot of parallel activities go on during this time. Apart from warmth, we generally stimulate the baby to initiate breathing, uh, try to open on the airway and maintain it. One thing which has come out quite strong and re-emphasized is that routine suctioning of the oropharynx or nasopharynx can be harmful and it's best avoided. Basically, it can cause a bradycardia, it can cause vagal stimulation, or more uh, than that, it will delay the positive pressure ventilation, which is the need of the minute. Usually assessments are also started during this period with uh, regards to adequacy of breathing, heart rate, which is usually done by auscultation. Again, the research and the evidence shows that for babies who require prolonged resuscitation, it's probably best to get ECG leads on the baby and have a continuous heart rate monitoring. It gives much more accurate data in terms of heart rate. And we all know that the improvement of the heart rate and stability of the heart rate is one of the uh, important determinants of success of resuscitation. Positive pressure ventilation, if a baby requires, must be started by the end of the golden minute. And this is probably the most important step in neonatal resuscitation. Meconium stained amniotic fluid, um, our practice has already changed by 2016 uh, from a landmark paper and from um, belief that probably immediate laryngoscopy and tracheal toileting in a non-vigorous baby born through meconium stained lyca did not give any benefit. And this has been um, you know, proven more and emphasized with the recent reviews. And uh, this method of uh, universal laryngoscopy and tracheal toileting for non-vigorous babies do not uh, provide any benefit in terms of reduction of meconium aspiration syndrome, survival, pulmonary hypertension, HIE, or need for respiratory support. So our recommendations are even strengthened. So there's no need for intrapartum suctioning of nose or mouth. There's no need for routine oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal suctioning. Of course, if the airway is blocked, we need to use a large bore catheter under direct vision to suck out those uh, secretions. Um, for most babies, if a baby needs resuscitation, just follow the usual resuscitation steps, just like any other baby uh, in a non-vigorous baby to establish the regular respiration. Positive pressure ventilation, like I mentioned, is probably the most important step in um, neonatal resuscitation because uh, the baby does not improve until the lungs are aerated. Every 30 second delay increases the morbidity and mortality by 16%. And th that's huge, I think. So um, um, our recommendations are that uh, positive pressure ventilation should be initiated within the first 60 seconds, especially in babies who require it. Um, the pressure required for positive pressure ventilation can be between 20 to 25 centimeters of water, and it could be uh, increased uh, if the baby does not respond to these pressures. Use of PEEP, at least five centimeters of water, is probably beneficial. Sustained lung inflation is a practice uh, which is um, um, 
quite common in the European countries, um, not so common here. But uh, the recent studies, at least a large RCT has been stopped because they found higher mortality and higher risk of IVH in uh, very premature babies who had uh, sustained lung inflation of more than five seconds. I don't think this is a practice in uh, Singapore in any of the three PHIs, and um, uh, there's no room for it in a routine clinical practice at this moment. Oxygen use, this is again an area of debate and we are still trying to find the best possible oxygen for, especially for preterm babies. It's been proven without a doubt generally that uh, term babies who are asphyxiated, they probably do better with uh, room air, starting resuscitation as compared to 100%. But for preterm babies, um, <laughs> There has been a lot of debate. Uh, what we know for sure is that preterm babies, probably they need a bit of an oxygen um, to um, help them with the transition. Uh, with a little bit of oxygen, their heart rate stabilizes faster, their blood pressure stabilizes faster, the need for intubation uh, reduces. Um, they're also reduce mortality and morbidity when a little bit of oxygen is used. So how little is little? Um, that's the main question which we have been grappling with. People have um, um, looked at, um, say, traditionally about 30% oxygen and uh, other arm being more than 60%. And um, they did find that probably the 30% was um, better. Um, when you look at less than 50% and more than 50% oxygen at the start of resuscitation, there's an equipoise, there's not much of answer from there. So our recommendations would be that start resuscitation, anything between 21% to 30% for uh, premature babies, less than 33 weeks. More preterm the baby, probably a better idea to start off with some oxygen. In fact, in uh, some of these trials, when they looked at the uh, saturation of the baby at five minutes, and if a baby was able to reach, reach about 80% uh, sats at about five minutes, um, the baby was uh, twice less likely to survive, twice less likely to have um, better um, outcomes as compared to babies who could not reach 80% saturation at five minutes. Um, so uh, European Resuscitation Council has been quite pragmatic about it and uh, they have kind of uh, categorized as babies who are less than 28 weeks be started with 30%, babies between uh, 28 weeks to 32 weeks started between 21 to 30%. So without going into these categories, we have generally mentioned for babies less than 32 weeks, uh, maybe started with some oxygen. But babies who are more than equal to 33 weeks, it's probably best to start with room air and target the saturation based on the minute specific uh, saturation limits. Good idea to stabilize a baby's uh, respiration with CPAP, especially in premature babies. Um, we, we will be able to prevent extra intubations um, if you are able to support spontaneous bre uh, breathing on preterm babies. Um, what kind of PEEP to use? Um, studies are still ongoing. Um, Traditionally, a PEEP of five to six centimeters of water is used to support, and we often find that is um, quite good in our clinical practice. Advanced airway, yes, this can be considered at multiple points, um, especially when the mask ventilation is ineffective or the baby goes on to require further resuscitation like chest compressions and drugs, or if there are special situations like diaphragmatic hernia, or in rare instances when tracheal toileting is required. Um, laryngeal mask airway is an important uh, skill to be had, especially if the mask ventilation is ineffective or uh, one cannot intubate babies for whatever reason. The drawback is that um, it is only possible in little bigger babies of more than 34 weeks. So in our resuscitation training, uh, it may be a good idea to have a LME and uh, the providers learn the skills of using uh, LME. In terms of uh, depth of uh, endotracheal tube in oral intubation, not much of change. I just want to highlight two areas. So one area is for the extremely premature babies uh, of less than 1000 grams. Um, the usual uh, Torchens formula usually overestimates the depth. So there's a change from the previous guidelines 
Last time it was six to seven, but this time it's 5.5 to 6.5. So generally for one kg baby, I do not introduce the endotracheal tube more than 6.5 centimeter. The other thing is the nasotracheal length. This has been um, showing up as a very good uh, way of estimating the depth of uh, endotracheal tube in an oral intubation. And that's the formula of how to use the nasotragus length uh, to calculate depth of insertion. Coming to circulation, not much change in terms of chest compression. Um, it still um, uh, remains that if the baby's heart rate is below 60 per minute after 30 seconds of effective positive pressure ventilation, keyword being effective, uh, then we can consider chest compression. So um, by this time, the babies are recognized to be sick. And it's an expert opinion that the inspired oxygen be increased to 100%. There's no solid evidence backing this data, but probably it's intuitive. The coordination of compression to ventilation ratio remains at three is to one. Two thumb technique with the hands encircling the chest remains as the preferred technique. The depth of compression remains at one third the AP diameter of chest. And uh, we give the CPR coordinated for one minute to before reassessing the baby again. Drugs, um, IV adrenaline is the commonest drug uh, used for babies who require it. Um, it's been shown that the return of spontaneous circulation is probably faster with IV adrenaline compared to ET. But this recent systematic review, although the uh, data points are quite limited in this, showed no difference between the endotracheal tube or an IV dose of adrenaline. It has been shown in animal studies that uh, a saline flush after the giving adrenaline probably delivers it better to the heart. And uh, we have incorporated it in our guidelines as well. Crystalloids um, remain the volume expander of choice. This is something which we knew already and has been practicing, so no change in that. So our recommendations are that if the heart rate remains less than 60 per minute after one minute of CPR, IV adrenaline is preferred, and it should be followed by a 3 ml saline flush. The CPR needs to be continued, um, and adrenaline can be given every three to five minutes if the baby does not have a favorable response. ET adrenaline um, could be given if IV access is not available. So don't delay the adrenaline, but um, once the IV access is available, do follow up with an IV adrenaline um, if the baby still remains a bradycardic. Uh, normal saline remains the volume uh, of choice, 10 ml per kg given over five to 10 minutes. Um, this can be given even if there's no obvious blood loss, but especially in areas when there's a poor response to resuscitation, CPR and adrenaline, where babies have obviously bled out, uh, uncross-matched O negative blood probably gives a better response as compared to saline. But while we are waiting for the uncross-matched blood, saline can still be given. Post-resuscitation care, I mean, this has been um, um, inferred by the adult colleagues, pediatric colleagues, and um, I'm also going to give support to it. It's a very important part of the uh, chain. And um, apart from prevention, correction of hypothermia, maintaining saturations, blood pressure, uh, normal capnia, uh, glucose control um, is also important and um, may be overlooked initially. So blood glucose must be monitored and hypoglycemia must be treated um, early. Therapeutic hypothermia, it has become a mains um, stay of uh, therapy for babies affected by moderate to severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Um, the evidence is uh, probably about a decade old, but yet quite convincing and strong. And this is something which is widely practiced in Singapore. So the recent evidence was looking at um, kind of stretching uh, the parameters um, or the um, indications where the hypothermia therapy can be instituted, um, especially um, the whether even younger newborns like less than 36 weeks or babies with mild HIE or um, could we start the hypothermia th therapy later after six hours or would the babies benefit by longer period of cooling or if the core temperature is 
brought down below 33 degrees centigrade. So the recent evidence does not support any of these. So our recommendations remain that um, the core temperature should be maintained between 33 to 34 for 72 hours. And there's a slow rewarming, uh, not uh, lesser than four uh, hours. And it should be performed in centers which are, uh, have established protocols in doing it. Withholding and discontinuing resuscitation, ethically we don't um, make a big difference out of them because they are essentially uh, very similar in terms of ethical dialogue. Um, it's probably best to approach them with a shared decision making uh, between in neonatologists, patients, um, um, beg your pardon, the parents, as well as the obstetric team. For uh, babies who are less than 23 weeks, we would not recommend resuscitation because uh, we are not sure how much benefit we are going to have uh, by resuscitating such immature babies. We're probably not there yet. Between 23 to 23 plus six, um, yes, a very robust discussion needs to be had between the three parties. And uh, we need to know about the parental views and goals, make sure the gestation is uh, certain. And we also need to take cognizance of the additional risk factors, which may change the outcome. Yes, we uh, can provide some resuscitation at 23 to 23 plus six weeks, but um, uh, it has to be a very um, uh, well thought out decision. Generally between 24 to 24 plus six weeks, we would uh, offer resuscitation by default unless there are indications of uh, not doing it. Um, discontinuing resuscitation, I think um, recent um, observational studies have shown that there are a group of babies who may actually still have a reasonably good outcome up to about 10% if the Avga score uh, remains zero between 10 to 20 minutes. So um, we have kind of updated our uh, statement and recommendations that if after 20 minutes of optimal resuscitation and correction of all reversible causes does not bring about ROSC or cardiac activity, then resuscitation may be discontinued. I think this was about 10 minutes before, but now we can stretch it probably to 20 minutes. But the key thing in this is uh, optimal resuscitation and have we considered all uh, preventable um, causes and have we corrected all that can be corrected. So in uh, borderline situations, again, I can reemphasize that we need to individualize decisions. We need to have a very robust discussion with parents. Briefing and debriefing and training, um, very important, um, especially um, studies have shown that briefing and debriefing, at least for the short-term improvement of uh, team activity and short-term improvement of uh, provision of resuscitation does get improved with uh, briefing and debriefing. It remains to be seen how much of it is accrued for long term. Uh, training is very important, especially when people are not doing the resuscitation on a regular basis. Uh, we have said that at least for a minimum, every two years, the training not, needs to be um, redone by all providers. Um, in European centers, they have even gone on had to say one year, every one year people need to be trained. So the training uh, courses are available and are run regularly at uh, KK, NUH, and SGH, and providers can take benefit uh, by attending these uh, training courses. So the key five take home messages that uh, probably I would have is that uh, maintain normothermia is very, very important. Uh, aeration of the newborn lungs is probably the most important step. Need to prevent hypoxia as well as hyperoxia. Delivery room CPAP is a game changer. It uh, really stabilizes um, preterms who are spontaneously breathing. Um, if a baby requires chest compression um, um, or medications, it has to be done early. It has to be of good quality and the medication administration should be timely and be done in an efficacious manner. I think um, that's all that we have uh, from our subgroup in terms of 2021 guidelines. Uh, a detailed version of it will be out and uh, readers can uh, go through it. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, very many people who were uh, integral in developing these guidelines. Um, thank you very much.
Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Agni, for your clear presentation. Um, I'd like to invite uh, the panelists uh, to answer the questions. And also, I'd like to invite Dr. Yo Chulian as well um, to the panelists. Uh, she's a senior consultant at Singapore General Hospital Department of Neonatology, as well as the director of the Singapore uh, Neonatal Resuscitation Course. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, Jean, are you there? Okay. I think there are a couple of uh, questions um, that have been asked. Um, mainly, I think, uh, directed at the pediatric resuscitation. Um, one of them is on rescue breathing for the infants um, and also with regards to the recovery position uh, after ROSC, um, as well as use of the AED pads for infants. Sorry, I think they are more or less... Um, I'm just going to throw them at you, Jean, because I know you'll be the best uh, to answer all these. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, so um, I think um, the let's start with the question on uh, the rescue breathing. Rescue so breathing, rescue yes. breathing, I think, would be important uh, to differentiate the context of respiratory arrest versus cardiac arrest. If it's in cardiac arrest, you are trying to provide ventilation without hyperventilation. So. Uh, whereas in rescue breathing, the heart is still perfusing and therefore you're just supporting the respiration. So in someone with uh, cardiac arrest, what we have done for pediatrics is that uh, we will suggest low, the lower limits of normal ventilation. So in infants, it's 30 breaths per minute, uh, then adjusted to pulse oximetry or some other capnography, uh, depending on what you have or clinical status. Uh, then for if it's uh, for for ventilation, just rescue breathing. If it's uh, uh, for children less than twelve years old, uh, then it will be twenty breaths per minute. And for uh, for teenagers thirteen and above, it will be twelve per minute. If it's just respiratory arrest, if they're in cardiac arrest and you have inserted a endotracheal tube or an LMA, then you ventilate at the same rates, except that for adolescent, you can give at 10 to 12. Again, because adults, you give uh, 10 breaths a minute. So I think it's intuitive that most units would use 10. But if you remember 12, because it's easier to remember, then uh, please will go ahead, uh, because it's still within normal, is considered as normal ventilation. Does that answer that question? So the, the, the ratio for lay people, uh, for CPR uh, is still 32. Uh, if you can provide the two ventilation, that would be awesome. If you can't, then do chest compression, only CPR. But especially for infants and the younger children, I would advise that uh, if you can do provide ventilation. Uh, but once the tube is in, and we have a secure airway. Uh, for healthcare workers, more than a team, it's 15-2 because you need more breaths. Uh, and because it's difficult in a community to provide breaths, especially if you're untrained. Uh, then for the question of the pocket, uh, I, I just showed uh, Yihui, uh, Google on, on, on Lazada, you can actually buy it, it's 450. Uh, the mask size is huge. Again, it's the same problem that the mask size and the fit must be important to provide positive pressure ventilation. And therefore, if the mask is not, doesn't provide a good seal, then you can't give the breath. Uh, so the, the willingness and ability to provide ventilation uh, with or without the mask is dependent on the rescuer. Again, if uh, it is very unlikely in a household, especially infants, that they collapse suddenly unless it's a cardiac event, for which uh, if you're not trained and you're not willing to give ventilation, uh, the outcomes are probably not as bad because it's a sudden witness arrest. But if it's in a household and everybody is contaminated, sharing the same food, uh, kissing each other already, I do not see how uh, a parent or a sibling or elder sibling would uh, not give rescue breathing if they are able and trained. Um, so the pocket mask doesn't... Also, it's not a HEPA filter. It just prevents direct contact. So uh, COVID, if it's aerosolized, would still occur anyway. Uh, as for the last question, Binfei, what was the last question? Um, there was a question on, on the AED pads. Oh, okay. AED pads in infants because uh, it is um, supposed to be used on more than one year sure, old. Sure, sure. Yeah. So we advise that if it's there, please do use it. Uh, again, if you don't defibrillate and they, if it's a shockable rhythm, they once they degenerate to asystole, 
the chances of return of spontaneous circulation or even survival is extremely low. Uh, and there have been case reports. The only problem is that if you're looking at the scientific evidence, we would suggest that if it's uh, if you have a, 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 a a proper defibrillator that will be best. If you don't, whatever defibrillation pad you have, you just use it. Uh, even though it's, but we don't want to advocate that if there's an alternative, you, you go for the, the second best. That's what we're saying. But if you have a defibrillation pad and they advise shock, then just go ahead and shock. The, the harm of not mm. defibrillating a shockable rhythm is much higher than, uh, mm -hmm. uh, than allowing the patient to deteriorate. So the only group that we would advocate against, and uh, perhaps the neonatal group can also add on, is that for neonates, because the rhythm is um, how the detection of shockable rhythm is not verified in this age group, uh, for neonates and because it's extremely rare, we do not recommend uh, for the neonates uh, the use of AED. Even the child pet is too big uh, for neonates anyway, so it becomes a bit difficult as well. So with the exception of neonatal, uh, because they're as sinus tachycardia or otherwise, uh, especially those with boundary branch block, I'm not too sure uh, how sensitive it is for commercial AEDs to that, detect them. We are unable to make recommendations for those. Uh, for the returning to recover position, we would uh, support the adult uh, uh, as well as the basic life support advocacy that uh, I think it's easier if you just learn the same thing and don't turn them to recovery position simply because you can't monitor them. And if they do go into arrest, uh, respiratory or otherwise, uh, cardiac arrest, you're able to provide timely uh, resuscitation in terms of uh, life support. So I think the only difference in pediatrics is if you really can, please give ventilation. Uh, everything else is pretty much the same. Uh, similar for foreign body airway obstruction, if you're able to and you're willing to give ventilations, uh, that's the only difference between um, the, the, the various recommendations. Yeah, um, thanks, Jean. I think the, um, Dr. Tam also mentioned that if there's presence of uh, pediatric attenuated AED pads, yep. um, it will still be beneficial if it's yep. a shockable rhythm in infants. Yep. Um, <clears throat> maybe um, Agni can comment on, uh, do we use um, uh, your experience with uh, uh, shocking, shockable rhythms in the neonates so far in the ICU or in resuscitation? Yeah, it's very rare because often the indications for a shock are, are not there in newborns. It's not so uh, clear. Mm -hmm. Even like some of the common uh, tachyarrhythmias which the babies get, for example, like supraventricular tachycardia, most of them are amenable with medications or drugs. So I would say probably in my last 20 years, maybe I've shocked only once. Uh, yeah, so that's the reason why we don't uh, teach about uh, using of AED in a newborn resuscitation program. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question um, from Jayesh about uh, if in the infants, if the heart rate is below 60, do we initiate CPR immediately or focus on ventilation like in the neonates? So I think the, the issues with um, neonates and, uh, and, and uh, pediatrics is that for neonates, the emphasis is, um, I think we're the only ones that emphasize on airway and breathing ahead of the uh, circulation and uh, emphasis on uh, ventilation ahead of chest compression. I think there were questions um, about for the uh, pre-hospital arrest group. So how should they approach the neonate that or the newborn um, that uh, has collapsed at home, should they focus on the ventilation or should they then focus on the cardiac compression? Um, sorry, Dr. Yo, maybe I direct this question, this difficult question to you, and then I'll see if the rest have uh, anything to chime in. Sure. Um, actually, maybe I take the other question on the use of AED first. Um, just to share that um, actually we indicated um, it, it's possible, uh, like what Lighting has said, um, so long as you have the appropriate AED device and when just indicated, because um, we, we had done a couple occasions, probably within that uh, one hand count of occasions, and it so happened that there were preemie babies. And so yes, a pet size is a concern, so you just put an anterior and posterior. And uh, it worked and it was uh, good because in those preemie babies, the uh, issue 
um, in terms of side effects of the uh, pharmacotherapy uh, overrides the uh, advantage of uh, a cardioversion. So of course they were done with the supervision of the cardiologist from a distance, but uh, yeah, uh, just to share that it is possible uh, to do it in, in even the pregnant babies, but you need the right size device and pads. Yeah. Mm. Coming to the question of uh, pre-hospital with SARS of newborn, um, I think this is a universal problem, isn't it? Uh, essentially, as a team, um, we advocate that all newborns um, should be resuscitated with attention on ventilation. And uh, that's basically because um, the, the physiological needs are so different as compared to the adults. Um, so this brings to the point of training for the pre-hospital providers. Uh, perhaps it bring, you know, we need to kind of uh, emphasize a little bit more on three areas for these pre-hospital providers. And uh, the biggest area is a little bit on a formalized uh, training you know, for the uh, EMS specific um, neonatal training, okay, as well as the equipment. I think the issue is about the equipment and also familiarity with the algorithm specific for newborns. And um, the other thing, of course, because this, this kind of scenario, it's very infrequent, but yet they're very high stakes. And so it's important to kind of uh, address this thing about the frequency uh, of repeating this training so as to maintain uh, that, that skill uh, retention. Yeah. So, yes, in short, really, it's still about ventilation. If we ventilate right, the heart rate would return and um, things will be easier to handle. Yeah. Um, your comments, uh, Dr. Agni? Yeah, I fully agree with uh, Prof. Yo. Um, there's no going away from uh, ventilation. And if we don't aerate the baby's lungs, whatever we do, it's not going to uh, help the baby. So that's most important. And I think our um, providers, um, which is out of hospital, yeah, say, for example, delivery at home or delivery at the roadside, uh, the most important thing to do is to call in the EMS. And they always carry uh, neonatal specific um, and blue bags with them. And at the bare minimum, they can start off um, bagging the baby using room air, and which is not too bad uh, as a choice. And often most babies will be uh, fine with it. Mm -hmm. So yes, ventilation, ventilation and ventilation, yeah. Okay, um, sorry. Between, uh, there's a question, maybe I'll direct this at Jean again. Between TPs and Mbubek, which one is recommended? Uh, is this for, is this uh, with regards to pediatric resuscitation or newborn resuscitation? Or maybe I, um, uh, well, okay. maybe, newborn. oh, for, for newborn, uh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, Dr. Agni? Between TPs and the embu bag, which one is recommended? Yeah, I think we are. There's a slow drift towards uh, TPs because of many important aspects of a TPs, which is not covered by an embu bag. So most importantly, the ability to give a consistent positive end expiratory pressure with the TPs, um, also to regulate the peak pressures in a well-defined manner to be able to control the inspiratory time of every breath, okay? So these are some of the important aspects of TPs, which is difficult with ambu bag. So even if ambu bag connected with a peep valve, the peep which is uh, given through the ambu bag perhaps is not as good as the uh, uh, TPs. Mm -hmm. So, and we know that peep is very important uh, for a baby to aerate the lungs, maintain functional residual capacity. Um, so I would think that, uh, yes, given a choice, TPs would be a better tool. One thing which Ambu bag has an advantage to is uh, a baby where you suddenly need very high pressures 
and you need to modulate the pressures from breath to breath, in that case, Ambu bag is probably a better tool because you're able to do that. And for TPs, you need another person to help you do that. So that's the only disadvantage, um, I would think. Yeah, but if you ask about um, big studies or systematic reviews which have shown that yes, TPs has clearly Im improved survival or decreased morbidities, no, there's none yet. What you have to do is connect from A to B and B to C. Yeah. And I suppose, um, but one advantage of the ample bag over the TPs is that uh, you do not need a compressed gas. Uh, to use the ambu bag. So in the pre-hospital setting, um, the ambu bag will definitely be uh, more advantageous. Yeah. But in the hospital setting, uh, in the tertiary hospital setting especially, um, I think the TPs does have its advantage uh, over the ambu bag, as you have mentioned. Um, let me see if there's any other questions. Um, there's a question about, does ambulance carry neonatal and pediatric AED pads? Um, I can confirm with uh, Prof Tam, but uh, basically, um, again, there are no neonatal AED pads. There are pediatric mm -hmm. AED pads, and yes, the ambulance uh, do carry them, uh, and they are taught how to use it as well. Okay. I, actually, I would also advocate here that it would be awesome if, uh, and I was just speaking with Yihui on about this, that would be awesome if uh, there is advocacy for child pets or AEDs with attenuation modes uh, for public uh, areas and sporting facilities as well as uh, schools especially. I mean, it's intuitive uh, that these are advocated. Uh, so if, if we can invest just a little bit more, for besides the standard pads uh, to or uh, AED with a PEDS uh, attenuation system, that would be awesome. So again, the PEDS pad can be used in, in, in infants even because if there are no alternatives and it's a shock word and by shock, please go ahead, uh, then uh, that would be awesome. So again, that would be fantastic. Well, I think we will wait for you to come up uh, with this um this part, Jean? I wish I could. I wish I could. <laughs> it would have been done 10 years ago if I wish I, if I could. I think you can. We have faith in you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so okay. I think there's one more question. Maybe one last. Oh, yes. Sorry, Dr. Yo. Yes. Yeah. yeah so, you wanted to just, add on just something? Just to clarify. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify. I think along the line of the question of uh, ventilation for a new need versus uh, you know, cardiac compression as a starting uh, with SARS uh, uh, support. I think um, it, it, we apologize for not making it so clear uh, if there are people who are not very certain. I think in neonatal resource algorithm, we, we say that use it, use the neonatal resource algorithm for a neonate who is in a uh, neonatal unit. But if that new need is already discharged and is at home, or if that new need arrives in an emergency, um, then we, the general trend is if you are, if you think that this is a cardiac cause, um, or if you feel that you are more familiar with the pediatric algorithm, please follow that. Okay. However, for the majority of the babies um, who say perhaps the preemie who is already two months in the nursery and is still in the nursery and has a collapse, then the algorithm to embark on in supporting uh, the acute care of that child would be in alignment with the neonatal algorithm. Okay, so for pre-hospital or for emergency uh, setting, I think uh, maybe that will help you to clarify if you have a CBBA arriving into your emergency, use a neonatal algorithm. If it's pre-hospital uh, and it's emergency medical service provider, uh, you have the skill and you should, I mean, generally ventilating a newborn versus ventilating an, a child, it's not very different so long as the fit is good, the right mass is used. However, the rate of ventilation differs, so we should be more familiar or at least familiar with the algorithm for the newborn results. Okay, but if you have um, 28 days or 20 days old coming into emergency, uh, newborn coming into emergency unit, uh, 
uh, just go ahead and use the uh, pediatric ESAS guideline. I think this is something we've agreed on for our local context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's a question. I think maybe to, to, to Jean about the six links. Is it uh, applicable only to pediatrics or to all? Uh, I only can speak for pediatrics because uh, uh, the chapter is, uh, and I think the, the emphasis is actually the same, it's just how you want to put the messaging across. Uh, for us, it's about, again, again, it is mentioned already by the previous speaker that the question is not just about survival, it's about neurological intact survival as well. So it's just that I want to make the messaging a bit clearer for pediatrics, and hence it is deliberate in the messaging to, to modify the, the, what was recommended AHA into something more obvious. So, so it's, it's the same, uh, whatever you use, as long as the intention is to, um, for, for, for function rather than just a heart coming back. So I, I think mm -hmm. we, are all, we are all saying the same thing. It's just that uh, for, for publicity and awareness, I think if the messaging is a bit clearer, uh, I, I think that that may help the, the cause. But we are saying the same thing essentially. Uh, hi, this is Han. I just want to uh, add on. Uh, in fact, yeah, you know, the, the six ring apply to adult also. In, in fact, I, I should say there's seven ring, you know, because I think Jim mentioned prevention. Prevention is very important, you know. You know, the, the outcome of cardiac arrest is, is, is poor, no matter what you do, you know. So I think, I think if it's, even adult, uh, you know, can be, is preventable, you know, your, your, your diabetic care, your, your diet, and all the exercise. You see, but, but you see, we, we need to, um, the more ring you put, put uh, the less ring you remember. <laughs> so I think for resuscitation, we focus on, last time we used to have four rings, you see, you know, uh, but now EMS is so important, so we have to add it on. But of course, you can add it, add, you know, you can come out more and more. But but I, I think it, it's not, it's not recovery, it's not important, but we just want to focus on, on you know, what what is, uh, what is the, uh, 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 it's a fact, you know, of a uh, uh, mission, uh, basically, right? Thank you. Uh, okay, maybe we have one last question about the concern of uh, pneumothorax. Uh, if we start uh, back mass ventilation in the newborns. Yeah, I've just answered yes. it. Uh, yeah. I've just answered it to Kelly. I think she had raised the question. Mm. Uh, yes, this is a uh, one of the unintended side effects of positive pressure ventilation, whether by bag and mask or intubation or any other way. So it does needs to be done in a safe manner, in an expert manner, making sure that the pressure is just right to have a good chest expansion, but not a very high chest expansion, the tidal volumes and the pressures needs to be monitored closely. Uh, thanks, Dr. Uh, maybe I'll just take over here. I think we're just uh, coming up to the last few minutes before the session ends. I think there's been quite a lot of discussions about the use of AED pads and whether um, in the paramedic setting, um, do the ambulances carry uh, PEDS uh, slash neonatal slash adult pads in their ambulances? Maybe I can ask Janice if she's around to comment on that last question before we wrap up. Um, hi, Janice here. Yes, um, and in it true, uh, EMS ambulances carries only the adult and PEDS pads. So we don't carry you know, anything specific for neonate per se. Yeah. And can I just clarify in your uh, ambulances, are the defibrillators attenuated for, so we plug the pediatric AED pads yes. to be attenuated for children, am I yes. right? Yes, that's right. that's right. Yeah, that's great to hear. Okay, so, uh, thank you, uh, Janice. I think um, we're coming up to 12.35 and I don't, eh, not 12, 2.35. And I really don't want to take up uh, everybody else's time. It's a, it's a nice weekend and hopefully we will get uh, everybody out, not out, safely out <laughs> for the afternoon and the weekend as well. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers and panelists who have uh, joined us today for this half day session, uh, looking at updates on uh, resuscitation and first aid. 
uh, I think we really enjoyed the very fruitful conversations and discussions from everybody involved and really appreciated uh, everyone's time and efforts in preparing the uh, discussions uh, and presentations as well. So um, without uh, much further ado, we'd like to close this session today. Uh, I think we're looking forward to uh, updates and publications from the, uh, the Resuscitation Council later on. Uh, and uh, we wish everyone a very pleasant, enjoyable weekend ahead. Please stay safe. Uh, please mask up. Please uh, keep healthy and uh, positive for the next few weeks before hopefully HA2 closes or you know stops and we can go about our daily lives again. Thanks, everybody, very much. Have a good weekend ahead. Bye-bye.